Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? The clerk. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during there are no proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? Um, Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I seek leave to vary the routine of business before question time today. It's leave granted, it is. Senator Birmingham. I thank the Senate. Uh, I move that A, a motion to take note of a statement made by the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds, on 18 February 2021, may be moved immediately. B. Senators may speak to the motion for not more than 10 minutes each and the time limit for debate be 30 minutes. And C. Following consideration of the motion, the routine of business till not later than 12.50 p.m. be general business orders of the day for the consideration of bills only, after which the Senate return to its routine of business. The question is that motion be agreed to. That, those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Wong. Uh, I move to take note of the statement made by the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds, on the 18th of February 2021. Mr President, this has been a distressing time for Ms Higgins, for many staff in this place, for survivors of sexual violence and for those who have supported them. And I start by honouring the courage of Ms Brittany Higgins, whose resolve to tell the truth, no matter how risky for her or how confronting, is an example to those in power. And I also acknowledge other women who have come forward to tell their story, three women who have told their story of being violated by a man and failed by a hierarchy. Much has been written, reported and said since Ms Higgins' account was made public, but we should be clear about the key questions which must be answered. The first is why Ms Higgins was failed by those in power and those with power. Those who failed her must be held accountable. And the second is how we change the culture of politics in this place and beyond to, not ins to ensure not only the safety of women but our full participation in political life. And Mr President, both of these questions must be answered. Since these distressing allegations have been made public, the Prime Minister and others in his government have sought to focus on questions of culture. And there is no question that there is a problem with the treatment of women in Parliament House and in politics. We saw that when concerns were publicly raised by Liberal women about bullying and intimidation, following the leadership spill which saw Mr Morrison depose Mr Turnbull. We saw that in the revelations made by two former Liberal staffers in 2019, and then there was Four Corners last year, where the response from the Morrison government was to launch a full throttle attack on the ABC. When the culture of the bullying of Liberal women was raised, Mr Morrison said, I'm not going to be distracted by it. I'm not going to get distracted by it. Not going to get distracted by concerns that women were being bullied in his own government. And ultimately, where did his process end up? That process he described as rigorous and, com and confidential. Well, Ms Chelsea Potter, one of the women who raised concerns about bullying, described aspects of the resultant policy as protecting alleged, alleged perpetrators rather than empowering women in the party to speak up. Mr Morrison has talked a lot lately about processes, reviews and changing culture. But he's spoken very little about the accountability of those who put Ms Higgins in a position where she felt her career with the Liberal Party would be compromised if she went to the police. And he avoids this central truth, that the first thing you can do to change culture is to act appropriately when serious allegations are made. As part of his political response, Mr Morrison has threatened those seeking to hold his government to account that no party is immune from these issues. Well, of course no party, no organisation is immune from these horrific acts. What matters is how we respond to complaints when they arise, and what matters is how we seek to change the culture by implementing systemic change that supports complainants and seeks to break down power imbalances. You see, Mr Morrison's sympathetic words ring hollow whilst there is no culture of accountability. And we know from Ms Brittany Higgins that this is how it was handled. She said this, and we believe her. Ms Higgins said she was given a choice between justice or her job. 
She was told by her superiors she could go to the police, but they also added, we need to know ahead of time. We need to know now. Ms Higgins was told she could take time away at home on the Gold Coast, but there would be no way back. She said she realised, my job is on the line. And she said she realised the rape she reported in the minister's office was being seen as a quote, a political issue. She wasn't being treated as a human being. She wasn't being treated as a rape survivor, and she wasn't being treated as a victim of a grave crime. She was being treated as a political problem. And there remain big questions over what was spoken about inside the Morrison government and indeed inside Mr Morrison's office. Questions about who knew what and when and whether their response was appropriate. We've been told that the alleged rapist was terminated over security breach. We are told that the two most senior staff in the Prime Minister's office, the Chief of Staff and the Principal Private Secretary, were notified of that termination. The alleged term perpetrator was terminated for a security breach. Ms Higgins was not. And the obvious inference is that the sexual assault was known at the time these decisions were made. The difference in handling by the Minister's Office and Prime Minister's Office can only be explained by knowledge of the alleged sexual assault. Is this the reason a senior representative of the Australian Federal Police met with Ms Reynolds on 5 April, or was there another reason? The Minister has claimed repeatedly she wasn't made aware of the details of the alleged rape until Monday 1 April in 2019. But her office received written advice from the Department of Finance days earlier, on Friday the 29th of March. Ms. Re Senator Reynolds is expecting people to believe she was unaware despite this written advice to her office. And it isn't just Ms. Minister Reynolds' account that doesn't add up. The Prime Minister claims he first heard on Monday the 15th of February 2021, and he's asking Australians to believe his press office didn't tell him for three whole days after questions were put to them on Friday the 12th of February. And we now know from a message sent to Ms Higgins that one of the Prime Minister's staff was mortified when they were told two years earlier and had resolved to tell the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff. We know that his principal private secretary, the man described as Mr Morrison's fixer, was broadly in the vicinity and checking up on Ms Higgins. And we know that Minister Reynolds, then Chief of Staff, to whom Ms Higgins first disclosed the allegations of rape, had previously worked for Mr Morrison and has since returned to the Prime Minister's office. Mr President, what this does come down to is who knew and whether they handled that appropriately. Whether they handled what they knew about the alleged assault appropriately. And the Prime Minister's insistence that neither he nor his office knew, despite all the evidence to the contrary, demonstrates he knows this is the test. And he knows he's failed. That's why he's put Mr Gaitchens in charge. Mr Gaitchens, who has a proven record of whitewashing the wrongdoings of the Morrison government. And we know, we know Ms Minister Reynolds was aware and made it feel like a political problem to fix, made Ms Higgins feel like she had to choose between justice or her job. We know that at best Mr Morrison runs a government where the culture is don't ask, don't tell when it comes to serious criminal allegations. And at worst, Mr Morrison himself is part of the cover-up. But of course, there are human consequences to all of this. For Ms Higgins, two years of compounded trauma and denied justice. For all women in this building and beyond, two more years of ignoring concerns about culture. And for the women who spoke of their trauma, woman who spoke of her trauma in the Weekend Australian on Saturday. Mr Morrison is arguably the most powerful person in the land. He sets standards that form cultural expectations. His actions and inactions shape the culture. But when Four Corners raised serious concerns about the culture of mistreatment of women in his government, he tried to silence the ABC. When women complained of bullying in his government, he said, I'm not going to be distracted by that. When rape was alleged in an office of one of his own ministers, he sets up whitewash investigations that can be controlled. Mr Morrison's media advisers started rumours about Ms Higgins and her partner, and Mr Morrison blamed the victim. He said he was angry about being left in the dark, but there have been no consequences for those he claims left him in the dark. Mr Morrison talks about culture, but what he is not talking about is the culture he leads, the culture he leads in his own government where no matter what happens, he is never responsible. 
where nobody is accountable for anything and where a serious crime was covered up. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I too rise to take note of Minister Reynolds' statement concerning the serious allegations raised by her former staff member, Ms Brittany Higgins. Uh, as everyone in this place is aware, last Monday evening Ms Higgins courageously and publicly gave her account of her alleged sexual assault in Minister Reynolds' ministerial office in March of 2019. Ms Higgins demonstrated courage uh, that indeed many other women have demonstrated uh, in recent days, over many, many years, in relation to this workplace and many others. Minister Reynolds has expressed to the Senate how deeply sorry she is that, despite her genuine efforts and intentions of support, Ms Higgins felt unsupported at the time of her alleged sexual assault and in the time following. In telling her story, Ms Higgins has prompted a national conversation about how we ensure women are safe in this workplace that we are all part of here at Parliament House. But Mr President, it needs to be more than a conversation. It needs to ensure action such that all of us, all of us know how to do better, to do better in relation to how we prevent such incidents in the future, to do better in relation to how we handle them and support those affected by them in the future. I am confident every single one of us has something to learn through improved practices and processes that can make this workplace a safer one and a better example for all. The Prime Minister has initiated a number of processes in response to Ms Higgins's allegations. These seek to deal with the specifics of the incident that was raised, and we acknowledge and welcome the fact that Ms Higgins has indicated her intention to pursue these matters with the Australian Federal Police, and the government will provide absolute cooperation with those processes. He has equally initiated other processes that relate to party operations, to culture, uh, and has asked me, uh, as uh, the minister responsible for the Members of Parliament Staff Act, uh, to work across the parliament to initiate a review of a wider range of issues that shape our working environment. I give this, con this, con this confirmation that this review will be at arm's length from government. It will consult widely and will provide constructive feedback on measures that can be implemented. Every step should be taken to prevent any instance of assault or workplace harassment or bullying. We should all be working in an environment of respect. This place is robust, but I respect my political opponents, each and every one of them despite our differences. I respect those who work alongside us, and we ought all make efforts to make sure that respect carries through the culture of every aspect of our operations. In seeking to prevent, we must also acknowledge that incidents may still occur and that any individual should feel supported and empowered in their decision-making when such matters arise. It is of enormous regret that Ms Higgins or others have felt that they could not make such decisions, and we must make sure in future the systems support them and that they feel that respect again to make those decisions. And indeed, those they work alongside of in this workplace, including members and senators, need proper training processes and practices to support them when matters are raised to understand how best to handle them, how best to support those individuals and what responsibilities lie upon them if individuals do not wish to necessarily proceed with other actions. Uh, I have uh, scheduled meetings throughout this week uh, with uh, colleagues across all political parties in this place to make sure that we consult uh, on both the terms and the processes around this multi-party independent review. I have initiated processes to do so with staff as well, and I will welcome the input of Ms Higgins and any former staff who wish to help to shape that review process and to participate in it. I have also reached out over the weekend and had discussions with Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins to ensure that I have her advice as I work alongside parliamentary counterparts to do so. It is a privilege to work in this place. That is a statement often said uh, of those of us who stand up in the parliament, but it should be a privilege for all of those who work here too. 
and we must all live up to the high standard that people should expect of this workplace, which of all workplaces ought to be an exemplar. My commitment and the government's commitment is to work with all of us to make sure that we all do better in future. Senator Waters. Uh, thanks very much, President. I rise to take note of uh, Minister Reynolds' statement last week on these matters. Minister Reynolds maintained that when she met with Brittany Higgins, just metres from the couch on which she was allegedly raped, she didn't know about the allegations. Yet several days earlier, her chief of staff had received advice from the department about what to do when staff make a complaint of sexual assault. The Prime Minister has maintained that despite countless people, many of whom work in his office, uh, that we now know were aware of the rape allegations, his office didn't know until 12 February, and he says he personally didn't know until the story broke last Monday. Many questions remain, and yet three of the four reviews that have been announced in a flurry of response are internal reviews. That is not good enough when the culture of keeping things in-house is what has led to this culture of silencing, and it's taken very brave women, so wronged by the system, to speak out. Over the weekend, two more women came forward, alleging that they've been raped by the same perpetrator. This should weigh heavily on those who fail to act decisively in response to Brittany Higgins' allegations. And that's why the particular details of how this place, this government, failed Brittany Higgins is important. It's essential to identify who knew what, when and what was done to ensure that no one goes through what Brittany Higgins went through again. An internal investigation into how Brittany Higgins' case went so wrong is not enough. And I will be moving a motion later today calling for an independent inquiry, and I hope that that motion gets the support of all people in this chamber. But this place, this government, this parliament and those who have preceded it have failed many others who have worked here. We know the names of Brittany Higgins, Rochelle Miller and Chelsea Potter, but they are not alone. Countless staff members, predominantly young women, have, been, uh, have felt forced from this place by harassment predatory behaviour, bullying and assault. We need to dismantle the culture that has allowed so many to get away with so much for so long. A culture that blames victims, as the Prime Minister did last week, for getting themselves into vulnerable situations. Getting themselves into vulnerable situations. A culture that sees women's worth only in relation to men as daughters or as wives, not as individuals worthy of value, irrespective of our relationship with a man. A culture that closes its eyes when powerful men use, abuse and discard women and rarely suffer consequences, even retain their ministries. A culture that adds a bonk ban to the ministerial standards and yet washes its hands of further responsibility. A culture that allows Mr Craig Kelly's adviser to remain on staff despite multiple allegations of highly inappropriate conduct. Yes, we need a comprehensive review of the complaints process and an independent body so that no one feels, as Brittany Higgins did, that making a complaint would end their career. But we also need an enforceable code of conduct, binding senators and members and senior staff to the highest standards of behaviour and for there to be genuine consequences when we fail to meet those standards. But more than that, we need to systematically unpick the misogyny the inequality, the privilege that creates a culture in which what happened to Brittany Higgins, to Rochelle Miller, to Chelsea Potter, to Dania Mani and to so many others is downplayed as just what happens in parliament. This is not a problem unique to any particular party, to this parliament or to politics. Nearly 12 months ago, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner released the damning Respect at Work report, which found that workplace sexual harassment is prevalent and pervasive and that most people who experience sexual harassment never report it. Overwhelmingly, the Commission heard that gender inequality was a key driver of harassment. In her powerful piece in the Saturday paper, Dania Mani, who went public in 2019 about her assault by a fellow staffer, said, and I quote, The reason for Brittany's assault and mine, and the ongoing disclosures I receive from other women, is the same reason there have been sexual abuse scandals in every self-regulating autonomous or unpoliced fiefdom of power and privilege. What Australia seems willfully blind to is that each of its enclaves of power 
from religious institutions such as the Catholic Church to the judiciary, corporations and financial institutions to our parliaments, has a misogynistic, patriarchal power structure that enables the oppression, vilification and sexual abuse of women. She goes on, our parliaments house the most powerful people in the country, many of them white men. They've used their power to create one of the most exploitative and damaging workplaces imaginable." End quote. I note that over the weekend a petition was signed by more than 2,000 Sydney private school students calling for more to be done to teach respectful relationships and what consent means. The petition calls out rape culture and outlines over 500 experiences of assault. We shouldn't be surprised that this culture persists in politics. But this is not a problem that's unique to politics. This is a problem, however, that we have an obligation to fix. The Respect at Work report sets out a comprehensive reform framework. Incl okay, the clock's still going, so I'm still going. I'm almost finished. Okay, um, sorry, I'll carry on. The Respect at Work report sets out a comprehensive reform framework, including positive duties of care and primary prevention. The government needs to urgently act on these recommendations. A comprehensive, transparent, independent review of the parliamentary culture is long overdue, and I look forward to working across the chamber to make it happen. Current and former staff must be involved in setting the scope of any independent review. The experience of those, experiences of those most vulnerable to the power imbalance in this place must inform how we move forward. When asked whether she has hope that the discussions over the past week signals a change, Dania Mani said, absolutely not. Now, it's devastating to hear that someone who is working tirelessly to turn her trauma into advocacy has no faith in us to fix it. But we owe it to Dania Mani to prove her wrong. We owe it to Brittany Higgins, to the countless young women that the current system has failed, to Australians who despair at the example set by this place and to the young women that we want to show that politics is a safe place for them to be. We owe it to all women to provide safe workplaces everywhere. The Prime Minister leads this culture and he needs to finally show some leadership. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. The opposition has repeatedly asked over the past week when and what did the minister know about the alleged rape and what did she do? The minister clearly knew something serious had occurred in her office between her staff by the 27th of March, but then waited until Monday, the 1st of April, some six days after the first disclosure by Ms. Higgins, to speak directly to the young woman involved. The minister says she doesn't, didn't know the full details of what was alleged to have happened, but she doesn't explain why that was the case. The statement says. During this time, I made it clear to Brittany that she would have my full support in whatever course of action she decided to take and that she would have full access to counselling services. Well, what did the minister do? Did the minister arrange for counselling and support? Did she check in with Ms Higgins to see if she needed any help to access services? The statement says, my chief of staff and I moved quickly to ensure that uh, Brittany was given access to the police should she wish to make a complaint. Ms Higgins had already independently spoken with police days before this. And according to Ms Higgins, the access to police in the uh, 1st of April meeting was couched in terms of, if you go to the police, you must let us know when you do. There was no offer of going with her, of supporting her, of sitting with her. Why is it throughout this traumatic, traumatic time for Ms Higgins, the minister only ever spoke to Ms Higgins about it once, on the 1st of April and then never again? The minister tells this place that she has full confidence that my then chief of staff and I at all times acted in what we believed was the best interests of Brittany. If this were true, why didn't the minister ever check in to see if Ms Higgins was okay? Why didn't the minister ever check to see if she had access counselling support? Why was Ms Higgins dispatched across the country to WA after saying she would prefer to be near her family for the campaign? for the entire duration of the election campaign, isolated and alone with nobody to talk to. How was any of this in Ms Higgins' best interest? It might have been in the Liberal Party's interest, but you can't argue it was in Ms Higgins' interest. Ms Higgins was the minister's employee. There was a duty of care. How did the minister act in her best interest if the alleged rape was never discussed again after the 1st of April meeting? A dedicated employee of this government is allegedly raped in the minister's office and the minister never follows up. 
This terrible incident happened in Senator Reynolds' office. She could have done more, she should have done more, and I think she actually knows that. The minister says in her statement, throughout this entire time, my sole desire has been to let Brittany herself determine how this matter would be dealt with. But minister, you are the boss. It happened in your office. Why should it have been left to a young, traumatised and stricken woman to navigate her way through this? Why is everything her responsibility? The minister's statement says, at all times, Brittany's welfare and her right to privacy were paramount to me. Why then, if her privacy was so important, did you speak with Minister Cash's chief of staff in October 2019 and tell them everything about what you knew? Was this protecting Ms Higgins' privacy? Because she didn't know it was being done. Was this in her best interest then? The minister says she understands the duty of the Senate to ask hard questions about how this incident was dealt with. Yes, we will ask those questions because it goes right to the heart of the minister's capability, suitability and conduct. The minister is a senior member of this government and in the treatment of Ms Higgins, the minister has been found seriously wanting. The minister says she is sorry Ms Higgins felt unsupported and that some of the minister's actions added to Ms Higgins' distress. This statement alone is some acknowledgement that, as an employer, the minister and the Liberal Party failed this young woman. The minister failed to take appropriate action. The minister placed her back at the scene of the alleged crime. The minister failed to stand up and support this young woman. The minister failed to offer or arrange help that she clearly needed after allegations of sexual assault were raised. The minister sent her across the country where she was isolated. The minister failed to check in with her, and after the election was over, the minister washed her hands of all of it. This is an egregious failure by Senator Reynolds as an employer and as a minister. The minister's statement has left many questions about her conduct unanswered, but then lectures us that due to the various inquiries underway, and I quote, it is now incumbent on all of us in this place to let independent processes now in train consider these matters. The independent process has nothing to do with what Senator Reynolds did or didn't do as her, during her conduct as a minister. Nor does the police investigation have anything to do with the minister's conduct following the alleged rape. And the minister should stop trying to hide behind it. The minister has failed to answer the questions asked of her, but we will not stop asking them. The minister has failed to take responsibility for what happened in the aftermath of an awful traumatising event. The minister's statement finishes with, my hope now is that we can address this very serious issue as a parliament, away from the politics. All I can say to that is I bet you do. But there are two separate issues going on here. And I note the government is trying to broaden and spread the blame and make it about everyone's office and every person in this building. But there are two separate issues here. There is what happened to this young woman in a senior minister's office two years ago and what happened after that event. And then there are the broader issue of cultural change required in this building, and we cannot allow this government to conflate the two, mm -hmm. because that's what they're trying to do. The PM and his marketing team are trying to make it everybody's responsibility what happened to this young woman, and it's not. Because if I knew about what happened to this young woman, and if many people in this place knew about what happened to this young woman two years ago, there would have been a very different response than the one she got from this government. Ms Higgins should have been treated very differently two years ago when she came to the minister, a young woman clearly in need of help and support, and she deserves better from this minister now. Senator Roberts. Mr President, I seek to take note of um, the minister's statement, Minister Reynolds' statement. Now, we have already said that this needs to be investigated by the police. I would have expected someone in the Prime Minister's position both within his party and within the parliament, to have acted swiftly, immediately and unequivocally, unequivocally and clearly. We have not seen that. What I have seen, and I, I go back to August 2019, when I was on the inquiry into the appointments of Minister, former Minister Bishop and Minister Christopher Pine, and uh, to 
to positions after they retired from parliament, immediately after they retired from parliament. And Senator McAllister and I, I can remember, and others were in the, in the inquiry asking questions. And I persisted with uh, Mr. Parkinson, persisted and persisted and persisted about the investigation he was given responsibility to lead. And eventually, Mr. Parkinson started getting nervous and unsteady and admitted that he had no power to investigate the issue. No power to investigate the issue. Now, I'm only a junior senator. I've only been here five minutes. But that was, that was the, the Prime Minister's chief man. And the Prime Minister knows that he doesn't have the Mr. Gaitchens does not have the power to investigate this issue. So while we are in favour of a police investigation, we also are not pleased that the Prime Minister has been sloppy, slow and seems to be avoiding the issue. What we want is a proper investigation as to what happens in this building and in the corridors of power because we cannot have what happened to Ms Higgins and to two more people over the weekend. We just cannot accept that. This building is becoming a blight on the country. And we need to have a Prime Minister who is honest, objective and clear and quick and unequivocal in his, answer, in his response to this. The question is, the motion moved by Senator Wong will be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Firavanti Wells. Thank you, Mr. President. I give notice of my intention at the giving of notices later today to withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number one standing in my name for today, proposing the disallowance of part three of the ASIC Corporations Credit and Superannuation Internal Dispute Resolution Instrument 2020-98. I also give notice of my intention at the giving of notices on the next day of sitting to withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number two standing in my name for the next day of sitting, proposing the disallowance of the ASIC Corporation's litigation funding schemes instrument 2020-787. Finally, I note for the information of senators that any senator may take over the disallowance notices for these instruments prior to the time that they are withdrawn by advising the chamber accordingly. Thank you. I will call the clerk. General business order of the day number 73, Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Amendment, Save the Koala Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr President. I rise this morning to speak in favour of the Save the Koala Bill. This is an important piece of legislation that this chamber needs to consider because for far too long the plight of Australia's iconic furry friend, the koala, has been ignored. Last summer's bushfires ripped through parts of the Australian bushland in a way that we'd never seen before. 61,000 koalas were killed—61,000, and much of their habitat destroyed. What this piece of legislation seeks to do is to stop the further destruction of the limited and little amount of koala habitat that is left. For far too long, precious koala habitat has been allowed to be destroyed due to mining developments, big property developments and other types of logging and destruction. Couple that with the destruction of last summer's bushfires fuelled by the climate crisis, and we have Australian koalas now facing extinction. It is just unthinkable that Australia's koala on the east coast in New South Wales could be extinct within the next 30 years. It is just unthinkable that this animal, this iconic creature that is so emblematic of Australia's wildlife, our bushland, our environment, right around the world would be gone. For those only to exist in zoos as a reminder of what used to be. 
We need to act now, and we need to act fast. The biggest threat to Australia's koalas is the destruction of their homes, their habitat. And as less and less habitat is available, we see the koalas moving closer and closer into urban areas. This puts them at further risk of harm and injury. When the bushfires ripped through the Australian forest, bushland and scrub this time last year, the images of burnt koalas, dead koalas and injured wildlife went around the world, and it shocked people right across the globe because it was just such a fundamental destruction of what Australia is known for. Thank you. Under the 22-year-old environment laws currently in place in this country, under the EPBC Act, koalas have lost almost one million hectares of critical habitat. Overall, at least 7.7 .7 million hectares of critical habitat have been destroyed specifically for mining and development over the last two decades. Enough is enough. There is not much home for the koala left. We need to protect that that exists. And of course, this is an important issue not just for the koala. This is, an important for the, this is important for the rest of Australia's wildlife and native species too. Because if we are to protect koala habitat, it protects the homes of many other animals as well. Because for far too long, we have simply let rip, let log, let dig, let destroy Australia's precious places and our environment. If you destroy the bushland, if you log forests, you're taking away the very homes of these animals. At present, despite how at risk these animals are, the government refuses to guarantee that not one more hectare of critical koala habitat will be lost. And that is shocking. When everybody knows in the government minister's office, in the department, amongst the experts and those who work carefully and considerably and hard every day to protect our wildlife, when everybody knows that koalas are facing extinction, how can the government continue to allow the destruction of habitat, fast-tracking the extinction of this iconic species? Indeed, the government has done the exact opposite. Despite 61,000 koalas being killed last year, the Environment Minister has continued to sign off and give approval a green light to this destruction of even more koala habitat going forward, doing the exact opposite that needs to be done. It's not good enough to want to stand and have a photo with your, the cute koala at Australia Zoo or at Taronga or a number of the other wildlife sanctuaries, and then to turn around and to sign the death warrant of these creatures by allowing the destruction of their homes from big mining companies and developers. The Environment Minister's job is to protect the environment, to make sure there is a check and a balance on those who wish to just cut, dig and destroy senselessly. These koalas need the protection of this Environment Minister, and currently the Environment Minister has failed. The Threatened Species Commissioner, the expert and the key adviser to the minister herself, has told this Senate in November last year that the biggest threat to koalas was habitat loss and the degradation and fragmentation of their homes. 
The Environment Minister knows what she needs to do. The Environment Minister knows what needs to be done to save these koalas from extinction. The Environment Minister needs to stop approving the destruction of their habitat through mining, development and logging projects. The ongoing destruction of koala habitat is currently unchecked through land clearing for agriculture, development, mining and forestry, and has been going on like this for decades and decades. And now we have a situation where, unless we act today, there will be no koalas in 30 years' time. Perhaps there will be a few in zoos. Perhaps there will still be an opportunity for a politician to have their photo shoot with a cute and cuddly koala. But there won't be any living in the wild, and there won't be any in our Australian bushland. The New South Wales Parliament last year was so exercised by this issue that they conducted their own inquiry and they found evidence time and time again that unless koala habitat was protected, these animals would become extinct. It just beggars belief that no one in this place, no one in the government, is seizing the opportunity to do the right thing. Saving Australia's koalas is not just important for protecting our wildlife. It is important in our further challenge in tackling climate change. Because as more and more koala habitat is, de is destroyed, less and less forests and bushland is protected, thus making climate change even worse. Last summer's climate fires were a wake-up call to the Australian community. There was a wake-up call for all of us. That pretending that climate change is something out there in the distant future, it was right here on our doorstep. Canberra itself was engulfed in smoke, hazardous smoke, for weeks and weeks on end. Sydney, Australia's biggest city, engulfed in toxic smoke for weeks and weeks on end. Towns and communities right throughout the eastern seaboard, southern Victoria, the Gippsland region, and in my home state in South Australia, devastated by the fury of the flames. And while we might be able to rebuild, reconstruct our homes and put our communities back together, although that takes time. Our native animals are gone forever. Our native animals, three billion of them, native species, destroyed in this fury of fire destruction, gone forever. There is very little Australian koala habitat left. Very little. And all this bill is seeking to do is to put a moratorium to stop the minister from being able to approve any more destruction of it. No more bulldozing of the trees that koalas live in. No more logging of the trees and the bushland that koalas and their fellow species rely on. 
no more destruction of koala habitat for the sake of a quick buck of the mining industry and big property developers. For far too long, these big corporations have brushed away the long-term impact of destroying these important pockets of bushland. Oh, koalas can go and live somewhere else, they say. As the minister signs on the dotted line and says, yep, you beauty, you can log there, you can mine there, you can bulldoze there, expecting that the koalas will simply be able to pack up their bags and move next door. We need this country to get serious about protecting our environment and what is left of it. We lead the world shamefully when it comes to our list of threatened species and those that are already on the extinct list. That's not a league table I want Australia on. And neither do most Australians, actually. The Australian people ask us to do a lot of complex and debate a lot of complex issues in this place. This isn't one of them. This is not a complex issue. This makes perfect sense. There's very little habitat left. If we want to save Australia's koalas from extinction, we need to protect their homes. We need to stop the chainsaws and stop the bulldozers. We need to protect our iconic species, not just for their sake, but the sake of every other species that relies on having native bushland, native scrub and protection from destruction. I commend the bill to the Senate. Senator, thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Senator Fawcett. Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, I too rise to speak on the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Amendment Save the Koala Bill of 2021, uh, introduced by Senator Hanson Young. And I just wish to acknowledge up front her passion, her deep interest in these issues, having travelled as part of the Environment Communication Committee. Uh, to Kangaroo Island in the aftermath of the bushfires. I have seen her deep interest uh, in this and her passion for addressing these issues. Uh, when it comes to the legislation, though, I do come back to the maiden speech I made in this place, which indicates that uh, good intentions and passion alone don't necessarily make for good legislation. And I do have some concerns with the amendments that have been proposed in this, which I will speak to, to the chamber now. Um, as Senator Hanson Young has said, the uh, bill aims to introduce a moratorium on the clearing of koala habitat. And if you go back to the EPBC and look to see what uh, critical habitat for vulnerable species and the koala in particular are defined as, it's defined as any habitation that contains a food tree or a food source uh, for koalas. And so it's a fairly broad um, definition of what koala habitat is. So the bill would prevent the minister from approving an action under the EPBC Act where uh, that action consists of or involves the clearing of koala habitat. Uh, it also goes on to remove an exemption for regional forest agreements, which I'll come to a little later on. Specifically in section 18b, uh, section 18b refers to the concept of a significant impact on koalas as set out uh, in the new section 527g and it applies this concept to sections 18, 18a of the EPBC Act. The effect then of section 18b in conjunction with 18, 18a and 527g uh, is that taking an action that has, will have or is likely to have a significant impact on koalas is prohibited. Uh, so at the end of section 139, the bill goes on to insert a new subsection uh, that has the effect of preventing the minister from approving an action consisting of or involving the clearing of koala habitat. And uh, as you'll recall, the definition of uh, habitat for vulnerable species, the koala in particular, is essentially any 
uh, forest or other growth that has either emergent trees or trees that constitute a food source for those koalas. Now, the concern in part for me comes back to my own state of South Australia as an exemplar uh, kangaroo island. Uh, in the 1920s, uh, a number of koalas, uh, given that they are not native to Kangaroo Island, were introduced in Victoria. I think less than 20 were released on the island. Uh, they have bred uh, extensively uh, on Kangaroo Island. Uh, before the fires of last year, there were an estimated 50,000 koalas on Kangaroo Island, roughly half in native vegetation and roughly half in bluegum plantations. Uh, now, this immediately raises an issue with the prohibition in that if the koalas have chosen to live in bluegum plantations uh, because they provide a food source, then here we have a situation where what is essentially an introduced species to this island has chosen to have it live in and use as a food source a plantation timber, which the natural expectation of somebody who's planted trees as a plantation is that they will be able to harvest those trees. Uh, but this prohibition uh, would actually prevent uh, a normal commercial activity of planting timbers for the purpose of harvesting uh, because koalas had chosen to live in that area. So fundamentally, there is a problem uh, with the nature of the bill because it will interrupt uh, not the logging of native forests or clearing of native areas, but it will actually interrupt commercial operations uh, that have seen a, a massive increase uh, through the presence of those trees of a koala population. Now, Kangaroo Island is an interesting case, um, even before the fires that went through last year. Uh, that were devastating to many landholders there, property owners and to wildlife. Um, because the koala population, unlike kangaroos, uh, as scientists have uh, studied and made it clear that kangaroos in the face of environmental stress can actually regulate uh, their population growth to adapt to those changing circumstances. What they've found with koalas is that koalas are not actually capable of that self-regulation, which means that over time they have actually created uh, unsustainable pressures uh, on the food sources on the island, uh, which means they are literally eating themselves to starvation. Uh, and so there's been a long program, a long debate and discussion in South Australia about how you deal with this burgeoning population. Uh, culling is not an option. Uh, there has been some attempt at translocation back to the uh, area where these koalas originally came from, uh, and given that they are disease-free, uh, certainly the only ones in South Australia and potentially nationwide, uh, it's, it's a very good uh, breeding stock to try and translocate. There's also been attempts at sterilisation. But importantly, um, as Senator Hanson Young has indicated, the habitat that koalas use uh, is also the habitat for other species. And one of the great environmental concerns on Kangaroo Island is that the overpopulation of koalas, uh, which eat trees not just to the point where there is no more food for them to eat, but if the trees are devoid of all leaves, they die, which means that the habitat for other uh, native animals is actually being reduced, and that's been a significant environmental concern in South Australia. So Kangaroo Island is, a, is an exemplar of a case where there are reasons why uh, this prohibition on the clearing of habitat uh, has a commercial imperative, but also uh, there are reasons why uh, various controls uh, may be required. You can also go to other parts of South Australia, the Adelaide Hills, for example, in the Mount Lofty Ranges. Uh, there is a population that is measured to be around 150,000 in that area, which is thriving. Uh, now, there's large contiguous areas of uh, forested area, natural bushland, 
uh, even down into the suburbs. In fact, the creek out the back of my own house has koalas who populate that and keep us awake at night with their various territorial growling. Uh, but it indicates that there is a healthy population there, and this prohibition uh, could prevent quite reasonable development of properties uh, across a large swathe of area or pockets within that area uh, that would have no material impact uh, on koalas. And so there are some fundamental concerns um, about the black and white nature of the prohibition which is placed uh, in this bill. So the extant provisions uh, recognise that there are uh, areas which are complex. And if I go to the guidelines uh, published by the Department of the Environment in relation to the EPPC Act, uh, it actually says, and I quote here, that the koala has one of the largest distributions of any threatened species listed under the EPPC Act. It occupies a variety of vegetation types and is capable of moving long distances and is variably effective by a range of threats. Determining significant impacts on the koala is therefore complex and varies between cases." End quote. And what that shows is that we do need to take account of the habitat of koalas and their population, but a blanket ban is not the best way to manage that. Uh, there needs to be a scientific approach which understands the impact on the koala as well as other species, balancing that with development, uh, whether that be in industry or for housing uh, or indeed for transport, uh, and that the authorities and minister need to be able to look at these case by case rather than being hamstrung by a blanket ban. Now, as the chamber would be aware, the EPBC Act uh, is due for a reform and there are reforms underway. In fact, the Environment Communications Committee uh, reviewed just uh, late last year uh, some of the first tranche of reforms uh, to make it more effective in terms of how we care for the environment and balance uh, the needs of other parts of our society. Uh, it's worth pointing out that in terms of the extant provisions, um, habitat protections and matters of land clearing are predominantly the responsibility of state governments. But when it comes to threatened species, the EPBC Act does provide protection for threatened species, and the koala is listed one of those, um, and particularly the combined populations of Queensland, New South Wales, and the ACT are regarded as matters of national environmental significance. Uh, so under that federal act, any action that's likely to have a significant impact on a matter of national environment significance, such as the koala, must receive approval from the government before it can proceed. So in order to a, obtain approval, uh, proposed developments are subject to a rigorous and transparent environmental assessment process under the EPBC Act. Now, we heard a lot of evidence last year about the processes in that Act and the fact that there are opportunities for improvement, and I would welcome those uh, as we go forward. But at the heart of that Act and those processes is the assumption and the principle that you treat uh, the koala population, particularly on that east coast area, as a population of concern, but you deal with each case uh, according to its merits. And I'll, I'll come to the issue of uh, the forestry agreements now just in that context. Between 2015 and 2017, uh, the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries undertook a large-scale study on koala occupancy in northeast forest in New South Wales, uh, including their response to timber harvesting. What they found was that koala occupancy was not influenced by timber harvesting intensity, um, time since harvesting, land tenure or landscape of harvesting or old growth forest extent. There were other factors sometimes associated with the forestry industry, but often not, that actually had a greater impact. And so to have a blanket ban on exemptions for RFAs, again, ignores what the science has collected in terms of data. So I'm not denying that, particularly on the East Coast, there is a cause for concern, uh, there is action that is required, but the substance of this bill and the operative measures which actually prevent, they have a hard prohibition that doesn't allow 
the signs for any particular business case uh, to be considered when somebody comes for approval, or worse, in the case of something like Kangaroo Island, where there has been a commercial planting of trees that, by definition, have now become um, a habitat for koalas because they're a food source for koalas, the effect of this bill would be that somebody who's made an investment to plant a plantation couldn't even harvest those trees uh, because of the operation of this bill. So for those reasons, while I respect the, the good intentions and the uh, depth of uh, passion that Senator Hanson Young, uh, I cannot support this bill in the Senate. Thank you, Senator Fawcett. Senator McAllister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, one of the iconic images of Australia's bushfires is a firefighter sharing a water bottle with a scared and singed koala. Now, that picture was shared around the world, and in part that's because the koala is so intrinsically and recognisably Australian. The koala might not be on our crest, but it is a national symbol, and it has featured in countless tourism ads, and it has been taken back home on countless kitsch souvenirs. It's not also, it is not only an essential component of the con concept that the world has of us, but also of the conception we hold about ourselves. In 1933, Dorothy Wall published Blinky Bill, the quaint little Australian. A year later, in 1934, the Sydney Morning Herald called the koala Australia's national pet. But right from the beginning, being Australia's national pet hasn't been enough to guarantee the koala's safety. In 1936, the Evening News in Rockhampton wrote, It seems extraordinary that this animal, which is so greatly admired not only by overseas visitors but by Australians, is being allowed to suffer extinction. In the early part of the 20th century, the koala was ruthlessly hunted for its fur. The threats to its safety today are different but no less grave. The koala is facing habitat loss and mounting ecological pressure in a warming world. Being an iconic Australian animal will not be enough to save the koala without our help. Even before last summer's bushfires, koalas were in trouble. Koala populations in my home state of New South Wales have been in decline for decades. One study suggests that koala numbers may have dropped by as much as two-thirds over the last 20 years—just 20 years. And although estimates vary, there is no dispute that koalas are in real trouble in New South Wales. A few years back, on a pleasant afternoon, I met a pile of volunteers from an organisation called Bangalore Koalas. Now, they have planted over a thousand trees to generate koala corridors to compensate for key koala habitat lost to highways on the New South Wales north coast. And these corridors act as both travel pathways for koalas and areas for them to live. The trees were planted on private land with the support of local landowners, and they want to see koalas protected. And those volunteers are stepping up to fill the void that has been left by the Commonwealth and the New South Wales government and their destructive actions. New South Wales now has less than 10 per cent of the nation's koalas, and it is harrowing to know that koalas in the Pilliga have declined by 80 per cent since the 1980s. The New South Wales Coalition government's policy agenda of increased land clearing, building highways through key koala habitat, has been a key contributor to their decline, and the bushfires have only made things worse. The government's own estimates suggest that at least a quarter of koala habitat in eastern New South Wales has been affected by fire. 5,000 koalas may have died in the fires. And a New South Wales parliamentary inquiry found that without urgent action, koalas may be extinct, completely extinct in New South Wales by 2055. Well, what was the response? What was the response from the Berejiklian government? Well, predictably enough, a self-interested internecine fight between the National Party and the Liberals. In September last year, the Nationals threatened to leave the coalition over a very modest plan to protect koala habitat, which the New South Wales Deputy Premier branded a land lock-up policy. It is staggering that the issue that the New South Wales Nationals sought to weaponise to blow up the government was the protection of koalas. 
it's actually hard to think of a more tone-deaf political position than that advocated by the Deputy Premier. But it's typical of the approach from a coalition that persistently makes policy decisions that threaten New South Wales' natural environment. The state government's recklessness is visible from space, literally. The North Coast has one of the highest land clearing rates in the world. It has been identified as a deforestation hotspot on par with Brazil and the palm oil plantations of Indonesia. Early in my career, I had the great privilege of working for Bob Debus, former New South Wales Labor Minister for the Environment, when he and Premier Carr passed legislation to protect hectares of woodland across New South Wales for conservation. 350 new parks created in that government. Between 90, 1995 and 2011, more than three million hectares protected in the conservation system. And it is disappointing, so disappointing, to watch the New South Wales government fail to implement anything remotely similar. In fact, their approach has been to take an every step to hasten the destruction of irreplaceable wildlife and their habitat. Unfortunately, here in the Australian Senate, a private senator's bill is unlikely to be the solution. This bill has no chance of becoming law. Even if it were to pass the Senate, the government would never bring it on for a vote in the House of Representatives over in the other place. It is why being in government matters, and it's why, as a conservationist, I am a member of and participate in a party of government. And Labor would take a different approach to the approach outlined in this bill. This bill is a blunt instrument. It introduces an indefinite moratorium on clearing koala habitat. It removes the exemptions from the EPBC Act for forestry agreements in the, where there is a significant impact on koalas. And what this means, in effect, is that large parts of the eastern seaboard would be affected by this bill because koala habitat is extensive throughout the region. Now, it's possible, it's possible that this is the right solution. Maybe this is the workable solution for the communities of New South Wales. But we wouldn't have any idea about this because there is no evidence of any discussion at all in the development of this bill with the communities that it would affect. Indeed, what's lacking in this bill is any consideration whatsoever of local communities. This bill would have an impact on people and their livelihoods. Every natural resource decision does. But this bill doesn't establish or contemplate or reference any mechanism for a conversation with community about how to approach this problem. It doesn't reference or contemplate any mechanism to balance competing demands for land use. And this should matter to conservationists as well as communities that are dependent on forestry. This approach runs the risk of undermining support for conservation in the rural and regional communities where koalas need that support most. We know from experience in government that the best approach to conservation lies in creating lasting compacts that recognise the legitimate needs of local communities to sustain themselves through a local economy that will support them and their families. That kind of compact matters, and the stakes are too high for the koalas for us to take any other approach. If there is anything that we've learned from the last few years of politics here and abroad, years which have seen simply frightening developments in some examples, politics requires an inclusive approach that brings people together, that brings local communities along with change. Politics does not work when solutions are dictated from afar. And when that happens, there are reactions which are sometimes uncontrollable, sometimes unpredictable and not helpful for democratic systems. Our democracy works best when we have honest and open conversations with communities. Conversations that acknowledge, recognise and respond to the genuinely divergent and diverse interests in those communities. Because people who haven't been listened to 
will find a way of making their voice heard. This is the approach that Labor takes in relation to nature conservation. It's the approach we took to protect so many assets in our periods in government, here in the federal sphere and in state parliaments. Labor protected the Dane Tree, Kakadu, stopped drilling on the Great Barrier Reef, protected the Franklin and Antarctica. We created land care. We created the largest network of marine parks in the world. Labor reduced Australians' emissions. Every major achievement in environmental protection in this nation's history has been delivered by a Labor government. Only Labor has the will and the capacity to protect Australia's environment. At every stage, the coalition has failed to fulfil that role. The Commonwealth Government is years overdue in making a threatened species recovery plan for the koala, which was initially due in 2015, five years ago. Labor's national koala conservation strategy ran until 2014. It's yet to be replaced. We are still waiting for the government to make a decision on increasing the threatened listing status of the koala. And that is why Labor has called on the Morrison government to cease development in areas where the koala is listed as vulnerable until the formal assessment for uplisting the koala has been determined, a recovery plan for the koala is produced and a new national koala conservation strategy is in place. Labor has a real plan for protecting the koala. We need stronger protections. The koala as a national icon does need federal protections. We need tougher penalties. The federal environment laws should impose strict penalties for acts of deliberate animal death. And a national approach. The government has to work with the states on a consistent approach to protecting the koala, and it should undertake a comprehensive ecological audit to assess the damage to populations from bushfires. But it's not just the koala that needs protection. Fewer than 40 per cent of threatened species have a recovery plan. The Morrison government actually doesn't know, no idea, which recovery plans are actually being implemented. Under the coalition, 170 out of 171 outstanding threatened species recovery plans are overdue, and the Morrison government has no plan to get them done. Bushfires don't just threaten koalas in New South Wales. Native wildlife from Fraser Island to Kangaroo Island were affected, and that is why Labor called for the National Ecological Audit at the height of the fires in January 2020, and it took a whole year for government to respond. And meanwhile, after spending millions of dollars and spending countless hours on the review, the government is pursuing second-rate so-called standards that are fundamentally inconsistent with the Samuel Review's final report. This government appointed a highly respected Australian regulator and businessman, and then they encouraged environmental science, business industry and legal stakeholders to devote a vast amount of time to a review that it seems they always intended to ignore. Delay and neglect are the hallmarks of the Morrison government's approach to environment protection. It is simply not something that the government cares about one jot. And all the Senate motions and private senators' bills in the world aren't enough to undo the harm that can be done by a Liberal government that sees our wilderness as unimportant, that sees wildlife as an impediment to development and sees proper process as mere green tape. We need real change and the only way to protect koalas is the election of a federal Labor government. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to the bill introduced by Senator Hanson Young to save the koala and to put a moratorium on the clearing of koala habitat. This is an urgently needed bill. Our koalas face extinction by 2050. And make no mistake, it is the Liberals and Nationals sitting opposite to us here and the ones that sat opposite to me in New South Wales, who are killing our koalas. It is your hands that have the blood of koalas. I remember the joy of seeing my first koala in natural habitat. We used to frequently see these amazing and unique animals in our front yard in Port Macquarie during the day and hear them loudly grunting at night. But those days, sadly, are long gone. And this is in a town which used to be the koala capital of New South Wales, if not Australia. 
if governments continue to make reckless, irresponsible, and greedy decisions that keep pushing koalas to the brink of wipeout, our future generations will only see them in museums. And that is an absolute tragedy. Koalas across the state are being driven to extinction, not by some natural phenomenon or some evolutionary phenomenon, they are being driven to extinction by rampant land clearing. They are being driven to extinction by human-made global warming. They are being driven to extinction by ecocide. The terrible reality is that where I see magnificent trees and beautiful bush with glossy black cockatoos, powerful owls, eastern water dragons, and koalas, all that the liberal and nationals and their political donors, big mining, big development, big agriculture, all they see are dollar signs and a commodity to be ruthlessly used and abused. You are all environmental vandals. The climate-induced bushfires of 2019 and 2020 destroyed more than 12 million hectares and killed more than a billion animals, and they devastated communities. The loss of koalas during and after New South Wales bushfires is one of the most significant biodiversity disasters in our history. And now, even when we have lost so much habitat and wildlife, even when swathes of our bushland and millions of animals have been destroyed, forests are being opened up for logging. And this loss is made much worse because of the disastrous New South Wales land clearing laws pushed by the Liberals to appease the Nationals that I and many others fought hard against. And it's under these laws that 99% of koala habitat can be chopped down. They have already resulted in a massive 13-fold increase in approvals in land clearing. The koala habitat, we all know, is already badly fragmented making it even harder for species to migrate and survive. And New South Wales is leaving no stone unturned in making this even worse. They recently fast-tracked the approval of the Brandy Hill Quarry expansion, knowing full well that it will affect koalas and other endangered species, such as the gray-headed flying fox. We know the Port Stephen koalas are at high risk of local extinction, yet they gave a green light for their destruction. If you come further south, the Campbelltown local government area in southwest Sydney is unique as it supports a growing um, and chlamydia-free koala population in the Sydney Basin. But does the Liberal National Government give a damn? Of course they don't. Communities in southwest Sydney who care about these koalas are fighting the Lendley's Mount Gilead development in the Campbelltown LGA, which will destroy the current transit points of koalas between the Georges and Nepean rivers and make it near impossible for koalas to travel between these river corridors. And the federal government hasn't lifted a finger to stop destruction of koala habitat. In fact, you facilitated it. We know that only 10% of the koala habitat cleared in New South Wales and Queensland between 2012 and 2017 was assessed by the federal government, despite national environment laws requiring protection of threatened species. Habitat clearing was again and again approved by states and, and developers were not referred for assessment to any level of government. Surely these facts point to better and stronger oversight by the federal government. But in the parallel universe that the liberals and nationals live in, they are doing the exact opposite. You want to hand over even more power to states. Your solution to this reckless destruction of the environment is the Streamlining Environmental Approvals Bill, which is much better described as, let's kill the koalas quickly, Bill. You want a one-stop shop? You just want to fast-track land clearing. You just don't want to fast-track extinctions. And I hope that the opposition and the crossbenchers care about these national treasures enough to support Senator Hanson Young's bill to stop this major threat of land clearing and fragmentation facing koalas 
by putting a moratorium on clearing koala habitat. We will not be giving up our fight to save the planet and for all creatures, big and small, that call it home. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Amendment Save the Koala Bill uh, 2021. The effect of the bill, uh, if passed, is to introduce a moratorium on the clearing of koala habitat. Uh, and the bill, in essence, prevents the minister from approving any action under the uh, Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, where that action consists of or involves clearing of koala habitat. The bill also removes the exemption for regional forest agreements from the requirements of the Act and uh, where they will have a significant or likely to have a significant impact on koalas. The bill uh, seeks to do this technically by adding at the end of section 139. Uh, the words that the minister must not approve an action consisting of or involving the clearing of koala habitat, and further seeks to insert additional definitions. Uh, koala, koala habitat, koala habitat tree, and also uh, expands on the definition of the words or sheds some light on the application of the word significant impact. Koala habitat is, and I'm paraphrasing, means an area of vegetation which koalas live and includes a koala habitat tree, an area of vegetation that consists primarily of koala habitat trees and which is reasonably suitable for sustaining koalas, and partially or completely cleared areas used by koalas to cross from an area mentioned in the previous sections of this definition. S significant impact includes any substantial loss of genetic diversity or any loss of connectivity or available koala habitat or any population of koalas such as that population is placed in greater risk of extinction. Uh, the effect of uh, the amendments if passed, in, in my view, uh, created me some reservations about the efficacy whilst I acknowledge the strong passion of the mover and the movers' parties, and in many ways I share uh, many of those passions myself for saving and, and also increasing and renewing these habitats. I think the bill in its current form allows for the exercise of sufficient discretion of the minister, uh, which therefore that the moratorium does not really add anything uh, to the application of the current Act. I'm reminded when I was reviewing the amendments of uh, a American writer who, whose political persuasions I don't actually follow, but he said the words uh, that the value of our forests and their spirits must never be forgotten because under the layers of law and memory it's effectively the spirit of ourselves and we can't deny it and it must lead us into, into action. So as I said, I share many, many of the passions of the mover. But the government has done much for koalas in its, in its funding. Uh, both pre-bushfires and post-bushfires, and it has also initiated the Samuel Review, which it is still formulating its outcome, uh, its response to those to those recommendations. And those recommend uh, and, th and that government response must be based on proper consultation. So I think it's a little unfair uh, of uh, some honourable senators to describe us as vandals. I know there are many on the coalition benches that are as passionate as I am for the natural environment. This weekend, in fact, I was in the Adelaide Hills, which have been many parts have been devastated by bushfires, volunteering for a veterans uh, charity or non-for-profit, Disaster Relief Australia, clearing uh, dead wood to allow regeneration and also the planting by farmers of the natural environment. And as I said, it's it is unfair on the modern farmer to describe them as environmental vandals. In fact, uh, much of the custodians of the land and all the farmers that I've worked with in this organisation are totally committed to regeneration, and that is the, their need to have volunteers on their property so that they can uh, get that process underway as soon as possible, as well as reducing the fire risk of the dead wood.
I just want to turn to the operating provisions of the existing Act. As I've indicated, it's my view that the Act affords extremely strong protections for threatened species already, particularly can, uh, koalas, for they are listed in Queensland, New South Wales and ACT for particular protections as being environmentally significant. Uh, Senator Fawcett has already set out for the benefit of honourable senators uh, the circumstances in South Australia and indeed the fact that the koalas, by not regulating, being unable to regulate their, their breeding, has caused environmental issues, uh, which, I call, which in, a, in my own state, particularly on Kangaroo Island. There are a number of processes under the existing Act which need to be uh, applications need to be made for development, and there is a number of provisions which restrict what the minister can and cannot do. But in essence, the minister has discretion based on scientific advice to either protect or take into account or approve economically sustainable development. So, in essence, this removes a, a discre any, any discretion which I think has been described by my Labor friends as a blunt instrument, and I would, and I would share that view. Pre, pre the bushfires, the, the government has committed considerable funds for a variety of projects to support the habitat of koalas. But more particularly, after, bushfires, after the bushfires, uh, the government has taken urgent action in uh, early in 2020, providing uh, a 50 million initial recovery package to support emergency interventions and recovery actions for the immediate survival, for immediate survival of effective native animals and plants. That include up to 3 million for the Taronga zoos, for treatment of injured wildlife, the establishment of insurance populations at risk. Funding was also provided to support the immediate recovery of uh, other species, but in relation to koalas, uh, radio tracking in burnt and unburnt landscapes to assess the impacts of rescue and rehabilitation on reintroduced koalas. There's also been one million combined funding with the New South Wales government on, genetic, on assessing the genetic value of koala populations. Further funds have been provided to directly support koala conservations and recovery, recovery efforts. So, uh, honourable senators, uh, it's my view that the government has, in an administrative sense, certainly had a substantial commitment to the koala and its, in its habitat. And no one is arguing on this side that it's not an iconic animal and one which we wish to preserve and, and grow, its habit, grow its habitat. But communities need to make decisions for themselves in relation to their development, and that development needs to be checked and sensibly checked and that is why the Morrison government, in coalition, has did initiate an independent review of the Act. Now, Professor Samuel has made a variety of recommendations, and the government has said on record that it is committed to sensible and a staged pathway for, change, for the change in the reform progress. So I therefore reject the criticism the Morrison government is not committed to the environment. And indeed, what government could be criticised if it has a re full review of the Act? Now, whilst the review of the Act has occurred and the response is coming, uh, that drives or underpins my reservations for the technical provisions of this uh, bill that currently, amending bill that's currently before us. And indeed, I've never been personally a fan, uh, fan or a, um, a person that believes in the unnecessary restriction of a minister's. Uh, discretion, whilst uh, other, the crossbenchers can be particularly critical of the actual decisions, uh, ministerial discretion is just that it's a discretion. And to remove a large chunk of discretion when, in essence, the minister's discretion can only be exercised within a very limited framework under the existing Act, I think is unwise. So therefore, honourable members, can I uh, ask you to reflect on this bill and uh, reflect also on its shortcomings and 
can I say that many on this side of the benches uh, have a deep and abiding commitment to the environment, and we reject the description or the adjective of vandal. Thank you, Senator uh, McGrath. Uh, Senator, uh, sorry, Senator McLaughlin. Senator McGrath, did you? I wish to speak on the oh. Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Amendment, Save the Koala Bill, sorry, 2021. Sorry, Senator McGrath. I've got uh, Senator Ayres was next on the. Oh, well, I think that's only a guide, and I think I, I was first to my feet. So. Uh, um... Oh, I've just been provided with a, a revised list where Senator Ayres is first. So. How do I well, deal with this, I, I was first on, on, on my Senator feed. McGrath. I think... Sorry, uh, Senator Ciccone. Uh, on a point of order, Madam um, Acting Deputy President, um, look, I, I, I understand the, that the lists for speakers and the lists are uh, arranged between the whips. I'm not aware of any alterations to that list, and I would certainly ask that you stick to the list that's been provided to the Chamber. Senator McGrath, I'm, I'm hampered by the fact that I've just got a, I've just got a, um, a revised list which does put Senator Ayres um, before you. But, uh, uh, Minister, your attention to the state of the chamber. Thank you. Uh, required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Capito? A quorum is present. Senator McGrath. The president, I, I will give way. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Well, sure whether Senator McGrath uh, uh, desperately wants to stop me saying something uh, in this place, I'll have to review uh, my speech and try and work out whether there's something outrageous that I can say. There is something about the politics. There is something about the politics of koalas that drives the National Party and the Liberal Party. Wild. I'm not sure what the hostility to one of our favourite national creatures is, but there's odd behaviour uh, around koalas in this parliament uh, and in the state legislatures. Uh, in fact, it was just last year that the bloke who careers around New South Wales in a sort of very untidy way, the deputy premier, the leader of the National Party in New South Wales, threatened to split. Uh, the coalition government in New South Wales over this very issue. Uh, he overstated, in truth, overstated the impact 
of what was a very uh, bland set of changes uh, performed uh, in, um, in regional communities, telling them that something terrible was going to happen to their capacity to manage their own land, which was absolutely untrue in true National Party form, uh, and then, of course, faded from the scene. Uh, another Barilaro effort where the, all the noise is made in regional communities, uh, a lion in Gunnedah uh, and Armidale and Coffs Harbour uh, and, and in Lismore, but a mouse in Macquarie Street, uh, folded. It does, it does make you ask the question rhetorically, uh, what has the koala ever done to the Liberal and National Party? How much, indeed, can a koala bear? Um, it's, 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 the bill does propose an indefinite moratorium on, clean, on clearing and koala habitats. Uh, it, is, it, is a, um, it is not the approach that the Labor Party would take uh, in government. Uh, our approach would be a more targeted, uh, a more uh, temporary moratorium in places where the koala is listed as vulnerable only until the relative policy instruments that are required or the relevant policy instruments that are required are in place, a threatened species recovery plan and a national koala strategy. The, the Samuel review commenced in October 2019 and reported to the Parliament in 2020. It made 38 recommendations, including the immediate reduction of legally binding national environmental standards and filling the gaps between state and federal legislation. I think that while this bill uh, would uh, widen the gap between Commonwealth and state regulation and increase uncertainty, it is, I think, true that uh, what is proposed here is unlikely to make its way into legislation. It's like some of the notices of motion that we see from time to time. It's an opportunity to put a bill with the title Koala in it to a vote. Uh, there'll be some social media presentations about, uh, about this bill going through the parliament, but it won't in fact deal with the crisis that we're seeing in koala populations around Australia. Just like Bob Brown's convoy to central Queensland, this won't actually change the material facts on the ground for koalas. It's a big show for attentions and, and donations, and it does undermine, in my view, actual effort to protect the environment. There is a crisis uh, in koala populations. It's estimated that in 1788 there were 10 million koalas on this continent. Uh, since the bushfires, uh, we have estimates of koala populations that have koala populations in New South Wales down to about 36,000 in dramatic decline since the bushfires. The Pilliga region once had a thriving population of koalas living on public land, uh, and the population has begun to decline in dry conditions, deteriorating foliage quality a lack of water. By 2014, the population in that region had decreased by 80 per cent. In 2019, no koalas could be found. Across New England and Gunnedah, the population has declined 75 per cent in a decade. In 2019, there are less than 2,000 koalas in the Kalgoa, Moree and Gunnedah areas combined, and that was before the bushfires. In evidence given to the Senate inquiry into the bushfires uh, that, that I have the privilege of chairing, we know that more than a billion animals were killed in the bushfires—143 million mammals. Inquiry heard about the destruction on Kangaroo Island, South Australia, uh, and right across the country there's a crisis indeed uh, in, uh, in koala protection and in the koala, uh, and in the koala population. Now, indeed, it's almost a year after the bushfires. The Morrison government, during the election, offered a grab bag of policies, announced at a press conference, true to form, press conference about saving koalas, 
shared a liberal branded Facebook ad saying that they were protecting the koalas and restoring their habitat. Of course, since that, the koala population has gone down, not up. Uh, since that, the crisis has deepened. Uh, no solutions, just a press conference, an announcement and an ad from this government. No action at all. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, I propose to conclude uh, my remarks there and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Uh, is leave granted for Senator Ayres to continue his remarks? Yes, leave is granted. I call the clerk. General business order of the day, number 61. Franchising Laws Amendment, Fairness in Franchising Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Thank you. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I am pleased, as a Labor Senator, today to uh, rise and speak on the Franchising Laws Amendment, Ombudsman and Fairness, Bills, uh, Fairness Measures Bill 2020. The bill is a practical, albeit limited, response to the work that was started in the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial Services and delivered a unanimous report with the support of none other than uh, John Wacker Williams, uh, the very effective uh, national senator who uh, delivered this Fairness in Franchising Bill inquiry. Today, this is a bill for fairness for small businesses. It proposes urgently needed and necessary reforms to add appropriate and meaningful balance to a multi-billion dollar industry that was shown to be inappropriately regulated and with an ineffective code of conduct rife with unjust practices. The franchising sector produces almost 7 per cent of our GDP and is ubiquitous across the country. I think Australians would struggle to name a town or suburb that doesn't feature one franchise business or another, whether it be a petrol station, a cafe or fast food restaurant. This sector has been the subject of 17 inquiries over the last 30 years due to the chronic and endemic issues that are continually played out in the media and through the trials and traumas of hundreds of small businesses across the country. We cannot delay reform anymore. We don't need another inquiry. We don't need another task force or another round table. This bill takes long overdue action. As the inquiry report, and I remind senators that it was a unanimous report, noted, and I quote, the evidence to this inquiry indicates that the problems including exploitation in certain franchise systems are systemic. The franchise agreement embeds the power disparity between franchisor and franchisee for the duration of the contract, including the exit arrangements. The Joint Parliamentary Committee received a raft of evidence about how the abuse of contractual power can manifest in a franchise agreement. Further, the committee also received evidence that pointed to shortcomings in the regulatory responses such as the duty to act in good faith and the unfair contract term provisions. We found disgusting practices such as churning and burning. For those who don't know, churning refers to the repeated sale by the franchisor at a single site of a failed franchise to a new franchisee. Burning refers to continually opening new outlets, some of which are unlikely to be viable, to profit from the upfront fees that the, that the franchisor acquires while leaving existing outlets to struggle and to close. Both that churning and burning, uh, while making money for the franchisor, sometimes hundreds of thousand dollars a turn, leaves franchisees emotionally and financially battered and their dreams of owning their own business in tatters. Um, the extent and the breadth of misconduct and exploitation by franchisors within the franchisee sector demonstrates that disclosure and transparency alone, while vitally important, are an insufficient response to power and information asymmetry. And that is part of what this bill seeks to do. It will empower the small business ombudsman to recommend arbitration in the same way that it is able to for the Dairy Code. The ability, inability of franchisees to effectively pursue disputes or breaches of contract through the current framework was one of the key findings of, of the inquiry. My colleagues from all parties delivered this unanimous report noting many cases of bullying and intimidation. Justice in the courts was not available because the powerful and those loaded up with dollars had access, but a franchisee that's been ruined had no recourse. 
The bill will provide an optional binding alternative dispute resolution that is determined by an expert in the field. It also furnishes the Ombudsman with the power to name and shame those who don't take the recommendation for arbitration. The reforms proposed in this bill are interdependent and form a holistic framework to reshape the landscape for the current franchising sector. The bill will increase the quantum of penalties for breaches of an industry code in the Competition and Consumer Act 2010 from 66,000 up to a potential 10 million or 10 per cent of the annual turnover of the corporation or three times the benefit that the corporation directly or indirectly obtained from the breach, whichever is higher. In 2019, the ACCC recommended to a parliamentary inquiry into franchising to increase the penalties of the breaches from 66,000 to 10 million to deter bad behaviour from franchisors. The imbalance of power that this inquiry found was unfortunately um, accompanied by an imbalance in education. The upgrade of engagement capacity with the Ombudsman will allow the Ombudsman to address this by providing trusted and unbiased help. Small businesses are being driven into economic peril by a sector that's shown it's incapable of self-policing or renewal. As was reported in the inquiry, in the inquiry there are deeply rooted cultural problems that will not be resolved by franchisors replacing a few senior executives. Australian businesses have waited long enough. I've waited long enough. Labor is standing up for franchisees here today. We're sick and tired of waiting for the government to get its act together and implement the recommendations in the committee's report. We cannot rebuild our economy when such a large sector that engages 7 per cent of the GDP remains institutionally broken and unjust. I believe in small businesses. I come from a family that came to this country to build a future, and they did that by building a small business. So many hardworking immigrants have seen franchising as a way to learn safely about the Australian business sector, only to be totally ripped off by people exploiting the current structures. They need this legislation to provide protection. There is much, much more that the government could do. But from opposition, this is our significant effort to support small businesses at a critical point of need. And I urge the government and the crossbenchers to stand with Australian fr franchisees and pass this bill. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Chair. Uh, I'll start by just as Senator O'Neill did, acknowledging the work in this space of members on this side, particularly the long uh, and enduring interest of Senator Wacker Williams uh, into this particular topic. But that is a tradition that has been carried on by a number of others in this place. We've been joined recently by uh, Senator Ben Small, who's obviously got a very strong background in the uh, small business sector. We've got um, David Van sitting in the chamber here at the moment who has a keen and abiding interest in this topic as well. So Se Senator Williams' concerns expressed over a, a great number of years in this place are continued and are being acted upon by those on this side. And for the small business community, there is nothing better than a strong and durable economy. With the shock that we have faced uh, over the past 12 months, an extraordinary shock to the global economy, an extraordinary shock to the Australian economy. But uh, in another piece of very good news today, I'll just inform the chamber that Fitch has reaffirmed Australia's AAA credit rating. They said that the Australian economy has weathered the pandemic well compared to its peers. The performance re reflects successful virus containment and effective fiscal and monetary response consistent with policy framework that has underpinned the economic resilience to shocks over the medium term. And one of the drivers of this is our small business sector, and one of the key drivers of the small business sector is our franchise sector, and uh, in particular, the many, many small business franchisees. So, um, so with respect, uh, Senator O'Neill, I understand where you're coming from with this bill, but what you are doing is misguided, and it fails completely to acknowledge both the commitment of this government to the small business sector, to the franchise sector, uh, what this government has done and what this government is doing to assist this sector completely fails to acknowledge those facts. And I think that comes down to a very simple proposition of why that's the case, because those on the other side do not understand small business and have never understood small business. The franchising 
sector of our economy is predominantly small business. So those on the other side will always struggle to understand it. Franchising is a, a very significant part of the Australian economy. It's a $154 billion sector in the, 21, the 2021 financial year. There's around 91,000 franchisees across Australia, 1,200 franchise systems, half a million people employed within the franchise sector, and, as I have said, almost all of the franchise sector is made up of small businesses. When we think of the franchise sector, all too often it's, it's too easy just to think of your retail fast food chains, uh, be it a McDonald's or a coffee club, or perhaps, perhaps a chain of hotels that operates under a franchise model. That's, that's, the, that's the obvious part of the franchising sector. But when you think about it a little more deeply, you see that the franchising sector operates right throughout the economy, whether it's sign making, whether it's graphics and printing businesses, whether it's in the construction sector, uh, the wholesale trade sector, inclu including the food sector, the retail trade sector, obviously the most predominant, but we also see it significantly in the transport sector. We see it in the financial services sector, in rental, hiring and real estate services. We see it in things like uh, administrative support services, such as, as mowing services, uh, trampoline parks, swim schools, pet care services, auto repair shops, auto repair servicing, IT, hairdressing, beauty salons. The franchising sector spreads across the entire economy. And that means we have a diverse range of small businesses, a diverse range of franchising models, and a diverse range of Australians who are working, living in these businesses, and we have to, as a government, support them in a responsible manager, in, in a responsible manner, to acknowledge that what they do is a very valuable part of the economy and to put in place a regulatory structure that actually delivers for those small businesses right across the Australian economy. Support for small and medium-sized family businesses and the franchising sector is something that the Australian government does uh, have as a very important priority and absolutely acknowledges the issues that came out of the Fairness in Franchising report. The report did identify a range of misconduct by franchisor, franchisors. Now, egregious, egregious conduct was not widespread, but it was present and it did significantly and devastatingly impact on a number of franchisees. In August 2020, the Morrison government announced its commitment to introduce stronger protections and greater transparency to the franchising sector. In fact, the government's already outlined a suite of reforms to restore confidence in this sector. Uh, and uh, I must say, I think a large part of the sector demonstrates its confidence through its continuing operation and successful operation throughout the pandemic year. But to add to that, we want to lift franchisor standards of conduct and improve the information available to all franchisees. Draft amendments to the Franchising Code have been released. These include such things as improving disclosure on significant capital expenditure, supplier rebates and, most importantly, marketing funds, preventing franchisors from passing on legal costs to franchisees and retrospective variations to franchise agreements, to improve end of franchise relationships, including cooling off periods, early exits, terminations and any restraint of trade arrangements, strengthening the dispute resolution options and doubling penalties to deter poor conduct in this sector. The government will provide franchisees greater protection by ensuring they have the information they need before they enter a franchise agreement. Senator O'Neill's bill does not address these much needed protections. The government will implement a stronger framework to lift 
franchisor standards of conduct. We're committed to timely implementation of reform to restore confidence in the franchise sector and committed to getting these reforms right. This will mean working with the sector to make sure that the implementation of the reforms is done properly. In particular, that means working with that great diversity in the franchising sector that I spoke about earlier. This is not a one-size-fits-all sector. This is an extraordinary complex sector, an extraordinary number of participants in it, a large number of different business models, and the, the idea that one size will fit all in such an environment just shows how little understanding of the small business sector those on the other side actually have. The government's response will com comprehensively address a much larger range of issues identified in the Fairness in Franchising report than the few limited measures that appear in Senator O'Neill's private senator's bill. This would amount to a piecemeal approach, an approach which doesn't address many of the systemic problems identified in that Fairness in Franchising report and fails to take into account that great diversity and that the, the great variation in franchising that we see in the Australian economy. I know uh, uh, my colleagues have a contribution to make as well, so I will curtail my remarks there, Madam Acting Deputy President. But let me just say that those on this side of the chamber are the strongest supporters of our franchise sector, the strongest supporters of the franchisees, small business people who are out there trying to do the best for them, for their families, for their employees, and we certainly have their backs. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Would it would be very surprising then if you are the strongest supporter of franchisees and small business, Senator, that you wouldn't be supporting this bill here today. Um, this bill and the recommendations of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial Services, which are reflected uh, in this bill, has a support of the uh, Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman, the Australian Council of Trade Unions, the Council of Small Business Organisations Australia, COSBOA, Australian Automotive Dealers Association and the Australian Association of Franchisees. Uh, pretty comprehensive uh, across the board representation there. Um, and uh, Mr Peter Strong, who many of us in this place uh, know very well and, uh, and I would dare to say are also very fond of, uh, the CEO of the Council of Small Business Organisations of Australia, made the argument that when a franchisor exploits their small business franchisees, they're not just exploiting a business, they're ruining the lives of the people who own the business and their families too. These people might lose their house and everything they have and often go through extreme emotional stress and turmoil. They don't have the resources to go to court, which is why making inexpensive arbitration available through the Ombudsman is so important. And having participated uh, on the uh, Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial Services myself. Um, in a sense, that, uh, that committee and those Senate hearings became part of uh, the work to get some justice for these franchisees because they didn't have the resources to go to court. Uh, the parliament, this place, ended up stepping in uh, calling as witnesses, and if I remember rightly, and Senator O'Neill, who was also on that inquiry, uh, if she'd been here, would uh, agree with this. Um, my, certainly, my t time in this place, uh, over nine years, the first time we've ever had to compel a witness to appear before a Senate inquiry. Indeed, the witness, a very uh, wealthy uh, franchisor from Queensland, uh, took it to the High Court, and the Senate won. Uh, the parliament won in the High Court and we had to compel this, this guy and his team and his band of uh, lawyers to actually come to this parliament and answer questions. That's how important this inquiry was, uh, to help represent the small businesses and the people behind uh, those small businesses, the franchisees in this country. And of course, um, as I said, um, a number of recommendations, there are nearly 76 recommendations, many of which are reflected in this bill today. Now I understand there's currently 
uh, around 2.4 million small businesses operating in Australia, um, and around 90% uh, of all businesses in terms of numbers, employing roughly 4.7 million people, uh, around 41% of Australia's workforce. Um, I've run a small business myself. Um, I'm not sure whether you'd say successfully or not. I wound my company up recently because I became a senator and could no longer be a winemaker. But my wife uh, is still very successfully running a small business and employs 25 people in my local town of Launceston. Um, we understand what it's like to run a small business and employ people uh, and how, how difficult it can be uh, to be the only one really who's getting up in the morning to make sure the wheels are turning uh, and that employees get paid and, uh, and, and uh, clients uh, get serviced. Um, franchisees. Uh, are an important part of this uh, small business community. Uh, there's nearly 100,000 franchise businesses in Australia employing over half a million people. Uh, franchisees provide everything from food to entertainment to personal and household services, often uh, with globally or nationally recognised names, but always with a local flavour and connection. And although it's never been easy for small businesses, um, it's probably never been tougher than it is right now. Uh, and may I say, um, I'm very glad the government uh, listened to uh, many of us in here and, and brought in JobKeeper uh, at the beginning of this global pandemic. Um, I myself was one of the first people calling for a, a living wage. I know there were other people in this place that were also looking at what was happening in New Zealand and the UK. Um, I spoke to Cosborough, uh, a number of small business associations around the country, the Chamber of Commerce in my own state, and asked them to lobby really hard to get a living wage for workers because we didn't want to shut our small businesses down. We, didn't want, we were told we couldn't open. We were told we weren't able to operate. People couldn't come and see us, um, yet we didn't want to shut those businesses down. We didn't want to send workers to go and join uh, the queue down at Centrelink. We wanted an alternative, and uh, the government, to their credit, listened. After a couple of weeks, uh, the trade unions, the Chamber of Commerce, and, and it was a really interesting alliance between business um, and, and the union movement to help get this, deliver this living wage. Now, it wasn't perfect, uh, needed lots of tweaking. It's probably not the way we would have designed it if we'd had a chance. But nevertheless, I think we all agree in this place uh, paying uh, workers a living wage during tough times like this has worked really well. It really is one of the few things that have, uh, have kept us literally, pardon the pun, uh, in business uh, in the last 12 months. Um, on top of that, we've got technological disruptions and a flat loaning economy. Um, and of course, uh, we're not through this pandemic yet, not by a long means. Uh, with an exit rate of around 13 per cent, small business failure is on the increase, and it's only going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, if the government was serious about supporting its um, economic engine room, uh, it would accept the 71 recommendations made by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporation and Financial Services and their report. Uh, on the operation and effectiveness of the franchising code of conduct instead of just fiddling at the margins. And a good start to that commitment would be supporting this bill here today. And I am actually genuinely surprised that the government uh, isn't supporting it. Um, the Greens stand with the Ombudsman, uh, with the unions, with peak bodies and Australian small business and franchisees in supporting this bill. Uh, and uh, just largely, may I, uh, may I congratulate Senator O'Neill for bringing this bill forward and for uh, I know the amount of hard work she put in uh, to that inquiry and getting this to here today. Uh, and I may also acknowledge <coughs> excuse me, uh, previous Senator Wacker Williams, Wacker John, John Wacker Williams, uh, who um, I think Senator O'Neill and I and others have worked with very closely over many years. I, didn't, I participated in this inquiry, but certainly wasn't a driver like these two were. But I know over the years, uh, Wacker uh, contributed to much that's been much good that's been done in this place. So uh, I urge the uh, government to support this bill. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Small. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The government does not support Senator O'Neill's bill, not because we are deaf to the plight of small business in Australia, not because we haven't heard the very clear message from listening to franchisees across Australia but instead because this bill seeks to make a political pre-selection stunt out of what the government considers are very real issues. And I look forward uh, to explaining in detail why the proposed Morrison government's legislation will go much further to meaningfully addressing 
franchises in Australia and the very real impact that it has on small business in this country. The government has already taken strong action to introduce additional protections and greater transparency in the franchising sector in Australia. Our reforms will cover a much broader range of issues in a more fundamental and carefully considered way than those put forward by Senator O'Neill. I look forward to the support of Senator Wish Wilson and the crossbench when we actually address the concerns of those Australians. The broad range of problems identified in the Fairness in Franchising report are real. Seeking to implement the very limited number of Senator O'Neill's proposals now would be a piecemeal approach and detract from the timely consideration and the carefully considered implementation of a full range of reforms that are clearly required in this sector. Replicating the multi-party mediation provisions in the government's response to the Fairness in Franchising report is not where we need to be. The Morrison government has already proposed these reforms on multi-party dispute resolution, and they go significantly further than the reforms contemplated in Senator O'Neill's bill. Where appropriate, multi-party dispute resolution will be compulsory for franchisors. Under Senator O'Neill's proposed bill, franchisors would still need to agree to engage in multi-party dispute resolution. The government's approach, instead, will allow franchisees to share the costs of dispute resolution, promoting access to justice for those who need it and addressing the clear power imbalance, in some cases, between franchisors and franchisees. The Morrison government is clearly on the side of small business people in this case. Senator O'Neill's bill calls for optional binding alternative dispute resolution. However, we have already committed to introducing voluntary binding arbitration into the franchising code. That has simply been cut and pasted into Senator O'Neill's bill. The Morrison government will go further than that bill by recognising that conciliation is an important form of dispute resolution that should be available to franchisors and franchisees. The government's committed to this franchising dispute resolution assistance also via the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman's Office, recognising the importance uh, of the role that the Ombudsman has to play in the franchising sector. The Morrison government's reforms will also see franchisors subject to increased civil penalties of up to $10 million for engaging in misleading, deceptive or unconscionable conduct under the Australian Consumer Law, and up to 600 penalty units, which would currently equate to $133,200 per offence for all other offences under the Strengthened Franchise Code. The government is committed to this significant 100 per cent, that is a doubling, of the penalties for breaches of the Franchise Code. As the enforcement agency for the franchising code, the ACCC, has the power to seek penalties for breaches of Australian consumer law. That, again, equates to $10 million, three times the value of the benefit received, or 10 per cent of the enterprise's annual turnover in the preceding 12 months, where the court cannot clearly determine the benefit from the offence. So it is the Morrison government that is on the side of franchisees in Australia implementing a stronger framework that adequately addresses the root causes of issues that franchisees face. On 20 August, as my colleague Senator Brockman has clearly outlined, we announced that the Morrison government was committed to introducing stronger protections and greater transparency for the franchising sector in order to restore confidence and enable this important part of the Australian economy to go from strength to strength. Our reforms, as I've clearly stated, go much further, covering a broader range of issues and addressing the systemic problems that the Fairness in Franchising report has articulated. It is the Morrison government that can be trusted to implement a stronger framework to deliver improved franchise or standards of conduct and stay on the side of Australian small business. The government is committed to a timely implementation of these measures, thereby restoring confidence in the franchising sector. This comprehensively 
addresses a broad range of problems identified in the Fairness in Franchising report and doesn't simply seek to make a political point out of the limited number of points that Senator O'Neill's bill has raised. I guess we can point to this because we haven't seen a spread on the back of the Fin Review today, and we haven't been in here articulating promises that don't adequately address the issues that are faced every day by Australians out in the economy in this important sector. By increasing the penalties, by addressing systemic concerns, by, uh, uh, I guess, um, furthering the Morrison government's clear commitment to Australian small business, we are on the side of Australian franchisees and have listened to their concerns uh, carefully. Our, our track record clearly speaks to this, with the coalition government having delivered uh, a series of very important policy reforms since 2013 uh, that saw more than 1.5 million jobs created before the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. We are in a better, stronger and more resilient position than many countries around the world because we listen to business, we get business and we respond to the concerns of business in Australia. The assistance that we provided through the COVID-19 pandemic has built upon this substantial track record of putting in place actual policies that mean something to Australian small business. So far from grandstanding on this important issue and far from turning our back on the needs of Australian small businesses, we are here with a meaningful, carefully considered and comprehensive range of reforms that are far-reaching, will be meaningful and actually deliver benefit to those Australians who we clearly heard needed our assistance through the Fairness in Franchising report. It was Labor that voted against tax relief for small and medium business 15 times in the last parliament. It was the Labor Party that went to the last election with $387 billion in additional taxes. $387 billion in additional taxes. And now, to make a political point out of this, Senator O'Neill would seek to disrupt, undermine and dissuade people from supporting this very important process. They, senators, the Morrison government will address this. We've been clear about the way in which it will benefit Australians, and we look forward to the, the support from the crossbench when we seek to do so. I thank the. Thank you, Senator Small. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I note that this is a real David and Goliath battle that, that Senator O'Neill has taken on, and she's taken it on well. I point to one corner, we have General Motors, one of the world's largest corporations, ruthlessly abandoning its franchisees in this country, doing it without any consideration, and the government stood by and watched. Families that have put their businesses together over decades, blood, sweat and tears, lots of hard work, small to medium businesses ploughed so much work into their, their, uh, their businesses as well. And what do we see? Just divested by General Motors, tossed aside on the scrap heap. And the government delayed. It promised to address this issue, but it still failed to do so. You know, no wonder people are feeling concerned, afraid, vulnerable, very worried at the, heart, at the hands of large multinational companies with huge imbalances of power. General Motors is treating their franchisees, the Holden dealers, right across this country, Holden dealers, small businesses often, with decades of, uh, of history, treating them like dirt. Now we have Mercedes lining up to do the same, and Honda and Renault. A Honda, a company that, is, that has worked so admirably around the world with its dealers, now looking to quit uh, its dealer network as well. These companies stealing databases that have been built up over decades. Queensland rural dealerships. I mean, look at our country. Look at our state, rather. It's the most decentralised of any. It's the only state with more people in the rural areas than in the city, than in the capital city. And those dealer networks need support. But it's not just car dealers. It's also boat dealers, marine dealers, water sport dealers, motorbike dealers. And it's not just wheel dealers. It's people with small business franchises right across this country. And what they're needing is support. They're needing fairness and they're needing support for locals for small business. They're needing some security, some certainty. 
60,000 workers in this sector alone, in the auto sector alone, according to Senator Neil, uh, Neil, and that includes many, many tradesmen, many apprentices, good people, local community businesses. And I want to commend Senator O'Neill because Senator O'Neill came to us to explain her bill. She asked for our support. She did her research. She was willing to answer questions, be, be on call at any time just to answer her questions and put her staff on, on, uh, uh, on call to us. I acknowledge that through you, Deputy Chair, to Senator O'Neill. I appreciate it and I endorse, endorse her work. She works. And if Labor senators had the same enthusiasm in general as Senator O'Neill, then we'd be able to work with them much, much better. We commend Senator O'Neill for the way in which she has done so, and she came to us just freely offering us uh, her bill. Senator O'Neill, sadly, is one of the very few real Labor senators in this parliament. I know at least 20 per cent of Labor senators are upset with the way Labor has turned against workers, abandoned workers in favour of woke policies supporting the globalist agenda. Look at things like taxation policy. Look at things like energy policy, destroying manufacturing. And the Liberals and Nationals are similar. They're just a matter of grades apart. But the Labor Party's policies and the Liberal National policies are abandoning manufacturing they're swallowing the UN dictates, the UN Kyoto Protocol, the UN Paris Agreement, which is not really an agreement, and going back to 1975, the, US, the UN's Lima Declaration, the UN Kyoto Protocol, UN Paris Agreement, Lima Declaration, all selling out manufacturing, selling out to some extent all industry, including agriculture. And what about the free trade agreements, so-called free trade agreements? We want instead fair trade agreements. Labor support for free trade agreements means that they're selling out workers and Australian employers, small and large. Tax policies, as I said, that let foreign multinationals off the hook. Labor Party in Bob Hawke's era as Prime Minister let them off the hook with petroleum rent resources tax. And yet a few Labor senators stand up for workers, but sadly they're in a the very small minority. And when I look at immigration, look at pay rates that are stagnant because of rising immigration until COVID. And with rising costs and stagnant pay, it means living standards are falling. Look at the shortage, look at, look at the oversupply of, of workers so that we've got a shortage of jobs. Sorry, an ex abundance of jobs and a shortage of, of, of um, an oversupply of workers, so I beg your pardon, oversupply of workers that are driving wage rates down. Look at the pressure on housing, driving housing prices up. Look at the pressure on infrastructure in this country because the Labor is tied to this large country policy, let in many, many immigrants, far more than we need. Look at the gender bending, the school indoctrination and the trendy virtue signalling that is taking over the Labor Party. We have good senators like Senators Stirl, Farrell, Gallagher, Sheldon and others. Great to work with. They support workers. They're honest people. And yet they are saddened that the Labor Party has abandoned them. The Labor Party has swamped them in woke policies. So while Senator O'Neill supports real Australian businesses, her party has largely abandoned workers. Look at the energy sector. Coal tossed on the scrap heap by Labor's virtue signalers. Look at industrial relations, where Mr Joel Fitzgibbon abandoned and neglected the abused and exploited workers in the Hunter Valley, workers that I had to come in and support from Queensland with Stuart Bonds, in, in the, our candidate in the Hunter, selling out our sovereignty to the UN globalists. These are the things that Labor now stands for. And as Senator O'Neill has showed her leadership in coming to work with all the parties on the crossbench and the Greens, as Senator Wish Wilson has complimented her, and rightly so, we would expect that Labor would have a reasonable accommodation in play. Re we would reasonably expect that Labor Party would have an attitude that would be more favourable to Senator Hanson's bill to get foreign companies to pay tax on petroleum resources. 
Yet Labor de denied support to our bill. And when we asked them why, just a blank stare. Nothing, no reason, no justification. So I will finish with this, talking about this bill by emphasising the two major benefits. It brings compulsory arbitration to rectify the imbalance between those who have enormous power like General Motors and the franchisees who have limited power. And the massive increase in penalties, all justified to restore the balance of to restore some balance in power. However, the Australian Financial Review rightly said today that this is just a plugging the hole in the dike. Labor has lost its way in policy. Labor has lost its way in our Senate. But One Nation will reiterate again that we will support all parties, yet we expect parties to work with us and to give us a fair go. I support this bill and I thank Senator O'Neill again for her leadership in reaching out to me in my office. We will work happily with Senator O'Neill and I remind the Labor Party that if they ever get back into power, they will need to work with us. They will need to work with us. We will be happy to work with people like Senator O'Neill, Senator Farrell, Senator Stirl, Senator, Senator Gallagher, Senator Sheldon. These are the people, sadly they are a minority, but we will happily work with Senator O'Neill and, and her like. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And I rise, and while I will be not supporting this bill, I do thank Senator O'Neill for all her efforts on this bill and for her, her tireless efforts around franchising. This is a speech I've long wanted to give in, in this place. Um, for a bit of background, uh, prior to being elected to the Senate, uh, I worked very closely with the franchising sector. Uh, I was a voluntary director on the Australian Association of Franchisees, which Senator Wish Wilson mentioned earlier, and have worked with most of the organisations that he named. The Parliamentary Joint Committee of, uh, of Corporation Financial Services did an incredibly thorough investigation of franchising. And both Senator Neal and all the members on that committee, uh, you know, particularly driven by, uh, by um, Michael Suka as the chair and before him Steve Irons. I sat in on, on almost all of those inquiries uh, and I'm probably one of the few senators, probably one of the few people on the planet that read all of the submissions to that inquiry. Those submissions were harrowing, absolutely harrowing, about the effects that the power imbalance in franchising had on small businesses. Because Senator Farrell, and I'll come to that and I'll take your interjections any time because you're just going to help me reinforce my points. Those stories were harrowing. The complete and utter devastation caused to people's lives by that power imbalance, which is written into the code. The code is not the right instrument for this. And so while I say I'm not going to su support Senator O'Neill's bill, it's not because it's not a step in the right direction. It truly is. But the government's legislation that's pending and as everyone in this place knows, there's been extraordinary consultation going on about that. The legislation that's pending that will come before this place goes an awful lot further. So why take a, a, you know, a, a one small step when we can take a giant leap? Now, on that, the, the inquiry heard about that power imbalance that I talked about before, and you know, it gave that the inquiry gave franchisees the ability to be able to have their voices heard and their report and the recommendations came forward were incredibly important. There's no doubt that the franchising code is effectively broken and there have been numerous attempts to reform the franchising code since it was initially introduced in 1998, including a complete rebuild of the code in 2015. However, as Senator O'Neill mentioned, there's been 17 inquiries into this code and yet we still run into these systemic problems and the ongoing issues that occur within the sector. The submissions and testimony of franchisees, coupled with the near criminal responses from the leadership of some notable franchisors, 
show the drastic need for reform to help protect the investments of franchisees. And that's not to say franchising cannot work or doesn't work. There is an incredible number of wonderful franchise systems out there. I'd probably say the split is something like 90 per cent to 10 per cent good versus bad. There is such strong examples of franchising working. And they're powerful businesses. They're powerful businesses that do a lot to grow this economy. They employ hundreds of thousands of people and contribute billions to the Australian economy. The, uh, the problem with Senator O'Neill's bill is it just doesn't go far enough. And while I think it's a, a valid attempt, and I do congratulate her for, for taking on that role and for doing so, and standing up in her caucus to do so. However, it, it, with it not going far enough, we need to look at what we can further do. And so the you know, draft amendments to the franchising code that this government is um, suggesting will improve disclosure on significant capital expenditure, supplier rebates and marketing funds. It will prevent franchisors passing on legal costs to franchisees and respective variation of franchise agreements. Improve end of franchise relationships, including calling off, early exit, termination and restraint of trade arrangements. Strengthen dispute resolution options and double penalties to deter poor conduct in the sector. And no one in this place should be under any disillusion. There is a lot of poor conduct in this sector. Given how important it is to our economy, that needs to be stamped out. So I strongly believe in the way that the Morrison government is tackling this issue. I believe it is going to bring a lot of change into the sector, uh, far more than Senators, uh, Senator O'Neill's bill will do. But that doesn't mean we can't go further. Some of the reforms that I've suggested uh, include looking at the base legislation of franchising. Is a code, is an industry code the right way to do it? Does it sitting in consumer law, is that the best protections that we can provide to these small businesses? And my argument would be it, it's not. And I'll explain why I think that. If you look at franchising in its most simplest way, it is quite literally one business saying to another, we want to grow our business, so if you contribute some capital and some sweat equity, we'll be able to all be able to grow. So any way you look at it, that is a form of capitalisation of another business. So as a form of capitalisation, it should be treated as an investment. Now, it's not the same as an equity investment nor a debt investment, but it is an investment nonetheless. And therefore, I think it uh, long term, and I do mean long term because these changes won't come about simply or easily, we should be committing to looking at changing the franchising sector to being covered by consumer law, by the Australian Consumer Law, to being covered by the Corporations Act. I think it sits in there much more solidly than it does under, corp, uh, under consumer law. And that will force some of the, this behaviour that goes on uh, by franchisors. And we've, I, I can point uh, my fellow senators to any number of franchise agreements that lock in uh, ways that the franchisor is only ever going to, be the, going to be the only ever winner out of that agreement whether it be by through the churning and burning that was mentioned before, whether it be by putting all the onus on um, leases for capital, leases for, for premises, etc., totally on that small business, on the franchisee, and locks in their disadvantage, locks in that power imbalance. And that is something that we do need to resolve. So what I've proposed to, to my colleagues um, and leadership is that franchising sector should be put before the uh, Australian Law Reform Commission for review and for it to be looked at from the grassroots up as to how we can better structure legislation around franchising to give maximum protection to small business while enabling franchising to succeed and to really truly be the generator of, um, of wealth for our economy that we've seen it can be, such that we're seeing the, the uh, best franchising uh, systems uh, succeeding even more than they are now, and you know, we all know that there are some very successful ones out there. But we stamp out this power imbalance, 
such that it's gone forever, that we no longer hear the stories of people losing their, their houses. You know, the, I think the best example I can provide is you know, the Pizza Hut franchisees, who, when they were told overnight that they were going to have to sell pizzas for uh, under $5. Now, that didn't come with a subsidy from, from the franchisor. That didn't come with um, any rebate for selling those pizzas below cost. They were forced to do it. And the franchising code and their franchising agreement, which was covered by that code, allowed the franchisor to do that. That put an incredible number of business, small businesses to the wall, and that cannot be allowed to happen again. So while I um, you know, sadly won't be um, supporting Senator Neil's bill, I do thank her for her tireless efforts in this and for all the, the parliamentary joint committee uh, every member of that, including Senator Wish Wilson's work on that committee. I think we have further to go. I'd like to see both sides of parliament work together on this. Senator O'Neill and I have discussed this quite regularly and, and I hope to keep that uh, line of communication open how we can improve the franchising sector. Um, and uh, I thank the Senate. Thank you, Senator Van. Uh, Senator O'Neill. Um, if it is okay, I would like to yes. sum up the debate now. Yep. Um, can I thank all the senators for participating in the debate? I acknowledge the contributions of the government members. Um, Senator Van, thank you for your kind words about the efforts that have been made uh, by the committee, uh, which did, did deliver that unanimous report. I also want to acknowledge the contributions of um, the new Senator Small from Western Australia and the not-so-new Senator Brockman from Western Australia. Uh, at least I made the effort to come in here and speak on it. <laughs> but it's kind of got to a point, uh, Deputy President, where the Australian people are pretty well over hearing the government come in here, bleating and moaning with statements that begin with, we care. We care about what's happening to you. We understand what's happening to you. They're the government. Caring and understanding are the beginning of action. But what's missing from this government is action. And the sector that they're abandoning by not supporting this bill today is the small business sector right across this country. The small business sector that continually are told by the Liberal Party that they are the party for the small business. Well, they're not the party for small business today. They haven't been the party for small business for a very, very long time. And if they do not support this piece of legislation, which I described this morning and was reported by Adele Ferguson in a very good piece in the Financial Review, this is a finger in the dike. There is so much work to be done in terms of franchising in this country. The government's making a very, very light touch response on a promise this bill actually does some grunt work and gets protection in place for small businesses that need it right now. I want to thank Senator Wish Wilson for his contribution, not only on the committee—I know you're no longer a member of that committee—but thank you for the work that you did and your very kind words here. Um, and also, I acknowledge uh, the national senator, Wacker Williams. You know, the nationals had a heart, a voice and a man of action when they had him in the chamber. And if they really cared about what was going on in small businesses right across this country, particularly in regional and rural Australia, they would be supporting this Labor bill today. They know that this matters. They know that this matters because recently a very good example has emerged, and that is when General Motors just walked all over Australian businesses. We're not talking about little businesses here with regard to car dealers. These are very, very important parts of our local community. Multi-generational small businesses that have grown, that are part of the care economy that happens in our regions across this country, that are part of a dealership network across the country so that when the grey nomads, having worked a, hard lo a long life and paid their taxes, have enough money to get around Australia, know that when they're in Townsville, when they're in Cloncurry, when they're in the Pilbara, when they're in far western New South Wales or even down in Tasmania that they will be able to get proper service and they will be able to be looked after by a network of high-quality tradespeople who are operating out of these dealership networks across Australia. Well, they got totally done over. That dealership network for General Motors, Holden, Holden dealers here got done over by General Motors, an overseas company. And Minister Karen Andrews, Minister 
Prime Minister Scott Morrison and Michaelia Cash, in concert with them, did nothing to prevent General Motors doing over an entire sector. There was no capacity for them to actually have proper arbitration about, Holden, about General Motors deciding to leave the country. And because they left that sector hanging, there have been changes to business models for Honda, for Renault and for Mercedes-Benz that have walked right through the door because this government hasn't got the guts to do the hard work and stand up for franchisees instead of the very wealthy franchisors and overseas companies. Overseas companies. That's who they chose over hard-working Australian businesses. That's where we are today. I want to thank Senator Roberts from One Nation. I want to be very clear. There are many, many things that Labor will disagree with, with all of the different political parties that are in here. But one thing I am committed to, and my colleagues are committed to, is the practice of democracy. When the Australian people elect people to this House, it is, an, it is incumbent on all of us to work to get good outcomes for the Australian people. This bill, in my name today, a Labor bill, is a bill to protect small businesses. In the absence of a Liberal government, a Liberal National Party government, that is leaving them hanging. I want to thank Senator Roberts for his kind words about the hard work of the committee, and I hope that we will get support for this bill today and that it will end up in the House of Representatives and enough people will have the common sense not only to do the work that the government has proposed that they will do, but to do the work now in supporting this bill to give necessary protections, urgently needed, to make sure no more small businesses that are engaged in a franchise structure are able to be exploited, because that cannot help us in our recovery. The scale of why this matters, I just want to reiterate from my uh, original remarks. The franchising sector accounts for 7 per cent of the GDP. This is no small thing. We won't have a car dealership network standing in two years after the government's watched and waited. What Australians know as a network that they rely on and support will be gone. So I urge you, senators, particularly senators on the crossbench, join with Labor in supporting small business today. I urge the nationals, have a heart, have the guts to stand up for your local small businesses. Come in and support this bill and let's get this done as a first important step towards further reforms that the government has heralded. Thank you, um, Senator O'Neill. So the question is that the bills be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bell for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is the bill will be read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart tell for the ayes, Senator Dean Smith tell for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 29. The question is resolved in the affirmative. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to franchising and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. So does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the mover of the bill to move the third reading. Senator O'Neill.
I move that the bill be read a third time. The question is the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The division required. Ring the bells for one minute. I had a request from the whips for a four-minute division, so please reset the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. The question is the bill will be read a third time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell if the ayes. Senator Smith tell if the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 29. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to franchising and for related purposes. Government business order of the day number one. Transport Security Amendment Serious Crime Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Brown. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy President. When considering this legislation and Labor's amendments, can I urge the, uh, members of the crossbench to also consider the private senator's bill recently introduced by Senator Keneally. It is Labor's strong view that risks to our transport security must be dealt with as a complete set of reforms to address often complex issues. If this legislation is pa passed in isolation, then foreign workers will still be able to freely access our ports and other transport infrastructure on very short notice, Why hard-working Australians will face even more checks and delays before they can carry out their vital work. Senator Keneally's bill would replace the current maritime crew visa, which is usually issued to applicants on a 24 to 48 hours notice, with, to, with two new categories. There would be a new international seafarers transit visa that would only be issued to crew entering Australia on a continuing international voyage. The second new category would apply to foreign seafarers who work off our coastline, often for years on flag of convenience ships. This proposed category would mandate that these seafarers are subject to the same kind of background checking that Australian workers are subject to when applying for an MSIC. These vital reforms will truly address some of the loopholes in our transport security regime. But as good, uh, but as, good as Senator Keneally's private sen senator's bill is, it is not likely to come into effect because of this government's opposition, unless, of course, the crossbench support Labor's amendments. That is why Labor has put forward an amendment to this bill that would delay the commencement of the Transport Security Amendment Serious Crime Bill until the passage of Senator Keneally's Migration Amendment New Maritime Crew Visas Bill through both the Senate and the House of Representatives. If colleagues are serious about closing some of the security loopholes in the transport sector, then I urge you to not only support Senator Keneally's bill, but also Labor's amendments that would ensure its passage. We are also seeking to amend this legislation to ensure that the scope of crimes covered under this bill are appropriately targeted and that hard-working Australians won't be denied the right to work based on rumour, innuendo, belief or suspicion. Of course, those that po pose a real credible threat should be denied access to the operations of our av aviation and maritime infrastructure. But as is the view of fair-minded Australians, when government agencies seek to deny a worker an ASIC or MSIC, that decision should be able to be appealed. But there is no such right to appeal in this legislation. During its inquiry into this bill, the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee was told that the generally understood de definition of serious crime does not apply in the case of this legislation. But as the bill currently stands, we are left in a position that we know, we know what definition of serious crime does not apply, but we are yet to be told by the government what definition of serious crime does apply. This is truly staggering when you consider the fact that the government has been seeking to pass this legislation in one form or another since 2013. That is why Labor will also be moving an amendment to insert a de definition. The workers in Australia applying for these cards have a right to know that the definition of right to know the definition of serious crime that will be applied to their application that, that has been duly considered and voted on by Parliament. To leave important features of this legislation, which will directly impact on the ability of tens of thousands of Australian workers to maintain their employment to the whim of delegated legislation, is truly appalling. Too often these days, the government comes in here with incomplete legislation and then seeks to tidy up their mess through the promulgation of regulations. Surely simple matters like the definition of serious crime should have been well and truly dealt with with the intervening seven to eight years. In, 
In every terrorist-related act that impacts on the transport sector, you will always find transport workers included in the list of dead and injured. That is why transport workers and their unions understand better than most the need to uphold the integrity of the laws and the application of those laws to protect our important national infrastructure and the workforce. For years now, these workers and their unions have been seeking to get the government to act on the real threats to our national security by foreign maritime workers who are issued visas without any of the background of other checks that Australian workers are subject to. I ask the senators to vote for the Labor amendments, and I commend the bill, the Labor amendments, to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Stirl. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to make my contribution to the Transport Security Amendment Serious Crime Bill of 2020, and uh, I have chaired the Reference Committee looking into this since 2017. And I know that there has been other Senate inquiries going on with another. Um, uh, committee. So the, uh, the, look, the, the bill aims to change the aviation and maritime security requirements that need to be met by aviation and work, maritime workers in order to receive either the uh, ASIC, which is the Aviation Security Identification Card, or the MSIC, which is the Maritime Security Identification Card. I must say at the outset, Labor fully supports tightening up. Uh, whatever we have to do to make our nation safer that will address international drug running, weapons and drugs. There's no argument about that. But there is a far more, far more evidence we need to seek, far more questions that need to be answered that haven't been answered, and therefore we have got amendments to put up and we'll be supporting our amendments and putting forward our argument. The bill will also see ASIC and MSIC card holders subject, subject to five different elements of a background check. So, number one is an identity verification to confirm the individual's identity with a name, date, birth, etc. Not a problem. A criminal history check conducted by the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission, which I'll refer to going forward as the ACIC, uh, to determine whether the individual has been convicted of certain offences identified in the eligibility criteria. Uh, three, a security assessment completed by ASIO, and fourth, a migration status checked by the Department of Home Affairs. Fifth, a criminal intelligence assessment conducted by ACIC, which relates to potential involvement in organised crime. That potential, just remember the word potential. Serious crimes do uh, deserve serious considerations by the Senate. There's no argument about that. But here are our remains, and, the, and the, the, what we have with several components of the bill. Number one is the bill will only apply to Australian workers and does nothing to ensure foreign workers on ships working in Australia's domestic shipping network is subject to similar background checks. Similar. Because currently what happens now, we know, for I think it's about uh, 24 to 48 hours, 500 nautical miles offshore, the company will fax a list of uh, names of the seafarers who will have their relevant passports, uh, be sent to Australia, and by the time they land, uh, they're free to go. Um, now, my concerns about this bill on that is there is no way known, I, and I'm still waiting, and I'm speaking now as the chair of the Rural, Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee that had a series of questions put to the department officials, and I am uh, I'm not moving here. When a lot of questions were asked, answers were not given. And as everyone in this place knows, and I've done that many inquiries I can't remember, but I can remember six shipping inquiries I've done, and at the beginning of every single one of those inquiries, we give the witnesses an opportunity to be heard in camera. And we go on for about three or four minutes talking about it. They only have to go in camera. Now, if there are matters of national security that's not there for the world to see, the senators are grown up enough and mature enough to accept that there is certain information that is not for public knowledge. We get that for crying out loud. And over the weekend I've pondered, I've pondered even more to think that our agencies could treat the Senate with the such disrespect that they wouldn't answer our questions. But it's up to them. If they're doing anything different, come and tell me that they couldn't give us answers to questions. Numbers of questions like what constitutes a serious crime? What's the world's secret about telling us what constitutes a serious crime? For crying out loud, we've heard what the, the Criminal Act determines as a serious crime. One would think that the officers in charge, whether they be ASIO or Border Protection or whoever they may be, could just answer simple questions to the Senate. Not long, you know, it's like how long is a piece of string? 
and I am absolutely disgusted as chair of the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee when they can't even give us the opportunity to say it's a national secret. And guess what, Senators? We know you won't go out and do talkback radio or television. Well, no, I wouldn't anyway. But I'd also say that all my colleagues in this building treat national security with the respect it needs. It's just a shame that whether it's the government under the direction of the minister, I don't know, I've got no idea, or it's just the government boffins who think that they're over it and they can snub Senate inquiries and not give us the decency of answers, I have no proof who it is. But what I do know is, as a long-term senator in this building, that, that you couldn't insult us even more. Because when you answer questions of the departments, the least we can do is get the appropriate response. So you will see, apart from my frustration of how we, and prove me wrong, how we can apply the same the same uh, diligent background checks to foreign seafarers as we do to our own. I'll be the first one to stand up here. I'll wear a clown suit and I'll apologise profusely that I got it wrong. Guess what? That ain't going to happen. Because what we do know, what we do know, what I think we do know, there may be, you know, if we know that there are known criminals on our flags of convenience, ships coming here that are exploiting foreign workers. And let me just go along that. The whole six inquiries I've done in shipping, every single inquiry has ended up talking about flags of convenience, the lack of security and the exploitation of foreign seafarers. So while I'm at that too, there's a couple of examples that I do need to raise. And it's important that the Senate hears it and everyone else around. Now, in one of the inquiries here in Canberra, um, and it was to do with this inquiry, is when we asked, it was raised by border protection if we know who's coming in and who's on these ships. What we do know is we know what we're being told. We don't know if they've done anything else. But here's one of the uh, examples, was that the um, border protection, and just bear with me, I'll find the actual example of where it is, because I want to get the wording correct. And it's not words made up by me. It is actually evidence given by one, uh, the department. And it virtually says that uh, the concerns that they have, this is border protection, that uh, foreign flags of convenience are an opportunity for bad people to utilise flags of convenience to do bad things like drugs and guns and, and all sorts of stuff like that and people smuggling. No argument. Thank Border for Protection for being so open and honest with us. So if the department's got a concern and we haven't got the answers given to us, where is that right? That the board, and I want to take my hat off and tilt my hat to the people at Border Protection, all those diligent, hard-working men and women in uniform. But one would think that the suits and the ties could back it up and at least answer the questions to the senators or the ministers, God help us, if they could answer the questions. But here's another one that gives me grave concern. Now, we've heard senators talking uh, 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 about Captain Salas. Well, I want to tell you what I know about Captain Salas, and I'll tell you what, what I know about Captain Salas. Because I was the chair in this building when Captain Salas was uh, running rampant around our, our shores, Captain Salas was uh, on the Sage Sagittarius. Now, this is not made up. This is reported all the way through. They called the Sage Sagittarius when they did the inquest. They called it the death ship because somehow when Captain Salas, back in I think it was about 2015 or 16, sailed into Newcastle on the way in in international waters, someone went missing, one of the crew. So one could assume that he poor devil fell overboard. Absolutely no way. The inquest has shown otherwise. He was tossed over, uh, uh, overboard. The coroner even went as far as to say that he could have been killed before he went overboard. And damn it, on the way into uh, Newcastle, the other one of the other poor fellows falls into the hull and dies. Two deaths. Two deaths on Captain Salas' ship. So then all of a sudden the owners of the ship, the Japanese coal vessel I think it was, had uh, put undercover, no secret, it's all been reported, the Japanese superintendent. And he was put on that ship to sail back to Japan. You know what happened, Senator Chikani? Oh, damn, he died. They found him in the conveyor belt when unloading. Three deaths. Then they get Captain Salas. 
And Captain Sellers, no one can find Captain Sellers. They're trying to charge him here in Australian waters. They couldn't charge over the Japanese death. So alerts are going out all around the world. Where's Captain Sellers? And I know, and I spoke to Owen Jacques, and Owen is a reporter from the Sunshine Coast in Queensland who was reporting on Captain Sellers, who told me when the inquiry was going on down in Sydney, I think it was, that he, was, he flew down to it because he was reporting on it. And they were talking there, the prosecutors, and no one could find where Captain Salas was. Border Protection didn't know immigration. Uh, uh, ASIO didn't know. AFP didn't know. No one could find him. So they're going to abandon the trial. I'm not making this stuff up. I, I can't make this stuff up. I'm not that, I'm not that, uh, not that damn uh, uh, fanatical about pretending things. Owen Jacques at the smoke break walked up to the prosecutor and said, Dear prosecutor, I know where Captain Salas is. You think I'll make this up, don't you? It's hard to believe, isn't it? And they said, well, no one else can find him. He said, I know where he is. He's sailing into—what's uh, that port in Queensland? Help me out. Gladstone. He's sailing, he sailed in. He's already come in, sorry. He's in Gladstone. I've got the name of the ship here. I can't remember. Really? And he was going out the next day. Ho, ho! This is, hey, hey, this is our intelligence uh, uh, network at, at, at work here, and you wonder why I'm cranky because I can't get answers. So all of a sudden there's a flurry of activity and off they go. I don't know if it's AFP, I think it was AFP. Went up there, chucked him in the headlock, put a handcuff on him, whatever they did, brought him down to the trial. And at the trial, he confessed to gun running. A confessed gun runner and money launderer. And we know that there's two deaths on the ship coming into Australia, one on the way out. No one knows nothing. And they even reported, some reporter, this is some reporter said he was selling guns to the crew. Are we to believe he's selling guns to the crew, the same ones he's killing and throwing overboard? I mean, it's just it's getting, it's getting, it's getting worse all the time. So here's a classic example of when our intelligence agencies or our government says it's all right, bucko, it's all in hand, we've got full control, we know who's coming into this nation. No, you don't. What you do know is you have a list of names provided by the company. And what you will find out, there will be a passport and there will be a photograph. Fine, great, not a bad start. But you don't know what they've done or what they're planning to do or what they've been tied up in unless they've been caught on the system you've got now. Someone tell me I've got it wrong. No way have I got it wrong. You haven't proved it to me yet. And I'll tell you what, I'm dying to hear. And I would love the opportunity for this Senate to back me in giving the Rural, Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee and all particip participating members the opportunity to say, we're going to hold on to this bill for a month while the committee goes back to do its work that it set out to do in 2017 and where the minister responsible can pull in the jugheads from the bureaucracy and say, you will treat the Senate with the respect that it demands, and you will treat the senators with the respect that they have earned, and you will answer questions. And if those questions go to national security, the senators are grown up enough and mature enough to back the words that I will give them once again, as I do every damn time I have a hearing, and as does every senator, the right to be heard in camera. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, it's an adverse reflection on to right of this. The, the loyal public servants of this country to call them jugheads, and I ask that it be withdrawn. It would, uh, it would assist the chair, Senator Stirl, if you could. Uh, Chair, with the greatest respect, oh, sorry, if sorry. I had to name someone and degraded them or denigrated them, yes. I am telling the truth, Mr Acting Deputy President. I am being absolute honest when I am telling you the Senate has been disrespected, the committee has been disrespected, and, and, and um, if I had mentioned someone and, and said that they were stealing or something, I wouldn't even do that. I'd pull it. But if they're that precious on that side and you need me to blow bubbles at you or something, do whatever you want to do, and now I'm going to get back to what I was actually talking about.
I, I, I think Senator Stirl was on the on. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator, Senator Stirl, I took what was on the point of order, actually. So, um, um, and if it appeases you that somehow I've upset someone, please explain to me, and I'll, I'll pull it. If I, you just may have to remind me. I don't know where I've actually. The, the minister has, the has raised a, a, a point of order that you've made an adverse reflection on, on. Not a protected category, so you're free to go. Sorry, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I do appreciate the opportunity to put forth my case because I too sit there and I know that these speeches can be far-ranging. Now I'm going to go back to where I was before I was interrupted in my train of thought, and I have to go back to 15 minutes. There's the challenge. Bring it forth. Tell me I've got it wrong. You can't have three deaths on one ship and a convicted gun runner, confessed convicted gun runner and money launderer and say that we are absolutely on top of this. I'll tell you what we're on top of. We're on top of going into um, making it as hard as possible for the right reasons to get an MSIC or an ASIC. Absolutely no problem. But now I'm only just getting started. So why is it different for our Aussie seafarers? Why can Rio Tinto, up there in the top end, Rio Tinto have eight ships. Four of the ships are Aussie crewed. Four of the ships are foreign crewed. The Aussies have to jump through loops and hoops and do backflips and all sorts of stuff. That's fine. But the foreign seafarers don't. Where is it in the Australian psyche that will make it as hard as possible for Australians to work, but as easy as possible for poor exported foreign workers? Now I want to come back to a few of my other concerns. Where is it right? Or when can someone start assisting me on, on the issue of um, guilty by association? Now think about this. If your best mate's a bikey and you're hanging out with the bikey every week, you get right to be uh, uh, serious. To be, um, Concerned. But what happens to a 55 year old wharfie whose 23 year old son joins an outlaw motorcycle gang? The father can't stop him. The son's a mature age, he can do whatever he likes. Where do those guys sit with their MC? Thank you, Senator Stirl. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. I don't really think I can top uh, the contribution by Senator Stirl, who has, you know, for many, many, many years, um, whether here in the, in the Senate or in his previous life uh, in the movement, very passionate about stand up for workers and, and workers' uh, safety. Uh, and it's good to see uh, the contribution uh, by my good friend Senator Stell here and certainly echo the comments uh, by him about trying to refer um, such matters off to the Rural and Regional Affairs References Committee, because I do think it does warrant greater scrutiny um, by this place. As my um, colleagues and other colleagues have already articulated, Labor has some serious concerns about this bill and the flaws that it contained within it. But before I address those, um, I do want to make the point, though, it is important to make clear that um, despite um, some of the measures that we'd like to see toughened up, um, you know, there are some meaningful um, issues or meaningful um, combat serious crime in our community and as such conduct really is a scourge and ought to be subject be considered um, um, be subject to considered strong and, and well targeted laws but you know as Senator still had um, articulated so well you know there are a lot of gaps that this legislation has and we really do need to seriously consider and would hope that the the minister and others opposite would take on board the contribution um, by a number of Labor senators who are well across the issues uh, for some time now. But Labor will never shirk away from the task of keeping Australians safe, and that's why we've proposed a number of amendments to the bill to ensure it meets the highest of standards that ought to be upheld for law relating to matters as serious as national security. Nonetheless, in its current form, it is clear that the bill before us does not meet that standard. And as was noted um, by many Labor senators as part of the committee inquiry into the bill, very little consideration has been given by the government to ensuring that it is fit for purpose and fair. 
My colleague, Senator Keneally, rightly pointed out last week that despite seeking to address the scourge of serious crime in our community, the bill before us even lacks a simple definition as to the exact meaning of serious crime. One is left to ask themselves, how can this bill be serious about serious crime when it does not even define what serious crime is? I mean, seriously, it's a bit of a joke and it does reflect, I guess, the government's attitude towards this bill. One of the key elements of this debate relates to the issuance of aviation security identifi identification cards and maritime security identification cards. ASIC and MSIC cards serve an important role in securing Australian transportation facilities from unlawful activity and Labor supports the schemes behind them. But many of those seeking to engage in our work at our airports and on our docks are required to acquire one of these cards. And in assessing these applications, background checks are undertaken to ensure that applicants possess an appropriately sound record to fulfil such an important role in our economy, and currently over a quarter of a million Australians held either one of these two cards. Yet, despite the importance of these cards to such workers, we know that the current system for the issuance is beset of problems, with delays, sloppy paperwork and errors in decision-making being commonplace. Workers report wait times in excess of three months for assessment of their applications and experiencing great anxiety each time their renewal comes due. This is because when errors do occur, being without an ASIC or MSIC card means being without a job. Part of, the, of this bill would seek to add more extensive background checks to the schemes, including intelligence assessments, and I'm concerned that the bill does not outline a pathway for appeal in, to those who are given an adverse security status judgment in relation to their cards. Of greatest concern, with this bill, however, is the arrangements it seeks to put in place, or rather the lack of arrangements regarding foreign crew on foreign vessels carrying flags of convenience. Acting Deputy President, foreign crews on foreign vessels carrying flags of convenience are spared the levels of scrutiny that Australian workers seeking ASIC and MSIC cards undergo. These workers, often from developing countries and paid far less than what is permissible under our laws, are most commonly the holders merely of maritime crew visas and thus are not required to meet any standard or background inspection. This arrangement, which has been described as facilitating a poorer system of security at our transportation facilities, is deeply troubling. Now, the Department of Immigration and Border Protection itself articulated its concerns about the use of foreign vessels carrying flags of convenience for serious crime. And I think this is where Senator Stirl earlier was trying to find the, um, the actual quote from the report. In a submission to the Senate Standing Committee on Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport in 2017, it stated, and this is the section that Senator Stirl was trying to find earlier, and I will quote from the report from the department, reduced transparency or secrecy surrounding complex financial and ownership arrangements are factors that can make flag of convenience ships more attractive for use in illegal activity, including by organised crime or terrorist groups. This means that flag of convenience ships may be used in a range of illegal activities, including illegal exploitation of natural resources, illegal activity in protected areas, people smuggling and facilitating prohibited imports or exports. So one is left to wonder, with concerns such as these at hand, why does this bill do nothing to address them? Why instead does it specifically target Australian workers merely going about their work and seeking to provide a living for themselves? It appears to many that what we really have here is one law for Australians on our docks and one law for foreigners. We have with this bill, what we have with this bill is a set of measures 
from the government that would seek to make it harder for Australian workers to get appropriate checks that they need to do their job, but do nothing to protect Australia from foreign threats. Make no mistake, Australian transport workers understand the importance of robust security arrangements. Let us not forget, should the worst occur, they are the ones on site most likely to su suffer injury as a result. It shouldn't come as a surprise that this government would be seeking to make life difficult for Australian maritime workers. After all, this is the government that has presided over the systemic undermining of our domestic shipping industry and the workers that rely on it to support their families. Whilst there are certainly real concerns that this bill should be addressing, sadly in its current form it fall, falls well short of doing so. And I urge those opposite to seriously consider the amendments proposed by Labor. Only with those in place can this bill achieve what it is supposed to do to keep us all safe. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. I will be calling Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, here in this debate today, uh, we can see that we're in, in need of, as a nation, well-targeted measures that address serious cr crime and maintain our national security. But unfortunately, as Labor senators have been outlining to this place, the bill that is before us does not do that. It's far from that. It is a bill that's not well targeted. It does not address the issues of serious crime at our ports and airports. And if you look at the fact that we've got a quarter of a million workers that are, uh, um, have the kind of qualifications required to do this work, they have ASIC, ASIC or MSIC cards, it really highlights that these kinds of measures do need to be well targeted. We don't want to see legislation before this place, as this bill does, that actually makes it harder for Australian workers in our ports and our airports to get the checks that they need to do their jobs. So we have here from this government yet again uh, an announcement and a headline, let's improve security at our ports and airports. But this is far from the truth. In fact, this weakens our border security by not addressing the issue of foreign crew on ships operating in Australian domestic routes. And indeed, as my colleagues have also outlined, it means bureaucratic delays and inconsistencies for Australian workers. And you have to acknowledge, and the government should be acknowledging, that when you see these kinds of bureaucratic delays and bureaucratic inconsistencies. This is actually where security risks uh, can manifest. So we have here uh, in this legislation um, an avoidance of these truthful facts. For us to be able to control our borders and maintain national security, foreign aviation, maritime workers, we know, of course, that they've got to be subject to robust background checking. It's the responsibility of the federal government to take sensible measures to deter and detect perpetrators who want to exploit loopholes in air and sea transport and travel to bring uh, contraband, including drugs, weapons, into Australia or to take such contraband out. But the fact of the matter is that this government has little appreciation for the reality of this. While they let um, exploited workers and flags of convenience come in and out of our shores, they show little appreciation of the fact that exploited labour on those ships can be far more uh, vulnerable uh, to demands to smuggle contraband 
in and out of Australia, if you're not being paid fair wages, if you're of um, uncertain immigration status uh, in Australia or in the other routes that you're travelling, then indeed you can be uh, very vulnerable to such manipulation. And indeed, we've also seen internationally when organisations like the ITF uh, that represent transport workers right around the world, they're very familiar with these kinds of issues, of the vul vulnerabilities that workers face in being exploited. For example, uh, there are instances right around the world where um, national governments and corporations in nations that I won't name now are so anti-union that they leave their workers on these ships open to manifest exploitation. So in the case of aviation security, the ASIC card and the Maritime Security Identification Card, MSIC, we know in Australia they're an important part of keeping our aviation, maritime and offshore oil and gas sectors free from interference and terrorism. They're important uh, benchmarks uh, in safety and security uh, standards in all of these sites, and they're of, of, of critical importance. And so we also want to see foreign workers being held to a standard of background checks to ensure they're not a threat to aviation or maritime security. So I ask the government, why today, in this place and in this bill, do you want to make it easier for foreign workers than Australian workers to be accredited uh, to work uh, in these Australian conditions? It is quite telling the number of times that flags of convenience and ships around the world have been found to have been engaging in criminal and terrorist activity. And why is this the case? Well, we know that a great deal of the world's shipping, including uh, shipping that takes place here in Australia, where foreign goods are imported or exported from our ports, takes place under flags of convenience. And this is where the regulation of everything from safety to emissions standards through to environmental standards and labour standards aren't regulated by a sovereign nation with attention to this detail, but rather are conveniently flagged uh, in you know, the equivalent of a tax haven that, does, that just does it for the convenience of the operator. And the evidence shows that it is these flags of convenience ships uh, that are much less regulated that have been found to be active in criminal and terrorist activity. And yet this government seeks to continue to make it easier for these ships to operate in Australia, not harder, as this legislation shows. Globally, it's well known the consequences uh, of having flags of convenience ships, where they do things like undercut uh, the labour standards of sovereign uh, shipping capabilities. And that's very much the case here in Australia. For example, we've seen uh, flags of convenience operating off our shores, even from one domestic Australian port through to another, uh, displacing uh, Australian uh, shipping, but then also in that race to the bottom displacing uh, Australian on-land transport routes such as rail and road. It's globally well known that that's, that is the kind of stuff that occurs in this kind of race to the bottom that you see here that's perpetuated by legislation like this. So we see Australian workers have been subject to a three-month wait. It could be up to a three-month wait for the MSIC. But did you know what? People as part of a foreign crew can get a maritime crew visa and come into Australia with as little 
as 24 hours notice. And that is with no MSIC card required at all. Why should there be such a difference? Well, I don't think there should be. Why is it that this government is making it harder for Australians to do their jobs? They put in their forms to get these uh, clearances, and yet it can take months for people uh, to get their clearances to be able to do this work. I can't help but think sometimes that this government hates Australian workers, or at least it knows no bounds in its race to the bottom in labour standards, in immigration uh, standards, in wages and conditions that would allow Australians to be undercut over and over again. But what are the consequences of this? Well, think about it in the context of uh, Australia having a sovereign shipping capacity where we can move goods from one port to the other under a sovereign supply chain for shipping. What are the consequences of having our capacity to ship goods between one port and another being totally reliant on flags of convenience? and foreign ships. What does that mean for our sovereign capability in a time of international crisis or disruption or war? It's not good news. And so when you make it harder for Australian workers to do their jobs, be that by allowing flags of convenience uh, on our shores, but then offering uh, unlevel uh, an unlevel playing field in terms of regulation. This is the source of losing our sovereign capability as a nation. Sovereign capability that we need to make sure is protected uh, in times of trouble. So when the government says that this bill is about serious crime and not about making it harder for Australian workers to earn money for their families, I would have thought that the government would have defined serious crime uh, as those looking to bring contraband into or out of Australia, but sadly this bill does not even define what serious crime is. In this bill we can see Australian workers with minor criminal convictions that are exposed to bureaucratic nightmares that make it harder for them to make money uh, for their families, to take that money home to their families. And I have to say, as I said at the outset, when you're going to expose a quarter of a million workers to these kinds of questions, it goes to show how inadept this government is as actu at actually targeting organised and serious crime. I'll give you the example, as I'm sure others have, of Brendan McKean's conviction for getting into a pub fight some 31 years ago. But someone like Brendan needs to renew his card. He faces a 90-day wait. And he's left in the position of not being sure whether that card will arrive in time for his next ship shift. Is it any wonder, is it any wonder that flags of convenience shipping uh, finds it easy to compete against uh, Australian regulated standards when this is the case? I ask the government, why is this costing Australian workers more than foreign workers? We know flags of convenience vessels are ripe for exploitation. The Department of Immigration and Border Protection said themselves in 2017 that the ownership and financial arrangements of these vessels is complex. They also admitted that it makes them attractive for use in illegal activity, including by organised crime or terrorist groups. And I have to say, I've seen many cases of visa exploitation taking place uh, as well. If you've got uh, bosses that 
um, make it difficult for you to get home, to see your family, if you've got bosses that underpay you. Uh, it absolutely leaves many maritime crew open to needing to answer their master's call for whatever illegal activity they're asked to undertake, uh, rather than being able to stick to the rules here in Australia, with which they might be unfamiliar. The department admitted that these ships are targets for exploitation of natural resources, illegal activity, people smuggling and facilitating prohibited imports or exports. Labor seeks to amend this legislation, and I'm sure you've heard from others about what our intentions are, intentions are in terms of looking at the scope of the offences, uh, a review and uh, other issues. So we recognise that national security is important, but we also want this government to recognise that workers being able to do their jobs is of critical importance. That is what will keep our nation safe. And this bill does nothing to address any of these important issues. Labor proposes Thank an alternative you, bill Pratt. that will. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. The government says this bill will tighten up security checking on the people who work at our maritime ports and our airports. What it's actually going to do is give public servants free reign to hire and fire workers at will. It gives bureaucrats the power to kick someone out of a 10 or 20 year career based on nothing more than a hunch that they might do something wrong in the future. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't really have a problem with uh, bureaucrats, but when I know they've come in from school, the parties have picked them up from their younger and they've got no life experience and they come through this house, that scares the hell out of me. I'll be honest about that. And I'll tell you what, that's a pattern of behaviour and it's been going on for years. So when they're making decisions about other people's lives when they've lived in this bubble, by the time they've made it to that stage, that high up in the public service, I have a problem with it. I have a significant problem with it. And you wonder why we're not making the best decisions we're probably good for the nation coming out of this house. If you're comfortable with thinking the government makes the right call 100 per cent of the time, you'd be happy with this bill. If you have no worries about their ability to figure out what the right thing to do is, you tell me to go ahead and vote this legislation through. But I know and you know that the government gets things right, and so do the bureaucrats. And if we pass this bill and they get things wrong, they could destroy someone's entire livelihood. Not just their livelihood, but their families. And for what? For nothing. The mistakes of a public servant sitting in a government department could force airport workers and maritime workers onto the dole queue. This is what this bill has the ability to do. It changes security assessments on the workers who need access to secure areas in our maritime ports and our airports. At the moment, those workers have to get a maritime security identification card, an MSIC, or for, the avi or for aviation, an aviation security identification card, an ASIC, to be allowed in to secure areas in our ports and our airports. Every person who needs access to these, those secure areas has to get one of those cards. And that's great. That's wonderful. So they should. This bill would mean that someone who has a criminal conviction from years ago could lose their job because of that. And I don't know about you people, I've spoken about this many times in here. Just because somebody buggered up when they were a bit younger, they've already paid the price, should not have to pay the price twice. That is very un-Australian. I'm not dip at them twice, especially if they've become, they've got themselves back on their feet and they've become a great citizen in this country. So why should they get punished for something that they've already done in their time? For for what? How is that fair? And like I said, they should not be punished twice. Once is enough. That's the way it works here in this nation. We don't penalise them twice. And the second part of the bill scares me even more. That's the part that means the government could reject someone's application for an ASIC or MSIC 
because a public servant thinks that they may commit a crime in the future. These are the guys, no policing experience, no court experience, making decisions over a crystal ball, saying, oh, you know what, mate, I reckon they'll do that again. Come on. Come on. This is not how it works. You know, last time I checked, you boy, you guys didn't have a crystal ball, and these public servants don't have don't have access to one either. You're playing with fire here. This is not the way we, it should work. And if you do have this crystal ball, then please bring it out on the floor so we can finally get some things right, because we'd all like to have a shot at it. You can't see in the into the future, and you can't determine or dictate somebody's life by some sort of second guessing. That is not fair. Now, I want to be really, really clear here. I don't want ice getting into the suburbs. I don't want ice running rampant. And I know the effect this can have and has on families. And I don't want it getting the chance to do the harm I know it's capable of doing. But the way to stop it is, but the way to, stop it is to go after people who are spreading it. That's who we should be targeting. If you really want to put your foot down on this stuff when it comes to ICE, then you're going to need to double your border force. You are going to need a lot more state police and you are going to need a lot more feds out there on our streets. That's what needs to be done. If you want to deter it, then put the boys in blue out there and make them loud and proud so they can see them. That should deter it. If you really want to tackle this, stop, stop, stop this stuff, stop twiddling around the edges. And that's all you're doing, twiddling. You're not even tweaking. You're twiddling. You want to fight ice and fight it with fire, not an MSIC card. Don't throw that in my face because of my past. Because I won't tolerate it. And while you're out there, put some more quarantine officers on the job. Wonderful, great. There's a good start. Get into those courts. Get into those courts and put in some legislation and bills up here that make harsher penalties. You want to get the kingpins? Then I'll tell you what. Put them in jail for life. Once you get there, they're called deterrence. That's what works. That's how it works. A bill that makes it easier for an anonymous. A bureaucrat to end the career of a person who's done nothing wrong gives that person no chance to defend themselves against that wrong decision is not how we keep our communities safe. It's how we'll ruin another family's life and their life because they made mistakes early on in their life, but does not keep the community safe. If we say that honest, hard-working people should lose their jobs and lose the ability to work in any other job in the same industry based on evidence they never get to see, considered by a bureaucrat, they'll never get to meet. Then we open up the chance that some nong at a desk will get it wrong and cause them harm. That's what we're doing here. We're allowing a public bureaucrat to come in here without any investigative skills, any policing skills, any law skills, to make decisions on somebody else's life. That's what we're seeing here. Well, I won't have somebody else judged or determined whether or not they should hold a, a working permit, basically a security one, by some sort of public bureaucrat that has spent a lifetime living in a bubble in Canberra. I won't do that because I've seen those bureaucrats over the years make too many wrong decisions and, and ruin people's lives. because they have no life experience, because everything's been given to them on a silver platter, and they've made their way to the top without any questions being asked, without any security checks while they got in here in the first place, let alone policing checks. Seems what's good for the goose is not good for the gander. I have no confidence. Bureaucrats get things wrong. The way you normally check those things is by taking them to court. That's what we should be doing here. That's how it works in this system. That's how it works in this country. 
If you've got evidence that someone's bringing in drugs, then throw the book at them. Make your case. Stick hard evidence to get a conviction. Do what you're supposed to do. If you want more power to make that happen, like I just said, I'm ready to talk. Come on, bring it to the table. Don't be lazy. Do it the harder way. Bring in the bills. Make it happen. But don't put some, some bureaucrat in control of this. It's just lazy, lazy, lazy. I'm not going to hand over the power to go around the courts and just let public servants decide who's innocent and who's guilty based on evidence that would be torn apart if it, if it ever went to court. And here we go. And guess who's going to pay for that? Guess who pay for that? The taxpayer. That's right, the taxpayer. You go pay for that. You go and pay, pay for these poor decisions that are made up here. You go and pay for that. Because a public servant, nothing will happen to them. Eventually they'll just be promoted and moved on to another department. That's how it works, just like the military works. The higher ranking you are, the more you bugger up, the more you get posted, the more you get promoted. Standard of procedure. And it's shameful. Maybe giving that kind of power would keep, them on, keep people on their toes. But honest people shouldn't have to fear the overreach of their government, let alone a public servant. And that's what this bill will do. It makes it too easy for a bloke to tick the wrong box and put you at the end of the dole queue. Your kids don't get fed, your mortgage doesn't get paid, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. Unless, of course, you've got $100,000 to find in the courts, and I wish you the very best of luck with that, because that's, that's where we're heading here. Anybody that wants to go through the court system, you better have some, you better have some uh, dimes behind you, because you are going to need them. And if you're not working, because uh, some public servant said so, then you've got a problem. Anyone who ever seen, who's ever seen a public servant tick the wrong box or make you fill out the wrong form, I've seen what happens when you get it wrong. It's annoying and it can be soul-destroying and it can be fat destroy your family. Imagine if you didn't get that chance and you'll see what kind of stupidity this bill represents. Who in their right mind would think that the same people who dreamed up robo-debt should get to decide without any trial if you're too dodgy to keep working in your chosen career. I see we've learnt nothing from the past, and a recent past at that. I get why they want the power to make these choices without the chance to have them reviewed properly, because who wants to give someone the right to show how wrong you are? Who wants to give a normal person out there the right to show up the government and say, call them out and say, hey, you were wrong? Wouldn't that be embarrassing, going towards an election? But why would I vote for something that gives one side all the power? The other side, none of the power. On the hopes that the power isn't abused. And I hold very little hope, let alone faith, in that not being abused. You want me to vote on something based on that, on the trust, that you're only using it for good? Show me an example of a policy where that's ever happened in this place. Find me one government program where nobody's ever made a mistake and caused detriment to somebody else's life. Mistakes should be found and fixed. They shouldn't be swept under the rug. Once again, common practice coming from here. If the government wants the power to put you out of business, you should demand that they have extraordinary evidence to be able to do so. This bill will require them to not only not have that kind of extraordinary evidence, as is common practice in our legal system, it wouldn't even require them to share with you what the evidence is when they made that decision to end your career. Very scary, isn't it? It's shut down the drug importation by hitting people who are importing drugs. Don't ask me to support any enormous new power to punish anyone you see fit to fit for punishment, based on nothing more than a hunch, which is all you're doing. It's so untidy and it is so un-Australian. It's a pattern with this government. Every two weeks, here's another scandal. They argue they've done nothing wrong, nothing to see here, what's new. A bit of self-reflection might explain why they're not getting my support today. If you want to go in hard against ice importers, by all means, do so. 
Geez, I'll help you at the table, no worries. I'll do it in five minutes. Just call me in. Just prove they're importing ice before you throw the book at them. Because as far as I'm concerned, those people who are smuggling in drugs to Australia deserve everything that's coming their way. You want to lock them up for life? I'm with you. But because the penalties for drug importation should be so high, the threshold you've got to meet before you're punished for doing it should be high too. On indulgence, I'd compare this to the current investigation into alleged war crimes by Australian soldiers in Afghanistan. The accusation has been made and it's got to be investigated, but until accusations are proven, they're just allegations, and that's all they are. An allegation isn't a conviction, and we shouldn't ever treat it as such. You've got to prove that person, that someone's doing the wrong thing before you punish them for doing the wrong thing. That is the Australian way. I get that sometimes proving it is hard, however tough. Suck it up. Show your resilience and get out there and prove it. Do it the right way. Show some leadership. I can tell you, but if all it takes is an innocent person to become a guilty person is for someone to accuse them of something, and you lose what it means to be guilty at all. What matters is what is proven, and evidence does matter, and evidence needs to be on the table. An accusation isn't a conviction. It should not give the power of a public servant to say so. Put the evidence on the table and do it properly through the courts, through the law, and follow it correctly. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President, and I thank the senators for their contributions to the debate on the Transport Security Amendment Serious Crime Bill. This bill is evidence of the government's commitment to ensuring our airports and seaports are not safe havens for criminal activity. Serious and organised crime causes enormous and real human suffering. The Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission has estimated it to cost the Australian economy more than $47 billion a year. This cost will continue to rise, and it is imperative that the government put measures in place to prevent serious crime for the safety and for the security of all Australians. Now, a number of inquiries and reports have noted that individuals and organised crime groups are exploiting weaknesses in the Aviation and Maritime Security Identification Card schemes. They're also known as ASICs or MSICs. And that's enabling them to conduct serious criminal activity at our airports and at our seaports, such as the importation of illegal weapons and drugs. This bill will provide greater security outcomes for Australians by ensuring that people with serious criminal convictions or links to serious and organised crime are not able to access secure areas of our airports and seaports. I'd like to thank the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee for its work on this bill through its inquiry and its recommendations. That's a committee that I very much enjoyed working with, and the Secretariat and all of the support staff who helped us along the way did an amazing job. The committee recommended that the bill, as introduced in the House, be amended to incorporate a criminal intelligence assessment in the background check process for ASIC and MSIC schemes. And subject to this recommendation being implemented, that the bill be passed. The committee recognised that prominent organised crime figures with a history of engaging in serious and organised crime and influencing others to do the same can have unmonitored access to aviation and maritime secure zones. Some of these individuals have no or minor criminal convictions and could only be identified through the introduction of a criminal intelligence assessment by the ACIC. The government supports the committee's recommendation to include criminal intelligence assessments as part of the background check process for ASICs and MSICs. The bill establishes the regulatory framework to ensure that people with known links to serious and organised crime groups will be ineligible to hold an ASIC or MSIC. The bill provides the ACIC with the ability to conduct their assessments as well as providing for merits review of adverse criminal intelligent assessments, making sure that we have due process for those who are affected. The purpose of the bill is to ensure that ASICs and MSICs are not issued to individuals who pose a serious um, security or a serious criminal risk. We know that serious and organised criminals use our airports and seaports as transit points for the importation of firearms, weapons, 
illicit drugs and other harmful goods into Australia. ASIC and MSIC holders have trusted positions within our airports and our seaports. People convicted of serious offences or with known links to serious and organised crime groups shouldn't hold these trusted positions. The Transport Security Amendment Serious Crime Bill will strengthen the government's efforts to reduce the influence of serious organised crime groups in the aviation and maritime environments and ultimately ensure that Australians are kept safe and secure. This bill gives effect to the government's election commitment to strengthen background checking regimes to ensure that individuals with links to serious crime can't gain access to our airports or our seaports. I thank senators for their contributions in debate and I call on all senators in this chamber to support this vital bill. The question is the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is the bill will be read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Dean Smith tell of the ayes, Senator Ciccone tell of the noes. The result of division is ayes 37, noes 33. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. We'll move to questions. Dr. Clark, my apologies. Act to amend the law in relation to transport security and for related purposes. We'll move to questions without notice, and I table further information with respect to questions asked by Senator Waters last week. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. When JobKeeper ends at the end of March, how many people will lose their jobs? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Uh, well, Mr. President, the advice that the Secretary of the Treasury uh, has, uh, has given to parliamentary committees uh, is that he expects the jobs recovery and the economic recovery in Australia to continue. What we have seen uh, during the course of the COVID-19 pandemic is very clearly uh, that the measures our government took saved jobs. JobKeeper, by various estimates, has saved some 700,000 uh, jobs. What we have seen in relation to the 1.3 million Australians who lost their jobs or went to zero hours at the height of the pandemic is that 93 per cent of them have come back. 93 per cent of those jobs have come back during that time. And what we anticipate, and indeed what the advice from the Treasury, from the Reserve Bank, is that we should continue to expect to see that jobs recovery. Now, that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean that there won't be, as we have said consistently from the start of the pandemic, the, that not every job nor every business will be able to be saved. Not every will be able to be saved. And these are quite infantile comments coming from some such a senator. What opposite, to be quite frank? These are difficult, challenging issues. But what we have sought to do is put in place the measures to protect the Australian economy, to protect the capacity in the Australian economy, and it has saved hundreds of thousands of jobs along the way. And we are seeing new jobs created. That in net terms, new jobs are being created so far each and every month. That yes, there are some jobs that are being lost, but more are being created as a result of the measures the government is putting in place. And post March, there will continue to be enormous stimulus, enormous activity across the Australian economy as a result of the different policy measures that our government continues Order. to put Senator in place. Senator Birmingham, Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The Reserve Bank Governor expects additional job losses to occur when JobKeeper ends at the end of March. Minister, youth unemployment is more than double the national unemployment rate, sitting at 13.9%. How many more young people will lose their job when JobKeeper ends? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, 
We absolutely acknowledge that there is a particular challenge with youth unemployment. That's why in the budget last year we put in place the job maker hiring credit as a policy proposal specific to younger Australians. And those opposite decided to come in and vote against and filibuster and make difficult the implementation of the job maker hiring credit. We did that because we looked back at the advice around previous recessions and we knew that younger people in a recession were more likely to find it harder to come back into the workforce than older people. And the evidence is actually proving that to be the case, justifying the policy decisions that our government took. As we've always said through this pandemic, the responses we want to put in place will be targeted and they'll be proportionate. And that's precisely what we've done in relation to youth unemployment there. That the job maker hiring credit is there uh, to help target additional support for young Australians because we knew Order, that that's Senator where it Birmingham. would be needed. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. The Treasury Secretary expects to see job losses and, and I quote, a pause in the labour market after JobKeeper ends at the end of March. In South Australia, unemployment went up to 7.1 per cent in the last month. How many more South Australians will lose their jobs when JobKeeper ends? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Mr President, what we expect to see, and indeed what the Treasury Secretary, who you just quoted, has told parliamentary inquiries, is that he expects to see continued recovery in relation to the employment market, that he expects to see that continuing post the end of March. Now, Mr President, I know those opposites seem to think that somehow, somehow there is a bottomless pit of taxpayer money and that forever and a day we might be able to run the type of subsidies or supports or otherwise across the Australian economy, but that is just not feasible. That is just not feasible. The Australian economy and private sector businesses cannot be run on borrowed dollars and taxpayer dollars forever. The measures we've put in place have got us through the depths of the pandemic. We've taken different transitional steps, and in those different transitional steps at the end of September, at the end of the December, those opposites said the sky would fall in, and it didn't. Employment continued to grow, grow unemployment continued to grow down, Order, and Senator that is what Birmingham. we're going to continue to work towards. Has expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister please update the Senate on the start of the plan to roll out the COVID vaccine across the nation? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, and thanks, Senator Chandler, for the question. Rolling out the COVID vaccine across the country is one of the government's highest priorities. We all encourage all Australians, when your turn comes, to take the opportunity to line up and receive a vaccine that will protect you, protect your families and protect the broader community and the country. Yesterday, Mr President, we saw 84-year-old Sydney aged care resident Jane Malziak become the first person in Australia to be vaccinated against the virus. The Prime Minister also received his COVID-19 shot, as did our Chief Medical Officer Paul Kelly, Chief Nurse and Midwifery Officer Alison McMillan. Vaccinating the Prime Minister, our CMO and Chief Nurse is a demonstration to show all Australians our faith in the safety and the efficacy of the vaccines we're providing. This week is a historic week for Australia and all Australians. Tens of thousands will begin to receive their vaccinations, starting with the most vulnerable first, part of the phased rollout strategy. We have prioritised the most vulnerable people in our society to receive the COVID-19 vaccine first. A team of healthcare professionals will deliver 30,000 vaccines to aged care residents across 240 facilities in 190 communities across the country. In Tasmania, Senator Chandler, the vaccine has rollout has begun today in aged care homes in, the, in, in uh, our home state and at the Royal Hobart Hospital in Hobart. A further 50,000 vaccines nationally for border quarantine and frontline health workers will be delivered through 16 hospital hubs, including the one in Hobart, Mr. President. I'd like to reinforce what the Chief Medical Officer said yesterday. I trust that most Australians will take this vaccine once Order, it becomes Senator available. Colbeck, Senator Chandler, 
Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank the Minister for his response. Can the Minister outline how the National Vaccine Program will reach our population through a phased rollout? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Today we have begun phase 1A of our national rollout strategy, looking after the most vulnerable in our community, including aged care residents and staff. Phase 1B will include adults aged over 70 years, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over 55, and high-risk workers, including defence, police, fire, emergency services and meat processing workers. Phase 2A includes adults aged 50 to 69 years, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people aged 18 to 54 years and other critical high-risk workers. Phase 2B expands the to the remainder of the population within Australia over the age of 16. Mr President, this is the biggest national vaccination program we have ever seen, and can I pay tribute to all of the health professionals, the dedicated prof health professionals who are making this happen? Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister also update the Senate on how Australians are being kept informed of the vaccine rollout? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Our comprehensive information campaign will keep Australians fully informed and up to date about how and where to get the jab. As part of our public information campaign, we've invested in a program for peak multicultural organisations to help reach culturally and ling linguistically diverse communities. This includes advertising in 32 languages. Mr. President. Our message will target specific multicultural groups to ensure everyone in Australia has a full understanding of the vaccination program. The overall national campaign includes regular website updates, social media, local community and grassroots organisations, networks and, of course, the media. There are three steps, Mr President, that Australians can take now to get ready. Firstly, create a MyGov account and link to Medicare. Two, check your contact details for Medicare and ensure they're up to date. And three, Order. view your immunisation history the record. Answer has expired. Senator Polly. Uh, Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. On Thursday, the Prime Minister disclosed in House Question Time that the Minister met with the Assistant Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police on the 4th of April. What was the purpose of this meeting? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, look, I th thank you, Mr President, and I thank uh, the Senator for the question. Um, as I made very clear in my statement on Thursday, that during my meeting with Brittany uh, that she would have my full support in whatever course of action she chose to take and that she would have full access to counselling services and that if she wished I would assist her get access to the Australian Federal Police and without betraying any confidences as I've consistently not done here uh, I did through my staff reach out to the Australian Federal Police for an appropriately qualified uh, person to talk to Brittany, and that is my understanding of what occurred. Senator, Senator Polly, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Was Ms. Higgins aware that the minister was meeting with the Assistant Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police? Senator Reynolds. Uh, look again. That goes into the matter of private conversations, which I, which. Which I have consistently, which I have order. consistently Senator, Senator Wong, said remains. Senator Reynolds, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong, uh, the point of order is relevance. Uh, I think we showed uh, some courtesy for how the minister was last week. That does not obviate her obligation to be accountable to this chamber for her conduct. For her conduct, and she is being asked a question, Mr. President about whether or not this meeting occurred with the permission or with the knowledge of the complainant. There is no prejudice associated with that. It is a matter in which the Prime Minister has spoken about in the House, and I'd ask the Minister to respond to the question. I've allowed you to make the point, Senator Wong. I, I don't believe that the Minister is not being directly relevant because I think she is addressing the question. Um, there is an opportunity to debate questions after question time. I'll call Senator Reynolds. 
thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, I'll continue because it was only seven, uh, seven seconds. So, as, as I've consistently said, um, on that Monday, uh, we made available and advised that we would provide and make available the appropriate counselling services, uh, which was done, and also that if she wanted to talk to the Australian Federal Police, uh, that we would facilitate that at all times and at all times through that process. Uh, as I've said in this chamber a number of times, everything that was done was with her knowledge and was with her knowledge and with her concurrence. Uh, from that day uh, right through, uh, it has always, it has always been uh, my first and only consideration was her privacy, her agency, and to take Order, my Senator Reynolds. steps. Senator, Senator Polly, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Why was this meeting not disclosed in the minister's previous answers or statement to the Senate last week? Was the minister aware that the Prime Minister was going to disclose this detail in the House? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you. And I think, as I said twice in the chamber last week, that I did facilitate uh, a meeting for Ms Higgins, if she wanted one, uh, with the Australian Federal Police. And it was uh, assistant, the Assistant Commissioner uh, who came up to my office and met briefly with me alone, and then, and then she dealt with and then, and then I took all advice. Again, I took all advice, and then the AFP met with um, Brittany, and that was the conclusion of my engagement because I had made the reference to the AFP. And again, what we discussed in those meetings is not my story to tell. It is, it is not. It is not my story to tell, and I have always, and I continue to respect her privacy and her story, and Order. I, I will Senator continue Reynolds, to do so. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Will the minister update the Senate on the recent Quad ministerial meeting and advise how Australia, India, Japan and the United States are deepening cooperation on shared regional priorities in response to the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Henderson for her question and her interest in, uh, in these issues. Mr. President, uh, Australia regards the, the Quad uh, as a positive diplomatic arrangement with an agenda to match. It brings together four like-minded democracies, Australia, the United States, India and Japan, committed to respecting and upholding international rules and obligations through positive, practical engagement to protect and support the sovereignty, the prosperity and the security of our region. Uh, late last week, my three Quad counterparts and I discussed some of the most pressing issues facing our region, including our common recovery from COVID-19 in both health and economic terms, including our joint commitment to tackling climate change, the equitable distribution of safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines and broader health security issues such as reducing the risk of future pandemics. Uh, ministers and secretaries reaffirmed our, commitment, reaffirmed our commitment to strengthening the Indo-Pacific's health and economic recovery from the COVID-19 crisis in a way that helps us all, all countries in the region, reinforce their sovereignty and their resilience. Uh, we particularly welcomed the new US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, less than a month after his confirmation and welcomed strong engagement and energy from the United States in relation to deepening Quad cooperation and regional engagement across the Pacific uh, more broadly. This was, in fact, the third meeting of the Quad at the level of foreign ministers. Following earlier in-person meetings in New York uh, in 2019, last year in Tokyo in 2020, notwithstanding the COVID-19 uh, challenges uh, that uh, travel presents, uh, both of which I was pleased to attend. We have committed to meeting at least annually, and I'm confident the value of these meetings will only grow and ensure our cooperation on tackling regional challenges deepens in a way that benefits Order. our whole Senator region. Payne. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. 
Uh, will the minister advise the importance of Australia, India, Japan and the United States working together on shared regional priorities, uh, and particularly, of course, in relation to the pandemic? Senator Payne. Thanks, Mr. President, and uh, thank you, Senator Henderson. I, I think it's important to note that Thursday's uh, Quad meeting was another chance to reaffirm our support for ASEAN centrality, and particularly the principles set out in the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. We're working to secure a to support a secure and prosperous region through ASEAN-led architecture, particularly through the East Asia Summit, which again met virtually uh, in the context of COVID last year. We are long-standing supporters of Myanmar's democratic transition. So we discussed our concerns about uh, the military coup. We reaffirm reaffirmed our support for an ASEAN-led response to those events. We have multiple engagements of our four nations in a range of areas. Uh, last October, for example, I joined uh, counterparts from Japan and the United States to announce the first project under the Trilateral Partnership for Infrastructure Development in the Indo-Pacific, the Palau Cable Spur. In, um, uh, I think it was in September. Minister Birmingham participated Order. in an Australia-India-Japan meeting on resilient supply has chains. Expired. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. Will the minister advise the Senate how these engagements are vital to upholding rules and norms in our region? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. These are very important engagements because the Quad's positive agenda uh, complements Australia's other bilateral, regional and multilateral engagements, including, of course, as I said in my previous response, with ASEAN, to support an open, inclusive and resilient region anchored in international law. We reiterated our commitment to ongoing practical work deepening Quad cooperation on regional priorities that were agreed at our in-person meeting in Tokyo last year. Uh, they include maritime security, infrastructure, supply chain resilience, as I've mentioned, counterterrorism, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, cyber, countering disinformation as uh, just a number. We discussed the importance of deepening our cooperation to address climate change, including Australia's focus on supporting adaptation and resilience in the Pacific through our $1.5 billion climate finance commitment through to 2025. So, Despite the significant disruption that uh, COVID-19 is causing, Australia remains absolutely focused on working with our key regional partners Order. to respond Senator to these longer-term challenges. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Given that a fourth woman has now come forward with sexual assault allegations against the same perpetrator, has the alleged rapist of Brittany Higgins ever held a lobbyist pass, been on the lobbyist register, or had lobbyist meetings or communications with ministers or their staff since the rape occurred? And has he visited Parliament House or any other Commonwealth office since that time? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Waters for her question. I understand Mr. Band asked a similar question in the House. Uh, the Prime Minister uh, in the House uh, indicated that he is not aware of whether, uh, whether such matters have occurred in relation to pass holders or the like. Uh, however, the Prime Minister undertook undertook to confirm those matters and to have anything attended to and advised as quickly as possible, and certainly in this place uh, I will do likewise. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Yes, thanks, President. Given the role of the Department of Finance in handling staff complaints and terminations, what was the former finance minister told regarding Ms Higgins' rape allegations and the subsequent mishandling of the complaint? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, Mr President, I'll take the question on notice in terms of uh, uh, what advice may have been provided to uh, Minister Cormann. Um, my, uh, my understanding is that, uh, as Senator Reynolds has indicated, uh, there were instances of advice provided to her, uh, particularly in relation to uh, the termination processes that uh, exist around the individual um, who was, uh, was released due to security breaches. Um, but uh, as for any other advice or information that actually was provided to Minister Cormann, uh, as per your question, I'll bring that to the chamber. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thanks, President. If, if the Prime Minister persists with the inadequate internal review by Mr Gaitchens into the mishandling of the response to Brittany Higgins's rape allegations rather than an independent investigation, will the government guarantee that Mr Gaitchens's full report will be made public? And will he have full investigative powers and access to all relevant ministers and staff when undertaking his review? Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, uh, thank, 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 thanks, Mr. President. Uh, yes, he, uh, he will have uh, such access. Uh, let me also, uh, as I stated in the chamber this morning, I understand Ms. Higgins um, has made uh, made public her intention uh, to request a full investigation with the Australian Federal Police, and the government will provide complete and full uh, cooperation with that investigation, uh, as we uh, have always intended to do. Uh, following the uh, engagements that, uh, that Minister Reynolds uh, outlined her facilitation of earlier on. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. To date, how many employers have registered claim payments under the Jobmaker Hiring Credit Scheme? And how many employers have received payments to date? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, I don't have the uh, specific data that I can provide uh, the Senator at present, but I'll happily uh, bring anything that I can. Order. Senator Birmingham, in a response to an earlier question from Senator Gallagher, that the evidence was in. Senator the Gallagher, evidence was, his, Senator Gallagher, was in. Senator Gallagher, I'm afraid that's, that, that's not a point of order. The Minister is entitled to take questions on notice, uh, and I call him to continue. Well, with, with thanks, and, uh, and indeed, I, I, I'm pleased that Senator, Senator Gallagher was was listening, or at least listening in part to uh, to what I was saying. What I was saying was the evidence was clear that a program like JobMaker was necessary, uh, and indeed that that evidence that uh, that is clear is the fact that in targeting a program to younger workers, we can see from the ABS data. We can see from the ABS data. Uh, that jobs for those over 55 have actually increased uh, over time, whilst the increase for those aged between 15 and 34 there was actually a 3.3 per cent decrease uh, between March last year and January this year. And so for those of older age groups, for those aged 35 plus, there's been an increase in employment of 1.2 per cent. For those aged over 55, there's been an increase of 2.9 per cent. For those in the JobMaker hiring credit target area, there has been a decrease in terms of employment. And so this, Mr President, was exactly what the evidence uh, and analysis that Treasury had given to us demonstrated, that there was a genuine risk in this recession, as in past recessions, that youth unemployment would be the last to recover and that you would have younger Australians potentially facing longer periods of time on unemployment. That's why, Mr President, we put in place a program targeted precisely to that cohort of individuals and that we did so making sure, making sure this program had safeguards, because I think I can predict where the supplementaries are likely to go, clear safeguards in place uh, to make sure that employment had to be additionality, had to be additional to existing numbers uh, so that there would be safeguards around existing employees but incentives to get Order. young Australians back into jobs. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, how many new jobs have so far been created as a part of the government's JobMaker hiring credit scheme? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, uh, uh, that is very similar, I think, to the primary question, which I took on notice to, uh, to provide uh, the senator uh, with any figures in relation to uh, registration and take up of the scheme. And so we'll come back to the chamber with that. And this scheme is at an early stage of its operation. Um, senator Watt Senator Watt can chuckle. So, so let me get this straight. Is it the contention of those opposite that they don't want a youth employment scheme? Is that what they're saying? Order. Is that what this lot are actually still saying? They don't want incentives to employ young Australians. Is this what I'm getting from those opposite? That they actually, they actually think there's not a problem there to worry about? Is that their contention? That somehow young Australians, well, it's fine, the statistics, the data, the evidence might all show that young Australians' employment situation is more vulnerable, but apparently they don't care. Apparently they don't care opposite. Well, guess what? We do care, and we've done something about it, and we're working to implement that program. Order, and we Senator want to make Birmingham, sure that we help young Australians the get the same— expired. Order, Senator Birmingham. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and we look forward to the evidence being forthcoming to the chamber. Can the minister guarantee that no worker has lost 
or will lose their job as a result of the government's job maker hiring credit scheme. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, uh, I'm assuming uh, the prompting of these questions relates to some media reporting that I've seen today about uh, FOIs that were released by the Treasury. I think it's important, uh, given some of the selective quoting of those FOIs, to make clear that they also say order, very clearly— Senator Birmingham. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Mr President, direct relevance. It can't be directly relevant to refer to quotes which were not contained in the question. We've simply asked the minister to guarantee that no worker has lost or will lose their jobs. I'm reluctant, Senator Wong, to make a ruling that quoting from another document can't be relevant to the question. I've allowed you to, re to make the point. I will listen carefully to the minister's answer. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. That, uh, those FOI documents include the statement from Treasury, and I quote, the hiring credit does not create an incentive for an employer to replace an older worker with several new part-time workers. Uh, that's what's implicit in Senator Gallagher's question, um, and uh, the government rejects that. We built this program with clear additionality criteria in place. In fact, a double-barrelled additionality test there. Uh, firstly, that the business would have to be increasing the headcount of employees, uh, and secondly, that the payroll for the business would also have to increase. So that those two criteria there to make sure uh, that indeed a business has to be taking on new employees, new additional employees, growing the payroll, and under this program, young Order, employees Senator to give young Australians Birmingham. an opportunity. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister in the Senate, Senator Birmingham. Minister, Christine Holgate led Australia Post to record re revenue levels in a period of immense challenge and has previously been praised by the Prime Minister and the Australia Post board. Given the stakeholder ministers were briefed in late November by Ms Holgate and in December and January at meetings with members of the licensed post officers group, that the chair of Australia Post made several incorrect statements when attending Senate estimates on November the 9th, in particular with reference to Ms Holgate. Why? More than three months since the Prime Minister was first made aware the chair, Lucio Di Bartolomeo, had lied to and misled Senate estimates in evidence regarding Ms Holgate and, after she was completely exonerated by Australia Post independent inquiry, has he not taken action to hold the chair accountable? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. <laughs> Sorry, Senator Freeman. <laughs> My apologies. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. My Speaker. My apologies. Thank oh, you, Mr. <laughs> President. Well Sorry. Um, uh, I thank um, Senator Hanson for the question, although I, I don't accept all of the characterisations made in, uh, in Senator Hanson's um, question, um, particularly those in relation to Mr. Bartolomeo. Um, uh, obviously, his, uh, his um, statements to parliamentary committees are on the record and they are there for uh, scrutiny. Um, in relation to Ms. Holgate, let me say that, uh, that I have. Let me say Order. that in relation to Ms Holgate, uh, I have, uh, I have uh, a very high regard uh, for, uh, for Ms Holgate, with whom I worked particularly in my previous portfolio of trade. Um, I recognise uh, the work that she did uh, whilst at Australia Post. Uh, Ms Holgate took uh, the step to resign from her position uh, following some of the evidence uh, that uh, came out uh, in the last lot of Senate estimates hearings. Uh, there has been a subsequent review in that regard. Uh, that review did make findings in relation to the purchase of Cartier watches um, that, uh, and the actions that have been undertaken uh, by Australia Post. Uh, it is, uh, and of course, Ms Holgate's decision that she resigned at the time. Uh, I do wish her well. Uh, in response to that review, uh, I, as Finance Minister, have taken steps across all government business enterprises uh, to remind them of their responsibilities under the PGPA Act. Um, and particularly uh, the responsibilities to ensure appropriate use of taxpayers' money, uh, which ultimately was the matter of concern in relation to the purchase of those Cartier watches. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, I am advised that the stood-down CEO of Australia Post has not signed an agreement to resign and her standing down was not in accordance with Australia Post policy. Why is the Prime Minister protecting the chair of Australia Post, or is this a case of the Prime Minister not being advised of a matter impacting the treatment of a high-profile female? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, no, I, I don't accept the characterisation there, um, Senator Hanson. 
the, uh, the statement released by Ms Holgate following Senate estimates uh, clearly indicated her public announcement of her resignation. Uh, that was a decision uh, made by Ms Holgate. Uh, as I said, I hide, hold her in high regard. Uh, we are all capable of, uh, of making mistakes and errors of judgment in relation to certain matters uh, and, uh, and, of course, in relation to these matters. Uh, the government has sought to make sure not only that there was an appropriate review uh, which was undertaken, uh, but also now that all government business enterprises uh, are reminded of their responsibilities and obligations. Uh, and I know that as a result of that review as well, Post will take further steps in relation to their procedures and practices to make sure that uh, taxpayers' money and funds are respected appropriately in the future. Senator Hanson, a final supplementary Thank question. Thank you. Ms Holgate, um, did not resign and she did not release the statement and continues to receive resounding support from the employees and contractors at Australia Post. Will the Prime Minister apologise to Ms Holgate and will the Prime Minister, who so quickly abandoned her, support Ms Holgate's continuation as CEO and what action will be taken against the Chair of Australia Post? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, uh, Mr. President we will continue to work with the Board of Australia Post to make sure uh, that the organisation um, implements the findings of the review uh, that were undertaken. Um, as I said, I don't, uh, don't accept the characterisation of some of the elements that, uh, that Senator Hanson has brought forward. Uh, Ms Holgate, uh, I wish well in relation to her future endeavours. We will continue to work uh, with uh, licensed post office uh, franchisees, uh, with, uh, with postal representatives and others across the Australia Post system to make sure that some of the good work that occurred uh, under Ms Holgate's tenure uh, continues and is advanced uh, by the new uh, chief executive, uh, the recruitment process of which is well underway. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship and Multicultural Affairs, Senator Cash. With the COVID-19 vaccine rollout now underway, could the minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government is supporting Australia's multicultural communities to access the COVID-19 vaccine? The Minister representing the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship, Migrant Services and Multicultural Affairs, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Hughes for her question. And Australia's COVID-19 vaccination program is officially underway. And uh, what we saw yesterday, the 21st of February 2021, was 84-year-old World War II survivor Jane Malesiak. She was able to get the first jab. And I think it was a proud moment for all Australians. But, Mr President, during the safe and effective COVID vaccines are available to everyone in Australia is a key priority for the Morrison government. And that is why, as a government, we're extending free access to COVID-19 vaccines to all visa holders in Australia. And this will include refugees, asylum seekers, temporary protection visa holders and those on bridging visas. We also know that many people in the first groups to be vaccinated are from culturally and linguistically diverse communities, making timely access to translated and culturally appropriate information critical. The Department of Health's Vaccine Hub has translation for 63 languages available on its website and now on mobile devices. To build on this resource, the government has developed a comprehensive communications plan to reach people from cultural and linguistically diverse backgrounds. The campaign itself will now run across a number of channels, including traditional and social media, and utilise existing networks of health professionals, local community and, of course, grassroots organisations. A range of translated resources have also been developed for multicultural communities, including radio and print editorials, in-language web content, social media posts and posters. We're also working with SBS to produce short explainer videos on the vaccine rollout in more than 60 languages and the Migration Council of Australia on an animated vaccine explainer in 29 languages. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How do these supports for our multicultural communities complement our broader vaccine rollout strategy? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as you've heard from both the Prime Minister and the Minister for Health, our vaccine rollout ensures that people who are most at risk and who need protection the most will receive a vaccine first. 
The Pfizer vaccine will be administered through hospital vaccination clinics in each state and territory and in aged care and disability care facilities across Australia. Approximately 80,000 doses of the Pfizer vaccine will be released in the first week. Under the Australian government's plan, quarantine and border workers and aged care residents are on track to be vaccinated by April 2021. In addition to our support for multicultural communities, our public information campaign will keep Australians up to date about the safety and effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccinations, including how and when to get the vaccine. Our key message to Australians is that it is safe, it is effective and will protect you and your loved ones. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. How will our COVID-19 vaccination rollout support Australia's economic recovery? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, the COVID-19 vaccination rollout is a crucial next step in our economic recovery. For our most affected businesses, in particular in the tourism sector, the arts and events in industries, the vaccine will be particularly welcomed. We're already emerging from the COVID-19 recession in a way that very few advanced economies are. We've seen now over 800,000 jobs, and that's approximately 93 per cent of those lost during COVID-19, return to the economy. We're continuing to see consumer confidence, business confidence and job ads grow to levels higher than before the COVID-19 pandemic. Despite the impacts of COVID-19, an additional 46,000 businesses were trading over the year to June 2020. Around $200 billion in our economic support is sitting on the balance sheet of family and businesses, providing a long tail of economic stimulus to support our recovery. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. At any time did the minister disclose to the Prime Minister that her former staff member, Ms Higgins, had made allegations that she was raped in the minister's office? If not, why not? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And in short, uh, no, I didn't. And the reason for that, as I've consistently said here in this chamber, that it was not my story to tell. It never was. So I, at all times, took my lead uh, from Brittany Higgins in terms of what support she needed, uh, and who who was to know about this and who was not. And the advice is always whether it's from 1800 Respect, whether it's uh, from others, you always take the lead of the individual, and that is what I did. Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. At any time did the minister disclose to any of the Prime Minister's staff that her former staff member, Ms Higgins, had made allegations that she was raped in the minister's office? If not, why not? Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Uh, I'll refer back to my previous answer. Is that at all times, I took my counsel from Brittany Higgins in terms of making sure she had, making sure she had the, right, the right support. And order. Senator Reynolds, I have Senator Long on a point I of order. Thank you, Mr President. Um, the very relevance, uh, the question before we get to the justification was whether or not the minister had disclosed the fact of the alleged rape to any of the Prime Minister's staff, and I'd ask the Minister to return to that question. Senator Wong, you've restated the first part of the question. Um, I believe the Minister was being directly relevant with the answer, and she's concluded her answer. Senator McCarthy, a final supplementary question. At any time did the Minister disclose to any other Minister that her former staff member, Ms Higgins, had made allegations that she was raped in the Minister's office? If yes, which ministers and when? Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And I again refer you back to uh, I took my counsel at all times from the advice that I received and that it order. was about Senator Ms. Higgins' Wong choice. Of, I've got Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Reynolds. Senator D Wong. Direct relevance, yes, it is about Ms. Higgins, and she has made her views very clear. And we are asking you questions about your conduct. And the question that I'm asking you to return to through you, Mr. President, is whether or not you disclose the allegation of rape to any other ministers, and if so, when? I, I believe, Senator Wong, the minister is being directly relevant by it. Um, I believe. The, I, can't, I can't instruct a minister how to answer a question. I, I believe 
if the minister is explaining the reasons for a course of action that were raised in the question, that that is being directly relevant to the question. That is an opportunity after question time to debate it. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, Senator McCarthy, in her question, is assuming uh, the nature of a private conversation and private conversations that I had with Ms. Higgins. And I've consistently, I have, I have consistently said that it is not my story to tell; it is hers. And I will not, I will not, privacy, her privacy, and in terms of any conversations we had were never mine to reveal, and they are still not mine to reveal. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Order, direct relevance. We are not asking about private conversations with Ms Higgins. We are asking whether this minister disclosed those allegations to other ministers, and if so, when. This minister is accountable to this chamber, Mr President, for her conduct. Um, I, no, she I'm interpreting the minister's answers as giving reasons for the course of action she took or didn't took. So I, I don't want to rule that as not directly relevant. Senator Reynolds? Uh, thank you, Mr President. And I say again that in the question that I was just asked in that last supplementary, it makes assumptions about what may or may not have been said in that conversation. And I am not, I am not going to say anything that breaches the confidence of that conversation. And you are you Order. are assuming Senator Reynolds' time assuming for the things answer has about expired. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, Senator Seselja. The Morrison government has committed $1.5 billion to the modern manufacturing strategy to assist Australian manufacturers across six national priority areas to scale up improve competitiveness Order. and build more resilient supply chains. Can the minister please update the Senate on the delivery of the strategy? The minister representing the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, Senator Seselja. I will thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator McLaughlin for the question, a very good question. The government launched the $1.5 billion modern manufacturing strategy as part of the 2020-21 budget. It is a key feature of our job maker plan designed to harness Australia's manufacturing capability, drive our economic recovery and ensure future resilience. It's all about jobs and using the best Australian science and technology to scale up our manufacturing businesses for the long term. And delivery of the strategy is on track and it is well advanced. In fact, on Friday, the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology visited a great local business, Skycraft, to launch the $1.3 billion modern manufacturing initiative and the first of our detailed industry roadmaps, which have been developed by government in partnership with industry and will inform our grant delivery. Now, the first sector to be rolled out is space, and our other five priority sectors will be launched in the coming weeks. Businesses in the space sector can now apply for grants in two of the three streams of the initiative. Now, these two streams are designed to help businesses translate their great ideas into commercial outcomes and support projects that integrate Australian businesses into global supply chains. For these two streams, the translation and integration streams, the Commonwealth will cover up to 50 per cent of the project costs. Now, this initiative is all about scaling up manufacturing to grow jobs, so the minimum grant will be $1 million. This is match funding, uh, because we believe that industry has to have skin in the game. I'm also pleased to advise that our stream to help SMEs improve their production, the Manufacturing Modernisation Fund, is also well underway, with grants between $100,000 and $1 million available. More than 500 applications were received and when the round closed last month and they are currently being assessed. And we expect that successful applicants will start to receive their funding this financial year. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. Given space is the first of the sector priority area to be open for funding, can the minister outline the opportunities for businesses in the space sector? Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President, and yes, I can. Space not only captures the public imagination uh, and opens up new worlds, investment in space technology has practical benefits for our everyday lives. 
Now, from technology helping emergency workers plan for bushfires and farmers manage their crops to advances in automation, robotics, engineering and satellite technology. Now, the Space National Manufacturing Priority Roadmap identifies key areas of opportunity for government and industry to work together to lift space manufacturing capability, drive collaboration by helping Australian businesses demonstrate their space qualified products and facilitate access to domestic and global supply chains. Now, this will help Australian businesses compete for a slice of the growing global space industry, and there are benefits right down the line for business. For example, Canberra Business Skycraft are building small satellite constellations to help improve our communications, travel and banking. They've teamed up with local Canberra manufacturer Xtec to produce the carbon the fire. Has expired. Required. Senator McLaughlin, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister more broadly outline how Australia is engaging with the international community to enhance opportunities in the space sector? Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mr. President, and yes, I can. The global space spec sector is currently worth over $350 billion, and our goal is to make sure our Australian businesses can get access to that market. That's why the Liberal National Government established the Australian Space Agency. And we've now entered into a number of formal agreements uh, with international space agencies, including uh, in the UK, UAE, EU, US, Japan, India and others. Australia is one of the seven founding international partners who have signed the Artemis Accords. This is a practical set of principles for cooperation among, among nations participating in NASA's 21st century lunar exploration. Our government is ensuring our local industry has the opportunity to benefit from the Artemis mission with our Moon to Mars initiative, which provides grants to businesses to help them become part of the supply chain for the mission. It's an exciting era for the Australian space industry, and this government is backing it all Order. the way. Senator Sheldon. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. I refer to reports that at least four women have been come forward with allegations of alleged sexual assault, harassment and rape by the same former staff member. One former Liberal staffer who alleges she was raped has said, and I quote, if this has been properly dealt with by, with, by the government in 2019, this would not have happened to me. Did any member of the ministry or their staff have knowledge of this alleged sexual assault prior to the public report? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. Uh, Mr President, uh, I don't believe uh, there is a uh, case to believe, as Senator Sheldon uh, has uh, suggested there. Uh, I will uh, come back to the chamber if there is anything to the contrary in that regard. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. A third woman, who was a volunteer for the coalition in the 2016 election campaign, says she was barely out of school when she was allegedly sexually assaulted by the former staff member who was working in a minister's office at the time. Did any member of the ministry or their staff have knowledge of this alleged sexual assault prior to this public report? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, again, not to my knowledge. Um, and I have no reason to believe uh, that would be the case. Uh, if there is anything that, uh, that changes that, I will let you know, Senator Sheldon. Uh, obviously, all of these allegations are incredibly uh, traumatic and distressing uh, and underpin uh, the crucial work that, uh, that needs to be undertaken to uh, give uh, all women, all people, uh, confidence uh, in relation to uh, the processes and procedures that are there uh, to enable and to support them uh, to uh, report such instances uh, such that uh, perpetrators and offenders can be brought uh, to justice. Um, and certainly, as I've said in this chamber already, uh, the government will give full cooperation to the AFP as they uh, work with Ms Higgins, as she has publicly indicated, um, as I would expect us to do in any and all circumstances of such uh, terrible matters. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. Another survivor of alleged sexual assault, Ch Chelsea Potter, has today spoken of the minister's refusal to speak with her. Can the minister explain his response to this request? Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, um, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, I can. Uh, Ms. Potter, whose story has been uh, well publicised uh, in the Sydney Morning Herald in, uh, in July of 2019, I think, uh, I first became aware of uh, Chelsea's claims uh, after my office was approached by journalists from the Sydney Morning Herald shortly before publication. Uh, in between uh, being contacted by the journalist and publication, uh, Chelsea sent me a text message to ask if I would like to catch up for a beer with her. Uh, I was unable to at the time, but I replied uh, indicating that I was aware of uh, the conversation she was having with the media, uh, encouraging her to seek uh, independent and professional assistance. Uh, I suggested organisations such as 1800 Respect uh, or the South Australian Women's Information Service uh, as appropriate avenues. Uh, I've indicated uh, in relation to Chelsea and indeed others uh, that through the process this parliament I hope will undertake uh, that we can, I hope, engage with them uh, such that uh, they can feel uh, that that process uh, helps to address uh, the matters of, uh, of concern they rightly have from their past experiences and that we can all have uh, an improved understanding of how to prevent these issues uh, and better, to re better respond to them in the future. Senator Small. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. And it's something that's close to my heart and I know close to the hearts of those on the government benches. How is the Morrison government assisting Australians with disabilities to enter and remain in the Australian workforce? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. And I thank Senator Small for his, uh, his question and acknowledge um, his commitment, along with the commitment of this government, to breaking down barriers for Australians who find themselves or who have disability um, who find themselves unemployed. Um, as we emerge from the impacts of the, the COVID pandemic, it is really, really important that we focus on jobs for everybody, but particularly to make sure that people with disability get the same opportunities um, as everybody else to make sure that they can make their contribution to the economic security and well-being of our country because we know um, that a job is a real game changer for anybody and that shouldn't be any different for somebody who, uh, who lives with disability. Uh, and that's why um, we are in the process of devel developing the National um, Disability Employment Strategy. And uh, I'm really delighted to say, and it's probably very topical this week, um, that I have appointed uh, the 2016 uh, Australian Paralympian of the Year, Dylan Alcott, uh, in conjunction with the, the Monash University Vice Chancellor Simon McCown, as the, uh, the joint chairs of the new Disability Employment Advisory Committee. And I say timely because uh, last week um, a very inspirational Australian in Dylan Alcott um, won his seventh consecutive Australian uh, Open. Um, <laughs> Uh, disability or, or um, wheelchair title, which is just fantastic and a great inspiration uh, for young Australians who live with disability to show uh, the, the amazing things that you can do. And so I congratulate Dylan uh, on his amazing achievement. But together with P Professor McCown, they are providing absolutely essential advice about ways to positively drive change to assist Australians to gain um, ma and maintain employment to the level of their ability. Uh, and these, uh, these two gentlemen are supported by a number of people who, other people who live with disability to make sure that our disability employment strategy is informed by people with disability. Uh, we want to invest heavily in breaking down the barriers because we know that people with disability can make some of the most outstanding employees, and that's a message we want to get out to employees Order, so Senator they employ Rustin, them. Senator Small, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Minister, can you outline the key priorities of that national disability strategy? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, first and foremost, the most important thing that we need to do in the development of the national disability strategy is to make sure that we get the states and territories and local governments, the community, businesses, everybody in our society to come on the journey with us, because it will only be through consultation with everybody, but very much through consultation with people with disability, that we will be able to bring this new strategy uh, into effect later this year. Um, but most particularly, the National Disability Strategy will have a very, very strong focus on employment, but particularly on financial security, on education, on health, and making sure that we change community attitudes so that people with disability will be able to take, uh, take on opportunities for employment 
and incorporate the key elements um, of the broader strategy, employment, uh, dis disability employment strategy. We want employers to understand the advantages of employing people with disability, and that means that we must make sure that our recruitment processes Order, are appropriately Senator Rustin, targeted. Senator Small, a final supplementary question. In recognising work as not only an economic but a wellbeing construct, how is the government supporting young Australians experiencing mental illness into work? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, uh, and I thank Senator Small because this is a very, very important issue. Um, one of the things that was recently announced in, uh, in the budget was an additional $45 million to more than double the number of headspace um, uh, sites around Australia that have got um, the independent um, placement and support program. Uh, this program, um, which now will be ro rolled out over 50 sites across Australia, um, is a very targeted program to make sure that we provide the clinical mental health support to young Australians, but at the same time use that support to be able to help them uh, on a pathway or a trajectory to secure employment. Because we know that the onset um, of mental illness often occurs in young people. However, we know that we can significantly uh, assist these people to, to transition, uh, to help them with their, their issues uh, by assisting them in the transition to work. So, under the IPS program, uh, we want to make sure that people can have access to things like job coaching, targeted education, Order. and Senator employment Rustin, opportunities. Senator Rustin, time for the answer has expired. Senator Pratt. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I have a question this afternoon for Senator Reynolds, the Minister for Defence. Reports indicate the Minister, then Chief of Staff, sought advice from the Department of Finance about the handling of an alleged sexual assault. When did the minister first become aware her chief of staff was seeking that advice? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And uh, As I said in my statement uh, last week, that I became incrementally aware over a period of days of Brittany's stories with private conversations uh, with her and my then Chief of Staff, and also via reports from parliamentary authorities. And when I met with uh, Brittany on Monday, uh, we made sure that she had the appropriate support and also had access to the Australian Federal Police, which she did. And beyond that, I'm certainly not going to go into any more detail about those private conversations. Se Senator Pratt, a supplementary question. When did you, as Minister, through you, Mr. President, first see that advice, and what action did you take? Senator Reynolds. Mm. Uh, I, I, look, I could not have been any clearer in answering this. Uh, there was a course of conversations, as I said last week, uh, and as, as incrementally as those conversations, the privacy of which I have maintained and I still maintain, I will not breach the privacy of those conversations. Order, Senator, sorry, Senator, what? Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Mr President, um, this minister is accountable to the Australian people through this chamber. We are not asking her questions about what discussions occurred with Ms Higgins, although Ms Higgins' statements can speak for themselves. It is a very straightforward question. When did you first see the advice and what action did you take? I would ask you to ask the minister to come back to the question, otherwise really one wonders about the purpose of question time if ministers are allowed to obfuscate Order, and duck Senator in this Wong, way. I've allowed you to restate the question. My view on this matter is if the minister is explaining the reasoning behind the course of action taken, that that is directly— uh, the, 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 there's, there's, a, there's an opportunity after question time for debate, but I— Are you on the point of order, Senator, Senator Pratt? You asked the question on the point of order? Ministers, in answering questions, are not able to. Re we can ask questions of fact, uh, and we are asking in this case for a date. Yeah, um, when did the minister first see that advice, and what action? Now we are able to ask direct questions. I've been through many of these iterations in estimates, where we're told we can ask for facts and dates without okay. revealing what Thank that you, advice Senator was. Pratt. We're not um, asking uh, for the Pratt. advice, we're asking for Senator a date. Pratt, please. Se Senator Pratt, my view on this matter is that if the minister is explaining a course of action that she took, um, uh, then uh, it's not up to me 
if that is directly relevant to the question being asked, and I'm listening, I'm listening carefully, I've allowed opposition senators to restate the question. There's an opportunity to debate the content of answers, but I'm not in a position to direct. direct. I, 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 I will listen carefully to, to Senator Reynolds. Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, I have said, I have said many times now in this chamber that it became, I became aware of this incrementally in terms of the circumstances. And on the Monday when I met with Ms Higgins— order. Senator Watt, on a point of order. On relevance, we're not asking about the chain of events. We're asking a very specific question around when this minister became aware about this piece of advice. On the point of order, we only got about eight seconds into the minister's uh, answer. Um, if the minister is explaining a course of action, I'm going to decree that to be directly relevant. I do take the point; it was a very narrow question, so the course of action around um, direct the, the course of action needs to be explained in the context of being directly relevant to the point asked. Opposition senators have had the opportunity to make the question again, but I can't instruct a minister how, nor the content of an answer to a question. And I've allowed uh, I, I, Senator Wong. I've allowed opposition senators to do so, and I've just advised that a course of action can be explained and it needs to be directly relevant. The question was quite specific. I'll call Senator Reynolds to continue. I'm listening very carefully. Senator Reynolds. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And I do have no more to answer on this uh, because I have covered this. I have, I, have covered this, I have covered this at great length. The fact is those opposite in their questions, by the nature Order. of their questions, are asking questions that go to the heart that go to the heart of Order. the private conversations that I had. Order. And I, at the Senator time, Reynolds, I time respected the her privacy. Has I res Order. Senator Pratt, a final supplementary. Order. Senator Reynolds, time for the answer has expired. Senator Pratt, a Mr. final President, supplementary Ms. question. Ms Higgins has said that when police involvement was raised at the meeting with the minister and her chief of staff on 1 April 2019, that she was told, and I quote, we need to know now. Why was this said? Senator Reynolds. Mm. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And again, uh, this is Brittany Higgins' story to tell publicly. Uh, it is not. It. Order. It is not. It is not. It, respecting her privacy, respecting the process that she is going through, it is simply not my position, respecting her agency and privacy, Senator to Wong say anything a, Senator Wong on a more point on of the order. Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. The minister should not hide behind Ms Higgins' courage. These are Ms Higgins' words and her account of what occurred. The chamber is asking this minister to explain why those words were said. I, I believe in this case, Senator Wong, it is particularly clear that the minister is explaining the reasoning for the answer she is giving, so I'm not in a position to instruct her to answer it differently. Um, there is the opportunity immediately following question time to debate these matters. Senator Reynolds? I finished my answer. Order. Senator Birmingham. Is there further questions to be placed on notice? Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Stirl? And, and, uh, I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Birmingham uh, to questions from Senator Gallagher and Gallagher. And I know it sounds like an oxymoron because there was no answers to the questions. Um, here we go, another day, another announcement. One would think with this mob over here that going to come to the end of March, what we do know is that some, I think, four and a half million, uh, no, more than that it is, it's actually three, sorry, three and a half million jobs that are currently being supported by JobKeeper are going to end. 
We also know that there's a $4 billion announcement from this mob over here that says they're going to create opportunities for employers to get some money to create uh, opportunities for young people, uh, um, and their figure was 450,000 jobs. So when Senators Gallagher and Gallagher asked Minister Birmingham how, about how many numbers would be gone, how many jobs would be lost, typically we got nothing. Now, we shouldn't sound surprised. So as someone who experienced youth unemployment in my hometown of Fremantle back in the uh, 90s, there is nothing worse than when you see 21, 22 per cent, whatever it was, of youth unemployment in Frio, let alone the youth unemployment that's going to come now. And what we do know is the majority of these jobs that in hospitality and such and, and retail, the good chances are that there will be a lot of young people that will be unemployed. But where the problem I have with this this announcement, job maker, everything's got a job in front of it. It's it's so sm uh, smoky, it is so murky, and so lacking in detail. And to the point where Senator Birmingham, because he's always half too cute, so Senator Birmingham thinks that the best way he can deflect and not have to answer a question is to scream into the microphone at decibels that normally pierce all our ears, and he thinks that he's got away with it. Well, Senator Birmingham, you're in for a rude shock. You didn't get away with it, because one of your failings is when you get a little bit too clever, Senator Birmingham, is when you, you said you could almost um, uh, what was it, uh, work out what the supplementaries would be. Then you also said something about a, a report in the media. Well, the report in the media, I think, that you would be referring to is the only one I've seen so far, was actually freedom of information done by the ABC. Freedom of Information, Senator Birmingham, where you're trying to deflect with your loud voice and not answering questions, uh, of uh, documents obtained by uh, uh, Freedom of Information of the AT of Treasury. Quite simply, Treasury. It's not the Guardian. It's not the Betootle Advice or whatever it is, or your other, or your mad wing, right wing um, media you guys read, which actually says very clearly, Tune the Treasury's own examples obtained by the ABC using the Freedom of Information process shows bosses could sack a full-time employee on $75,000 and replace him or her with three part-time staff on wages between $22,000 and $30,000 while remaining in front financially thanks to the generous job maker hiring credit. It's pretty simple. Opposition senators didn't make it up. That's Treasury. You know that mob down the road down here? Um, now, my other fear is getting rid of older workers. And it's a well-known fact, and you think if this mob had any decency over there, they'd be trying to work out you know, how to do this properly, how to do it sincerely, how to look after all workers. But what about rural workers? You hear, you hear the peanut gallery over here, the doormats. Who are carrying on all the time? Oh gosh, I miss Bozzy. You know what happened to the last of the real Nats? Bozzy and Senator Barry O'Brien, Senator Wacker Williams, real decent representatives of the regions. The rest of you should be ashamed. I'll bring them back tomorrow. I tell you what, they've forgotten more than this mob will ever know about representing regions. What about all these jobs in the regions? We heard them banging on a couple of weeks ago. Where are they now? The silence is deafening. And the laugh when you see the blue sign that looks like the green and yellow sign. Liberals, what do you call yourselves? Regional Liberals. <laughs> Forgot Senator Heffern and he wouldn't have put up with this nonsense. They were the good old representatives of the uh, conservative side of politics for regional jobs. Not, not this lot over here. Absolutely shameful. Oh, some of you are all right. Some of you are all right. I'll take it back. So here we go again. So look, it just makes sense. It makes sense. Now, not all employers, but a lot of employers, not, some employers would do this. How lip smackingly exciting would it be for the opportunity for some scrupulous employers? to get rid of older employees, casualise their full-time jobs or put them on part-time. Here we go again, insecure work, taking away full-time jobs for permanent jobs. With, with, seriously, where is your moral compass to think if you're going to do something, do it properly? What are the unintended consequences? Not smarty aleck answers, but that decibels that pierce people's ears and you don't answer anything. Thank you, Senator. All right, I'll, I'll keep going if you want. If I can no, seek your extension. No, time has expired. Oh, okay. Uh, Senator Holly, uh, Senator Hughes. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I'd love to go for some reason I've lost my surname, but always go by Senator Holly. It's uh, it's nice to see that everyone follows me on Instagram and knows where to go. Uh, you know, Senator Sell, I'm not even sure what that was about. I mean, that was just extraordinary. It was all over the place, and I guess. 
being able to rehash all of those old white men that used to be the uh, stalwarts of the Senate. Uh, I hope uh, you welcome the diversity that we now see. And, I, and I'm so pleased to be part of this place when we now have over 50 per cent women. So it certainly gives a little different flavour to the place. Uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's always great to get the views of uh, a range of Australians. And I guess that's why, you know, when we look at a range of Australians, we look at how we can best support all Australians. And we've just experienced the COVID-19 pandemic. And as we start the vaccine rollout and look to the future and look how we can get back to work and get all of Australians back to work and our economy back to where it was to pre-COVID levels, that travel resumes, international borders can open up and we start to see life resume back to normal. It has been this government that has continually put in place targeted programs to ensure all Australians get the best opportunity, but that also the taxpayers' dollars are going where they should go. Not this carte blanche Prime Minister Rudd special where we were sending cheques to dead, dead people, where you know, schools were getting great, wonderful halls that were so overinflated in price, where we saw deaths literally occur during to the speedy rollout of ineffective programs. But the Morrison government has put in place targeted, sensible economic programs that have ensured most Australians can be supported through this terrible time and that we can acknowledge that since the pandemic started, over 93 per cent of jobs that were lost or hours gone to zero have been returned. That's 93 per cent. We're now seeing women's participation at almost the same level that was a record high pre-COVID. But we do recognise that there are certain cohorts that will need more support than others. We're seeing older Australians being employed at a higher rate than ever before. But we are seeing at the younger end of the workforce market that there is a higher rate of unemployment, that those jobs are slower to come back on board. And that's why the Morrison government has been so focused on programs to support apprentices, to make sure that businesses can keep their apprenticeships, apprentices on. And we've, we've done that through programs such as uh, Home Builder, where in one of the areas that I have the privilege of looking after in the Hunter, Builders and construction workers cannot keep up with demand, but it's not only those small businesses in the area, it's all those supplementary businesses, the businesses that supply the tiles and the faucets and the grout. Those businesses are struggling to keep up with demand, and it's because of that program and those initiatives that we're seeing apprentices being kept on board and younger people in the workforce. Now, we've also looked towards the JobMaker hiring credit. And this is because we know from experience, and perhaps if those opposite were big enough to be able to look back and make sensible decisions and have sensible discussions, they'd remember that in the previous recession it was the younger part of the workforce that was impacted for the longest period of time. So in an effort to ensure that we don't see long-term unemployment occurring in our younger part of the workforce, that we're not entrenching disadvantage and unemployment for those under 34. The JobMaker Hiring Credit is a program where employers are bringing new people into the business, not seeing people just being supplemented and subsidised, that new people are being brought into the business, that jobs are being created to ensure that those members under 34 of our workforce are given an opportunity to get back to work as quickly as possible and that we ensure we don't entrench long-term unemployment, that we don't entrench disadvantage and we don't lose a generation to the workforce. Now, the economic recovery is underway and I have absolute faith that the Morrison government will continue to roll out programs that are focused, that are targeted, that ensure that most Australians are set to benefit and the best bang for the buck of taxpayers' dollars is what's allowed to occur. We know that those opposite voted against JobMaker. They won't answer the question why they don't support young workers, but this government, with this Prime Minister, will ensure all Australians, including our young workforce, are supported as much as possible. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Carr. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, today, the Leader of the Government in the Senate was asked a very simple question. When JobKeeper ends at the end of the March, how many people will lose their jobs? It was a straightforward question, direct and simple, 
But of course, there were no direct or simple answers to that question. In fact, what we received today was a proposition from the government that simply said that we had to make choices and priorities had to be set because there was a limit on the amount of money that the government had available because there was no bottomless pit of taxpayers' money available, that it was borrowed money. And as Senator Hughes has rightfully pointed out, I think that not all people in this country have been treated equally because not all people in this country have, of course, been able to deal with the economic crisis uh, in, in equal measures. I found that a particularly interesting proposition, given that the JobKeeper program had promised so much but had delivered so little, particularly when we consider the number of companies that have accepted public money and, in do so doing, I would suggest, had a moral obligation to use that money properly. And when it comes to the question of priorities, and there would be a great deal more money available if the government had provided much sharper attention to the issue of where that money was actually spent, including companies such as Premier Investments, the firm controlled by one of Australia's richest men, had shut down many of its stores as the pandemic took hold. They included outlets such as Just Jeans, Delotti, Portman's and Spiegel. The company received $40 million in JobKeeper. They earned bigger profits in 2020 than they did in 2019. Its shareholders uh, received some $57 million in dividends and, of course, that some $20 million went to Mr Liu. CEO Mark Innes received a $2.5 million the revival of the company's fortune, of course, is a good thing, it will be argued. But did Premier Investments repay any of the JobKeeper money? The answer was no. The Business Council says that companies receiving JobKeeper funds should not repay executive bonuses. And some firms, such as I think they acted ethically, Toyota, Super Retail Group, for example, they repaid $18 million of the $1.7 million, respectively. They had no legal obligation to do so, no request from the government to do so, no concern about the moral obligation they had to do so, no sense of political or moral priority. And When the government talks about not having enough money to deal with those people that are suffering in this country and are continuing to suffer in this country as a result of the pandemic and, of course, as a result of the continuing economic crisis. No way that this government, of course, is in the slightest bit interested in Premier's investment. The JobKeeper received Assistance, of course, was provided by the millions and was paid in dividends to those shareholders who increased their profits. And of course, we have the situation of Mr James Packer's Crown Casino. And I read in the press today, and the minister talks about press articles today, where the universities were contrasted uh, by Ross Garneau with that of the operations of our casinos. And Mr Roscano points out, few would doubt the superiority of universities over casinos in terms of their national contribution. Crown employed 15,000 people, universities employed 130,000 people directly and hundreds of thousands more indirectly. Who, of course, got the money? Crown. And was the universities of this country open to any assistance? No, not unless they were, of course, private universities. There were, of course, five or four private universities, Notre Dame, Bonn, Corrins and the University of Divinity. They got money, but not the public universities of this country. Now, of course, what does this tell us about the government's priorities? It tells us an enormous amount when a government talks about their intentions about not having enough money to help people who are suffering, people who are facing acute economic crisis and continue to do so, particularly at a time when the government is withdrawing support from those Australians at the end of March, when of course the government has the resources but is choosing to spend that money on its mates on those political priorities which of course aim Thank at helping you, those Carr, your time that don't has expired senator scar Thank you madam deputy president uh, firstly i'd like to 
uh, acknowledge uh, Senator Stirl's kind comments with respect to two predecessors from the state of Queensland, namely uh, the great Senator Ron Boswell and also Senator Barry O'Sullivan. And I absolutely agree with Senator Stirl's reflections on those two gentlemen that they were absolutely fearless and resolute defenders of regional Australia. And whilst they were in this place, they did all they could reasonably do to promote uh, the health of the regions. And I was actually thinking of Senator Ron Boswell uh, Friday before last when I was celebrating the Lunar New Year with the great Vietnamese community in Queensland, the Tet Festival. And of course, Senator Ron Boswell had an extremely affectionate relationship with the Vietnamese community in Queensland. And I'm certainly doing my best uh, to continue that great tradition. Senator Stirl made some comments with the in relation to the job maker hiring credit. And he's, he's run this example, and it's been run a few times, that there are all these employers out there that are looking to sack employees, and I'll use Senator Stirl's example, who are perhaps earning $75,000 a year and replace them with three junior employees using the job maker making hiring credit. And I'll say to Senator Stirl this. First, certainly my experience in the private sector if an employer has a valued employee, the last thing they want to do is to lose that employee. And that is really the best check and balance of all, the fact that employers are seeking quality employees. Second point I'd make to Senator Still is that there are a number of checks and balances in the system to ensure that employers can't rot the system. And that includes checks and balances which the ATO will run with respect to companies aggregate payrolls to ensure that those new employees who the employer is claiming the job maker hiring credit for are additional employees. They're not replacement employees. They're not employees replacing uh, long-term senior employees. They are additional employees. And the third point I'd make with respect to Senator Stirl's uh, commentary with respect to the job maker hiring credit is that all the usual employee protections continue to apply with respect to employees, and that includes Australia's very tight unfair dismissal laws. So let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. I'm actually extremely positive with respect to the job making hiring credit. Uh, certainly, I graduated from university in 1992 uh, into the recession we had to have. And Senator Smith said, me too. Um, happy to be in that corner with you, Senator Smith. And it was extremely difficult, extremely difficult for people my age to obtain jobs at that point in time. And I certainly had friends who struggled for a number of years to enter into the employment uh, sphere. So I think the job maker hiring credit is an extremely positive program. It, it will cost up to $4 billion. And Treasury, Treasury has estimated that it will generate up to 450,000 jobs. And if, if, if employers do the wrong thing, then I certainly support the notion that the Australian Taxation Office and the regulators should hold them to account. And I think the Australian people expect nothing less. Senator Kim Carr's contribution to this debate uh, I will deal with next. And when Sen Senator Carr speaks, I always uh, listen very carefully. I listen to very Senator Carr very carefully. I serve with him on a number of committees, and I have a great regard for his views with respect to a range of subjects. And I'll just say this with respect to I'll just say this with respect to Senator Carr's reflections on companies that received the JobKeeper credit and then announced uh, great profits. And I'll put it this way: I have a great deal of respect for those companies that received the JobKeeper credit and then, after considering the circumstances of the company, uh, the respective company over 12 months decided to repay, repay amounts to the Commonwealth Government. I think that was the entirely appropriate thing to do. I applaud those companies. I think they have earned their social licence in our civic community and I think all companies in that situation should carefully reflect upon what the right thing to do is. Does any of that reflect on the success of the JobKeeper program? Absolutely not. It has been an outstanding success, an outstanding success, and that should be acknowledged from representatives on all sides of this chamber. 
And it's a great thing that in Queensland over 728,500 oh, employees uh, sorry, receive Senator payments. Star, your time has expired. Uh, Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. For many Australians last year, 2020 was their most challenging year in living memory. You know, tens of thousands lost livelihoods and for the first time found themselves in receipt of government assistance. And boy, do we remember phone calls running hot in my office and no doubt offices around the country. Thousands required the assistance, not just by JobKeeper, but by other government support, simply so they could make ends meet at their, at their homes, so they could just pay for the bills, pay for the mortgage. A lot were reduced to tears, and for many people experiencing what it means to be on government welfare. Whilst for some the beginning of 2021 saw a return to a relatively normal start to the year in some ways, it is folly to think that these circumstances apply to all. For many Australians, JobKeeper continues to provide a much needed lifeline keeping them connected to their workplaces and the bills at bay. And I'm deeply concerned listening to other honourable senators in this place, the attitude that comes to the debate before us, the attitude that we had heard today, or lack of, in question time, the effect that a premature withdrawal of JobKeeper will have on many workers around this country, especially those in industries that are still yet to get back on their feet. So I can think of a few. Tourism and hospitality, retail. But I do want to touch on aviation. Late yesterday, one of my staff came to this place, travelling from Melbourne, and he encountered a pilot, a pilot who's only been given one shift every month. And in discussions with that pilot, he made it very clear that him and his wife are struggling, thankful that, yes, they are receiving JobKeeper, but still struggling to make ends meet, struggling to pay for their school fees for their children, and even him going to get a cup of coffee. The lady over the counter felt sorry for him and actually offered to give him a discount for his cup of coffee. But these are the real stories, the real people, the real impact that by withdrawing JobKeeper will have on many, many households around this nation working families unable to pay for their bills, unable to send their kids to school and probably unlikely to pay for dinner, for lunch or even breakfast as well too. But somehow government senators seem to think, oh well, the economy has just got to get back on track, snap back as they claim. But we do see and will continue to have state governments around the country imposing lockdowns because the spread will continue. The spread of the coronavirus will continue, especially whilst people from overseas do enter Australia, and for good reason. But we know that the numbers will be great the numbers of people that will suffer will be great. The Reserve Bank Governor has told us himself. The government's own Treasury Secretary has told us that a pause on the labour market will have an impact on the economy. Now, whilst the government might seek to hide behind non-answers in this place on questions of job losses after the premature end of JobKeeper, we know that for many Australians, the answer will be painfully clear at the end of March. 
Is this the best that those opposite can muster? Is this the best that they can do to support Australians whilst they're doing it tough? Let me say that this is simply just not good enough, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Stirl to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. If there's no further matters, I intend to move to um, motions, notices of motion. So, are there any notices of motion to be given for another day, Senator Fiavanti Wells? Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Pursuant to notice given on 18 February 2021, I withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number two, standing in my name for today, proposing the disallowance of the Veterans Affairs Treatment Principles Rehabilitation in the Home and Other Amendments Determination 2020 and business of the Senate notice of motion number five standing in my name for 11 sitting days for after today, proposing the disallowance of the legislation deferral of sunsetting telecommunications universal service obligation standard telephone service requirements and circumstances determination certificate 2020. In addition, pursuant to notice given earlier today, I withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number one standing in my name for today, proposing the disallowance of part three of the ASIC Corporation's credit and superannuation internal dispute resolution instrument 2020-98. Thank you, uh, Senator Fiavanti Wells. Uh, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? A court note. Um, I remind Senator, yes, yes, Senator Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senators Askew and O'Sullivan from the 22nd to the 25th of February for personal reasons. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Smith be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Urquhart. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Keneally for today, Monday, the 22nd of February 2021, for personal reasons. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Roberts. Could I, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1017 be taken as a formal motion? Uh, we're not there yet, Senator okay. Roberts. Thank, Thank you. you. I call the clerk. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. Uh, general business notice of motion number 993, standing in the name of Senator Seward for today, postponed to the 16th of March 2021. Thank you. I remind senators that the question may be put on any, pro any proposal at the request of any Senator, I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. And Senator Roberts is seeking the call. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1017 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Roberts. Senator Daniel. Please to make a short statement. Uh, leave is granted for one minute. Senator Daniel. Uh, thanks, Madam Deputy President. The Coalition Government is a strong advocate for reliable generation to complement and balance renewables and help deliver affordable, reliable power for Australian consumers. This is why we're committed to Snowy 2.0, which will deliver 2,000 megawatts of fast start dispatchable energy and provide 350,000 megawatts uh, megawatt hours of large scale storage. This is also why we will support a new gas fired new generator channel. in the Hunter Valley to replace Liddell if the private sector doesn't step up, because it will provide the flexible generation we need to secure our electricity grid and put down pressure on prices. We need more of the firmed generation that technologies like gas and hydro provide that will keep prices low and the lights on. Thank you. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Roberts be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. We now move to general business. Notice of motion number 1013, standing in the name of Senator Waters. Yes. Can we record that we opposed uh, motion number 1017? Yes. Could Thank we, you. 
Could we record that the Labor Party uh, opposed 1017? Thank you. Uh, Dep Deputy Senator President, Wish Wilson? Could we also record our opposition to that? Yes, could we also record that the Australian Greens uh, oppose um, general business notice of motion number 1017? And uh, I've now gone to general business notice of motion number 1013, standing in the name of Senator Waters. Thanks, Deputy awarded. President. My apologies for the sh uh, short delay. Uh, I seek leave to amend General Business Notice of Motion Number 1013 before asking that it be taken as formal. Uh, it's in the term circulated in the chamber just to delete one word. Is leave granted? Uh, I'm assuming leave is granted. Thank you. Senator Waters. Thank you, Deputy President. I amend the motion in the term circulated in the chamber and I ask that it be taken as formal. So the, so the uh, Motion is that Senator Waters has moved general business notice of motion number 1013 as amended. Yes, it, it, I'm assuming that matter's been taken as formal? No? Okay, thank you. Sorry, Senator Waters. I'll now move to general business notice of motion number 1016, standing in the name of Senator Hanson. I've called Senator Hanson. Thank you. On behalf of the Joint Select Committee on Australian Family Law System, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 1016 relating to extension of time to report be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? Well, no, but I. Uh, I'm Senator Waters, um, interjections are disorderly. Uh, Senator Hanson, that's been denied formality. Uh, Order. It's, I heard a voice denying formality. I am happy to put it again, but I would ask people to pay attention. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1016 in the name of Senator Hanson being taken as formal. Is there any objection to that? Thank you. I'll call Senator Hanson. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1016 standing in the name of Senator Hanson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to general business notice of motion number 1018 standing in the name of Senator Wong. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam, Acting, uh, Madam Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1018 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 10—oh, beg your pardon, I uh, would, Minister. I uh, seek leave to make a short Is statement. leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Our relationship with the French government is key to our approach on security across the Indo-Pacific and supporting the future submarine program. The documents requested in this motion were subject to an FOI request in 2020 regarding Naval Group's Australian industry commitment. Electronic communications were excluded from release on the grounds that it would or could reasonably be expected to cause damage to international relations with the Commonwealth. Uh, the disclosure of electronic messages requested in this motion would be in contravention of the well-established Senate recognition of public interest immunity concerning prejudice to Australia's international relations. Releasing these messages could harm our relationship with France, inhibit future flow of confidential information and weaken Australia's bargaining position in the international engagement and negotiations in the future. Work to amend the strategic partnering agreement to reflect uh, Naval Group's commitment to spend at least 60 per cent of its contract value in Australia are currently being negotiated. Thank you. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1018, standing in the name of Senator Wong, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. So,
Lock the doors. Order. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1018 be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes of the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes.
Order. There being 31 ayes and 28 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I'll now go to general business notice of motion number 1019, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1019 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? The, uh, thank you. Sorry, Senator Wish Wilson. I now move to general business notice of motion number 1015, standing in the name of Senator Faruqi. Senator thank Faruqi. you, uh, Madam Deputy Chair. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1015 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? Uh, sorry, Senator Faruqi. I'll now go to uh, government biz business um, number two, Senator Dunium. Uh, thanks, Madam Deputy President. I ask that government business notice of motion number two relating to the consideration of disallowance motions be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call the minister. I move the motion. So the question is that general business, I beg your pardon, government business number two, standing in the name of Senator Rustin, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. That concludes general business, and we just uh, skipped over committee membership, so I think we're going back there again. Pardon, committee extensions. I call the clerk. Committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item 10 on today's order of business. Pardon, Senator Waters. Yes, uh, thanks, Deputy President. I seek leave uh, to move motions uh, 1013, 1019, and 1015 together. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Waters. Thank you, Deputy President. I so move those motions, standing in my name and in the names of Senator Faruqi and Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, Senator Gallagher. Uh, uh, Madam Deputy President, I'm wondering if you'd be able to put the question separately on each of those motions, because we'll be voting differently. Sure. So, uh, Senator Waters, just to make sure I've got them correctly, it was 1013. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind standing. Thanks, Deputy President. 1013, standing in my name. 1015, standing in the name of Senator Faruqi. And 1019, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you. Um, just a moment, Minister. I am advised, Senator Waters, that there's three to which the question will be yes or no. So, are there any two that you want to put together? Excuse me? Oh, Senator Gallagher, beg your pardon. Government's voting. Um, okay, so we'll do. I think if we just do them separately. Okay. Thank you, Senator Hanson. On a point of order, you haven't asked for if there's formal formality to this. No, you asked leave. You said if there was leave, you didn't ask if there was formality to this. Uh, Senator Hanson, there's no need to seek formality because Senator Waters sought leave. Thank you. So I'm going to call the minister. Minister. Uh, I would like to table the government statements relating to motion number 1013 and 1019. Thank you, Minister. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to seek to table um, Labor's uh, statement relating to, no to notice of motion number 1015. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, Where do I give that? Thank you. So I'm now going to put the first um, of those motions, which is standing in the name of Senator Waters at 1013. So the question is that general business, Senator Wishman. Can I just confirm, did you? Uh, Allow the government to make a statement on two of those motions. They tabled it. They don't need they to see it. Okay, so thank you. Um, so the question is that general business notice of motion one to, number one zero one three, standing in the name of Senator Waters, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against. 
I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1013, standing in the name of Senator Waters, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart to teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes.
Right. Sorry, just the odd technical hitch. So the result of that division is eyes 30, noes 30, so the matter is resolved in the negative. We we'll now move to general business notice of motion number 1015, standing in the name of Senator Faruqi. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1015 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1015, standing in the name of Senator Fruki, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seawit as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes.
order. So the question is that the result of the division is 11 ayes and 42 noes. The matter is resolved in the negative. We we'll now move to general business notice of motion number 101819. Beg your pardon, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Ring the bells for. Four minutes.
Dr Dawes. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1019, standing in name of Senator Wish Wilson, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urka to sell for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as seller for the noes. Order. There being 28 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. That concludes formal business, so I do believe that a senator is seeking the call. Uh, senator Thorpe, we'll just wait. I'll call you in a moment. I'll just wait till um, people have cleared the chamber. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I seek leave to notify. Uh, seek leave to withdraw a motion. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Thorpe. Thank you. I, uh, I notify the chamber that I wish to withdraw my notice of motion number one on the notice paper for 25th February 2021. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Wait a moment while the chamber clears. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 26 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Green. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The Morrison government's failure to address job security is giving companies that exploit workers an unfair advantage against honest employers. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. I understand that. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. And I call Senator Green. Well, thank you very much. This is a very important motion uh, for the Senate to be discussing today as we seek to rebuild and recover um, from the coronavirus pandemic. From an economic point of view, what the coronavirus pandemic has shown us is that insecure work can have a significant impact not only on our economy, not only on our society, but also on our public health. The Morrison government's failure to address job security is giving companies that exploit workers an unfair advantage against honest employees. So we know that there are good businesses out there that do the right thing. There are a lot of good businesses that are trying to keep up but this government's policies have allowed other businesses to exploit workers and undercut good businesses. The not only 
do the policies of this government hurt workers, but they hurt businesses that are doing the right thing. There are many examples of exploitation of workers in our country, and a few come to mind. Of course, of wage theft is one of the big, uh, the big exploitations of workers. Wage theft laws in Queensland at the moment uh, were introduced by the Palaszczuk Labor government in its last term of government. And they were fought for incredibly hard by the union movement, by young workers, particularly the Young Workers Hub in Queensland, did a fantastic job of uh, communicating to young people out, um, out there why these wage theft laws were necessary. Because time and time and time again, we saw that the policies from this government was allowing wage theft to occur in businesses all across Queensland. And it was particularly rampant with young workers and particularly rampant in places in southeast Queensland where these wage thefts went unchecked. Uh, in my previous employment, I worked for the AMWU, and we had apprentices who, were, who suffered wage theft. And it's a complicated process to go through uh, to get back that money. But the Queensland Labor government's criminalisation of wage theft means that those workers are now protected, and that those bad businesses are on notice that you cannot get away with wage theft anymore. We know that the government has uh, introduced a bill that purports to deal with this issue in some sort of way. But make no mistake about it, the federal government's policies will water down the hard-fought wage theft laws in Queensland because they're not as strong. They're not as strong as the Queensland laws. So when you hear those opposite talk about the fact that they want to introduce laws uh, to criminalise wage theft or to do something about wage theft, something that they should have done in every other year of their uh, government. Be very clear about what these laws will do. If they will water down the hard-fought wage theft laws in Queensland, then they're not good enough and this Senate shouldn't pass them. And those opposite should not try to mislead people in Queensland that their laws are as strong as the ones already in place. The other form of exploitation that we see most often in Queensland is the use of labour hire to undercut workers' pay. And this comes back to this idea that good businesses do the right thing. They employ workers directly and they pay them in a permanent uh, basis. But you've got some businesses out there who, under this government's policies, have seen labour hire as a loophole, dodgy labour hire companies as a loophole to reduce the wages and conditions of hard-working Queenslanders. Now, these businesses that do this get away with it because this government has continually not stood up to those businesses. It has become so rampant that now it is a business model in some parts of Queensland to have your workforce employed under labour hire arrangements, sometimes as casual workers, sometimes on short-term contracts. But how can good businesses compete when, you, when other businesses are using labour hire arrangements to undercut workers' pays and conditions? Well, they simply can't. And this government has let uh, businesses like that get away with it. I often hear comments from um, the various uh, LNP MPs and senators uh, in this place and um, back up in Queensland, because you will find the government members in the Senate and, and in the House of Representatives from Queensland come down here and say one thing, but once they, once they get back to Queensland, it's a totally different story because they have been under pressure from the Labor movement and from the Labor Party over the last seven years to do something about Labor hire. We've had George Christensen out there in 2018 saying, saying mining companies need to start shifting away from Labor hire as unemployment rates plummet or risk being unable to attract workers. Happy to say something like that when you're standing up in, south, in uh, central Queensland, but not happy to come down here and do anything about it. 
We've had Mad, Mad, uh, Senator Canavan, um, who we know has uh, got a real, um, uh, a real flair for dressing up as a minor and uh, smudging um, makeup on his face and pretending as if he cares about the plight of working people. He has said, in my short time in politics, I have had to fight against 100 per cent FIFO and casualisation of the mining industry. Well, he hasn't fought very hard. He hasn't fought very hard because this is still going on. It's still going on. And they can make statements like that up in, up in central Queensland and in north Queensland. But when it comes down to here, the policies that you implement, that is what is letting companies get away with this exploitation. Even Scott Morrison was asked in question time what he thought about these arrangements and whether if you were working next to someone, whether you should get, if you're doing the same job, whether you should get the same pay and workplace conditions. But he wasn't really able to answer that question, was he? The first time, he refused to answer the question altogether. The second time, he just said, oh, it's complicated. Well, that's exactly what Christian Porter said as well last week when he was asked, asked whether gig workers should get the minimum wage. It's complicated. It's too complicated for this government to do the right thing, to step in and protect workers and the good businesses that choose not to exploit them. We know there have been many examples of exploitation in far north Queensland and in central Queensland. Of course, there's the OS services debacle, where BHP literally went out, created a new EBA, got a couple of people in Western Australia to sign up to it, even though it was less than the EBA in central Queensland, then sought to apply that EBA that no one had ever seen to the thousands of workers in central Queensland. And this government's policies has let them get away with it. We know there was a federal court case that tried to intervene to make sure that people who were permanent casuals would have protection, protection under the law. What did this government do? Well, they intervened in the court case, not on the side of the workers, but on the side of big businesses and the company that was seeking to exploit workers. Labor thinks that if you do the same job, you should get the same pay. It's pretty simple. I can come here in here and say that, but the members opposite cannot. Labor has a policy to make sure that if you do the same job, you get the same pay. At the moment, there are too many workers in Australia subject to unfair labour hire practices. They're treated like second-class citizens with lower wages, worse conditions and no job security. While there are workers who like the flexibility that labour hire provides, often it's not their choice, not their first choice anyway. Their first choice would be to have job security, to get a good job to be able to get a mortgage, to plan holidays with their families, to plan for the financial security of their family. But because of this government's policies, they're not able to do that. Labor in government will legislate to ensure that workers employed through labor hire or other employment arrangements, such as outsourcing, will not receive less pay than workers employed directly. It's a pretty simple idea. Labor's on the side of workers who have been exploited through labour hire under this government's policies. Senator Macdonald. <clears throat> Thank you. Labor lecturing the government on jobs is like someone burning sausages on a backyard barbecue telling Gordon Ramsay he's running his food empire badly. They don't know what it's like to navigate the reams of, leg of legislation and numerous pitfalls involved with awards and human resources. They don't understand the daily stress of ensuring that there's enough work coming through the door, managing cash flow and creditors. They've never had to worry about a militant union accusing them of wage theft because of a simple, innocent error in applying one of the myriad award rates. Labor is the anti-jobs party. And never has the old adage, there's no you in Labor, been more true. In my home state of Queensland, 
The Labor Party has for years refused to approve an expansion of the new Ackland coal mine, forcing the loss of scores of good, high-paying jobs around Toowoomba. This is even worse when a majority of the surrounding residents want the expansion to go ahead. And let's not forget the Adani Carmichael mine in central Queensland, a project that promises and is delivering stable, high-paying jobs, but also hope for the small towns nearby that were facing a bleak future as the blue-collar jobs they were built on became despised by the new Labor Party. I travel regularly to regional areas to talk to employers and employees, and I can say unequivocally that schemes like JobKeeper and the changes to IR rules that go with it were a godsend for both parties. The other thing we always hear from rural and regional Queensland is that people can't remember the last time they had a visit from Labor politicians at a state or federal level. And rather than parroting lines given them to them by union hacks, I encourage those opposite in the Queensland Labor state government to get out, to go west and north and listen to the people at the front lines. And for Senator Green, apparently it is all pretty simple. But where is the support, not taxes, but support for those people who actually create jobs? Because it is small business that is the lifeblood of our economy and Australia's biggest employer. And unlike, the, unlike Labor, the coalition wants people to earn more, more money and keep more of it. We are the party of creating jobs and giving people the chance to prosper through their hard work. We've also established the Disability Employment Advisory Committee to give even more people in our society the chance to experience the dignity of real work and the ability to earn a wage and to have control over their future. Now, Senator Stirl, who's one of the few on that side who often makes a lot of sense, said just today, everything has the word job in front of it. Job seeker, job keeper, job maker and job trainer. And he's right, because this government puts jobs in front of everything. This government understands that jobs are hard fought for, that they cost blood, sweat and tears, and they're not created by some magical fairy dust, as Labor would have you believe. The morrison mccormack government has always had and always will have a zero tolerance for any exploitation of workers. That includes the underpayment of wages and entitlements by any employer. And that's why the Fair Work Ombudsman is continuing to take strong action on behalf of workers despite the, the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. In 2019-20, the Fair Work Ombudsman recovered a record amount of money for underpaid workers, $123 million to be precise. They issued 952 compliance notices, recovering $7.8 million in unpaid wages, which is a 250 per cent increase on the number of compliance notices uh, from the previous year. They filed more than double the number of court cases in 2019, 20 compared to 2018-19, and close to 10 per cent more than during Labor's last full year in office, and also secured 163 per cent more in court-ordered penalties in 2019-20, again compared with Labor's last full year in office. They issued 603 infringement notices, an increase of 7 per cent compared with the previous financial year, and recovered over 56.8 million in back payments for workers from enforceable undertakings issued. The commitment of the morrison mccormack uh, government to this vital cause has remained unscathed despite a global pandemic, evidenced by the fact that within the first six months of 2020-21, the Fair Work Ombudsman has recovered almost $80 million for over 31,000 employees, filed 37 litigations and entered into 12 enforceable undertakings. Moreover, through legislation that is currently before this parliament, the morrison mccormack government understands that it is government's responsibility to ensure that an environment exists where Australians can both seek to be employed and seek to be employed. Never has it been more important that this be emphasised given we are undertaking an economic comeback out of COVID-19. The amendment to the Fair Work Amendment will ensure people can gain employment, stay in employment and thrive in employment. 
The fact of the matter is that given the current economic environment, businesses, in order to remain competitive in an uncertain and unstable global market, must have the necessary flexibility available to them, acknowledging the special circumstances in which we find in these COVID times. And that's why the government will legislate a two-year extension on temporary JobKeeper flexibilities to businesses in identified industries that have been hardest hit by the pandemic by giving employers confidence to offer part-time employment and additional hours to employees and promoting flexibility and efficiency. The Morrison-McCormack government, as it always has, remains committed to the assurance of a zero-tolerance approach to any exploitation of workers. The Morrison-McCormack government likewise understands the role it must play in ensuring Australians are able to seek to employ and seek to be employed, because it is only the creation of real jobs, of sustainable businesses, that can not just survive but thrive, that ensures certainty for employees. And that is the, the focus of us all, should be the focus of us all as we move forward. It is ensuring that employers are well supported, well resourced and understand that their government seeks to encourage uh, the activities that ensure that they can employ more people, that they have the confidence to be able to employ uh, firstly casual people, move them to per permanent part-time and then full-time, as they feel confident that the work remains for those people, that they can uh, support a line of business coming through the door, that they can manage their creditors, that they can survive in an increasingly uh, regulated environment, because those are the jobs that are genuine and real and should be supported uh, at all costs. I hear Senator Green and others talk about jobs as if they are created magically, and it is not the case. And for those people on the other side who have ever run a business, who have ever had to go through the stress and worry of the commitment of employing somebody, of making that decision of will I have enough work for them, will I be able to uh, pay them every week. Um, that, that is the, the focus for this economy, for this government, to ensure that those jobs are real, that those employees have certainty and confidence. And yet, once again, we will hear from Labor. We will hear from Labor about the fantasy land of, uh, of wanting to support jobs but not wanting to support employers, not wanting to walk a day in their shoes of understanding just how difficult it is to make those commitments to people, to mortgage your home, to worry about uh, to pay everybody else before you pay yourself, because that's the way it is for most small businesses. Most small businesses survive on average for seven years because they are exhausted by regulation, by ensuring there is work coming through the door, of surviving economic upturns and downturns, supply of um, managing uh, uh, seasons if they're in agriculture, of managing demand, not to mention a pandemic. And yet, we once again have Labor wanting to talk about uh, the, the negative side of employment as opposed to supporting businesses, not talking about taxing them, but supporting business. And I would encourage them to walk a mile in the, in the shoes of small business. Senator Roberts. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. As an Australian who has been elected to serve the people of Queensland and Australia, I am very proud to say that I have worked in many countries and I am genuinely proud, genuinely proud by Australia, of Australian workers. We have a phenomenal human resource in this country, unequalled anywhere in the world. The initiative, the hard work, the honesty, the integrity of workers in this country and many businesses in this country, especially small businesses, the engine room of our economy. More people are employed in small business than in any other sector of the economy. And we need to get the dynamism back that has been lost in Australia, lost largely because of this building 
and the decisions that come out of this building. So the MPI talks about the Morrison government's failure to address job security and it's giving companies that exploit workers an unfair advantage against honest employers. Let me talk about the example in the Hunter Valley. The exploitation, the abuse and the casual discarding of people tossed on the scrap heap when they're burned out. Casuals who have been exploited in the Hunter Valley by a major mining company, BHP, and one of the world's largest labour hire firms, an offshoot of Recruit Holdings from Japan, Chandler McLeod Group. With the complicity of the Hunter Valley division of the CFMEU, it would not have happened without all three working together complicit. But casuals, let's go back to the root cause. The root, root of casualisation started in small business because employers were so confused with the complexity of hiring people and so confused with the complexity when there was a problem to discuss. And so they went to casuals because it became too hard to deal with disciplinary issues in small business. And quite often we see small businesses having problems with someone who's stolen something out of their business, an employee who's stolen something out of the business and the small business worker, a small business owner, then trying to simply address that and ends up just paying $8,000, $10,000. We heard last week from the small business, from COSBOA, the Council of Small Business Organisations of Australia, of some companies, some small businesses are paying $20,000 shut up money to go away. The root cause of the insecurity in this country, one of the root causes, is the highly complex, needlessly complex and destructive industrial relations situation. Then what we saw was large companies taking the small business model and using casuals for a try before we buy. In other words, they'd watch the casual worker on their mine site, in their business, and if he or she made the goods, then they would hire them. And that has led to ex extreme abuse of workers in this country. It's led to safety hazards that I've complained about in my submission to the Grosvenor inquiry. But in the Hunter Valley, it led to miners being intimidated, being threatened with loss of jobs if they reported safety incidents. How stupid is a company when that happens? They're losing that, that, prime, in, that prime source of information about their company. I want to give Mr Bukarika, the National Legal Advisor for the CFMEU Mining Division, a huge compliment because in Townsville he had the guts, the integrity, the courage to acknowledge that the Hunter Valley CFMEU is part of the problem at those mines in the Hunter Valley because they enabled it to happen. I also want to give him, the, give him praise because he said that, that CFMEU has not done enough for casuals. Indeed, they have caused the casual issue in the Hunter Valley and the casual abuse of casuals. And he's admitted that his union will need to do more about it. So what we see is a mess that's been created by, in the past by labour laws that have become far too complex and by the Liberals not addressing this issue in 2016 when they should have. Casuals show the, the pain of people at work. Casuals also are a sign of the failed industrial relations situation. No getting away from it. And what the government is doing in its latest industrial relations legislation proposed to come before the Senate in, in next month is they're shifting the liability for that mess from, small business, from large business to small business. They're helping a couple of large companies ma manage their risk. We've approached this differently. We've gone out to listen. We've written to 80 different organisations, employers, employee e groups, unions, union bosses, welfare associations, organisations, small business groups, and we've asked them for their advice, their views, and they've come and given it. And they've said no one else has invited them to do that. We're the only ones. We have three aims in this addressing this legislation. To ensure security for Australian workers, whether they be small business, large business, and to assure security for small business and large business. Our three aims are protect honest workers, protect small businesses, 
and restore Australia's productive capacity. And we see the employer-employee relationship as fundamental. It is the primary workplace relationship. And that's what's needed to empower workers. We've got the best workers in the world. And that's what's needed for employers and employees to work together with empowered employees and empl empowered employers. Because that is the only way to create jobs. Government doesn't create jobs. As much as the Labor Party talks about it and the Liberal Party talks about it, government does not create jobs. Honest workers create jobs. Small businesses create jobs. Large employers create jobs. Government creates the environment. And the governments, Labor and Liberal, have stuffed this, environment, this, this country's workplace environment. The Morrison government talks about security and recovery from COVID. How can that be possible when we've got destroyed our, our electricity sector? How can it be possible when we've got one of the worst tax systems in the world? How can it be possible when we're not supplying the right infrastructure? How can it be possible when we haven't got the skills development needed? How can it be possible when we've got over-regulation? Just go and talk to people, not only employers, small or large businesses, but also employees, sick to death of the energy prices, have gone from the cheapest in Australia in the world to the highest in the world, under this government and its predecessors in the, Liberal, in the Labor Party. So instead of propping up the, labor, uh, uh, the Industrial Relations Club with excessive, needlessly complex legislation, we need to simplify. In fact, I put it to Peter Strong when he was in my office last week. I said to him, regulations are written at the moment for the few people who do the wrong thing, employers and employees. They should be written for the majority of good people, fine Australians, with severe penalties for the bad. We need to turn it upside down. Instead of penalising the 100 per cent with the ridiculous workplace arrangements, we need to penalise the real shonks, the real criminals. Instead of assuming people are bad, employees are bad, employers are bad, we need to free people to produce and we need to penalise and handicap the, those who deserve it. Empowering not frightening. That's what we need in this country. Empowering, not frightening. What we see at the moment is an IR club, big employers, big industry associations, large unions, employee consultants, employer consultants, industrial relations consultants, and above all, lawyers. And again, I come back to the ETU legal advisor in Townsville, Michael Wright, and Mr. Bukarika from the CFMEU. Both said we have far too many lawyers involved in industrial relations, and that's why it's a mess. We have to remove that. And they both said they want less lawyers. They want to remove the lawyers. Full credit to the CFMEU Mining Division and full credit to the ETU for saying that. The big companies and the crooks are the ones who make the best out of the Industrial Relations Club because they've got deep pockets, they can, for, they can afford to fund the lawyers and to fund the others who live off the backs of Australian workers. That's where we need to get to, a simple workplace relationship. That's what we need to get back to. Will Labor make a commitment to properly and honestly reform IR? Will you? Will the Liberal Party, National Party, make a commitment to properly, honestly reform IR, to free people so that they're free to compete with the people in Korea, China, India, Africa, Malaysia, Singapore. That's the way to get security of employment, by empowering people. One Nation is the party of energy security and affordability. Senator One Nation Roberts, is the party of job security. Your time has expired. Senator Antic. Oh, sorry, Senator Brown. Yep. Apologies. That's Senator all Brown. right. No problem. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I'm pleased to speak on this matter of public importance because the Morrison government's failure to address job insecurity is hurting working families and damaging our national economy. It has become a major structural issue in the Australian economy, whereby people who do not have access to secure work are being left behind by this government. It is fundamentally unfair, not just for workers, but also for those businesses who are doing the right thing. 
The course of the use of certain forms of insecure work gives companies that exploit workers an unfair advantage against honest employers, and the share of workers in insecure work is increasing, continuing to increase. In my home state of Tasmania, we continue to suffer from the highest underemployment rate of any state—8.9 per cent. There are 37,500 Tasmanians, Mr Acting Deputy President, who simply can't get the hours of work they need to make ends meet. This is not secure employment. This does not enable people to be able to live with confidence, to plan their life, to buy a house or do any of those things that require secure employment and secure finances. Australian workers, our national economy and business will all benefit from more job security. Because we all do better when we all do better. Better pay and a fairer industrial relations system will reap benefits for everyone in our society, from the top to the bottom. That is the approach Australians can expect from an Albanese Labor government. Not so from Mr Morrison, however. This Prime Minister continues to practice the same old failed liberal economic policies of a race to the bottom, the lowest common denominator. In contrast, Labor believes that secure work is an essential component of being able to build a secure life. Secure work allows workers to take leave when they're sick or need to care for a family or household member without putting their jobs at risk. It means that they can have the confidence to spend money to stimulate the Australian economy, boost growth and create more jobs. And yet good, decent, secure jobs are becoming fewer and fewer with the rise of insecure employment. Yet this government has no plan to arrest that rise. Indeed, they encourage it. What we have seen in the past 12 months with the COVID pandemic is that insecure work not only poses a risk to individual workers but to our society as a whole. It is the case that when the pandemic began, casuals, who account for about a quarter of the Australian workforce lost their jobs eight times faster than those in more secure forms of employment. Eight times faster, Mr Acting Deputy President, than those in more secure forms of employment. To rub salt into their wounds, it was an active and deliberate decision taken by this Prime Minister to exclude around one million casual workers from access to JobKeeper, forcing many onto Centrelink. Now, that was a measure that the former spe uh, speaker, Senator Macdonald, didn't mention in her contribution here today, that this government took the deliberate and active decision to exclude one million casual workers, forcing them on to Centrelink. But, of course, casual work is not the only form of insecure, insecure work. When you add in many contractors, freelancers, gig workers and those on temporary contracts or working in labour hire, what we see is that nearly half the workforce misses out on the many benefits of a permanent job, and we know that. And who in our workforce, in our society, is more likely to be stuck in insecure work? Women, young people and those from a migrant background. In fact, one thing we have seen from the inevitable recovery in the jobs market after the first recession in Australia in 30 years is that the increase in jobs has been very substantially been composed of insecure jobs. This has implications not only for people in these jobs, but for our broader recovery and for our potential future economic growth, because we know that those in insecure work have much less confidence to spend. But these are the things that gov the government can do, can do to combat the insecure uh, Senator Brown, your insecure time work. has expired. Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy uh, President. Uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, uh, we know we're back uh, in this building when we know that Labor are up to their old tricks. Uh, and I, uh, like most mornings, read this matter of public importance uh, with a degree of, uh, shall we say, 
sympathy, in a sense, because ultimately uh, every day it is for those opposite to concoct a matter of uh, public importance which uh, seeks to uh, attack the government's agenda uh, and, uh, and do so uh, with what would only be described as a limited arsenal. Um, we know that those opposite uh, sit with a, uh, a divided party and a leader who doesn't, doesn't know whether or not he's, uh, he's batting for the woke inner city, uh, inner city types uh, or the workers. Um, and we know that that, uh, that uh, narrative uh, streaks its way all the way through the party. So what do you do in those circumstances? Uh, what do you do in order to try, and, uh, to try and face up to that? Face up to uh, a government which is led by a prime minister that has seen us uh, through extraordinarily difficult times, a hundred-year pandemic, and done so uh, in circumstances where um, we have cemented our economic recovery. And indeed, today, Mr Acting Deputy President, we learned that we've retained our AAA rating. So it's with a degree of sympathy that I read these, because it is a very, very difficult task. So what does this represent? It represents nothing but gaslighting. Ultimately, that's what it is. It is parliamentary gaslighting. And psychologists use that term to refer to a specific type of manipulation, where the manipulator is trying to use someone, else, uh, someone else's reality to question their own. Um, we do so, and we know that, because they are usually based on lies, and they are usually based on matters which are of deep importance, such as uh, the rights of workers. Um, and to suggest that somehow that the Morrison Liberal government uh, has anything but the workers' best interests in mind is, is ludicrous. Um, this government has zero tolerance for any exploitation of workers, and we've seen that uh, with a number of legislative reforms that have come through. Um, it has zero tolerance for the underpayment of wages and entitlements by an employer. And this government has, in fact, taken unprecedented action uh, to date to protect vulnerable workers. Uh, that includes a commitment of over $160 million in additional resourcing to the regulator and the Fair Work Ombudsman. Um, there is no unfair advantage to law-breaking companies in the government's IR reforms. In fact, quite to the contrary, there are significant measures which prevent exploitation of workers and significant penalties for those that do so. Um, this government is continuing to take strong action to protect workers from underpayments with various uh, reforms to strengthen and enhance uh, existing compliance and enforcement regimes that are contained uh, in, in, these, uh, in this bill. But let's compare and contrast that using the example of gaslighting. Um, it wouldn't be the Labor Party blocking these uh, IR reforms that, uh, that would be causing problems, would it? Wait, what's this? Uh, by blocking this omnibus bill, Labor is actually seeking to block serious, serious reforms, such as a quicker enterprise agreement approval process through the Fair Work Commission. Um, this, this process would in itself actively help to deliver pay rises more quickly, but the Labor Party are blocking it. The opportunity for more hours for almost 30 per cent of part-time employees for the retail sector and 40 per cent of part-time employees in accommodation and food services sector who want more hours. And we're being told that this government is actually standing in the way of workers' rights. Well, it couldn't be more ludicrous. More job, more job opportunities are being blocked by Labor's position on this, on this legislation by providing certainty for mega job creating projects such as greenfield sites. Um, in fact, if you look at the detail, and we do that on this side of the chamber, we look at the detail, uh, the only side that's proposing to cut wages and cost jobs is actually the Labor Party, those opposite. Two weeks ago, in fact, we heard Anthony Albanese announcing <coughs> his undercooked and disappointing attempt uh, at industrial relations policy, which has nothing to do, nothing in the, in the secret to do with helping employers and employers work together. By contrast, the Morrison government supporting Australia's jobs and economic recovery package of reforms will actually give businesses the confidence they need to get back to growing and creating jobs. Uh, and that is exactly what the Morrison government's industrial relations reforms are, entitled to, are, are, are attempting to um, achieve. And to suggest that this government is failing to address job security is, is either disingenuous or it's just simply missing the point, or, Mr Acting Deputy President, it's simple gaslighting. Senator Sheldon. No, thank you, Acting Deputy President. While there is a job security crisis in Australia, there are more than 2.6 million casual workers in Australia. 
Now, we understand there is a role for casuals. We understand that permanent employees do not suit everyone in their circumstances. But when one in four workers are casual, it raises serious issues. We have to ask ourselves whether many, how, how many Australians are foregoing entitlements like sick leave and annual leave, if they are doing it because it suits their lifestyle or because the type of employment is being used by employers. Used by employers to avoid ongoing commitments of hours, used by, to avoid paying entitlements, the kinds of entitlements that are, in, that are betterment for the Australian workforce, or being used by employers incorrectly to avoid paying these entitlements while extracting the same kind of value from their workforce that they have been from permanent employees. The recent court cases against WorkPAC, championed by the CFMMEU, laid bare the exploitation of casuals in the workplace and that it's rampant. As Senator Roberts has repeatedly raised in this chamber, the exploitation of casual and labour hire coal miners in the Hunter Valley borders on the criminal. Of course, the government's response? Do nothing. Now, it's worse than doing nothing, actually. Their response is to further entrench insecure work, pushing a bill that would create permanent class of casuals, workers who, regardless of how they are treated or the expectations placed on them, will be called to, ca be called to be casuals day in and day out, completely overturning the outcomes of the federal court that protects casuals, protects rights. Entrenching the unfair advantage being provided to those employers who see their workforce not as people deserving of fair remuneration, but rather numbers on a budget line item, a cost to doing business. They only care about the financial cost, not the human cost. You only have to look at the gig economy. Didi Frode, a father with four-year-old son in, in Bali. Zhijian Shen whose eight-year-old son and 15-year-old daughter are in China, or Chao Kai Shen, a Malaysian national whose parents and sisters are devastated, Bijay Paul, Bijay Paul from Bangladesh, who leaves behind his parents and sister, and Ai Huang, who had only arrived from China to Australia recently. These are the names of the gig workers who have died in the past year on our streets delivering food for companies like Uber Eats and Hungry Panda. These men and workers have families. They have, they, they're in families, and they had been the breadwinners of their families. In many cases, these companies have ignored their responsibility to train, protect and assist their workers, hiding behind the facade, facade of terms like contractors, keeping their workers away at arm's length to avoid their responsibilities, their responsibilities to safely, to a fair playing field, to fair pay, and remuneration and to be able to organise collectively. I note that today the Attorney-General in the House during question time was asked about workers' rights, minimum pay and safety. He claimed the two government commissioned reviews had found no clear link between the remuneration and the safety of drivers, except that was a falsehood. The first review by Jaguar Consulting in 2014 found, I quote, a small number of studies have identified statistically significant relationships between driver remuneration and accidents in involvement. And a second, the PwC report from 2016 stated that, I quote, directly comparing remuneration and safety does demonstrate statistically significant correlations. But these are just a handful of all the reports over the years that have established a link between pay and safety. Workers in transport on low rates of pay are forced to work beyond breaking point in dangerous conditions to make ends meet. Every year, more truck drivers die on our roads, whilst this government, the one that abolished the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal, continues to ignore the link between pay and safety. Well, thankfully, there are some employers and employer groups out there who are prepared to call for action when it's needed to help end the crisis of insecure work. The Australian Road Transport Industry Organisation, in testimony provided to the Senate inquiry this last week, before last called for regulation of the gig economy, 
The chair, Peter Anderson, rightly pointed out, and I quote, the industry sees the oncoming gig economy and the way it's being managed at the moment as a threat to our standard of living and a winding back of employee protections. We would like to see a classification of the industrial relations st status of a gig worker. We believe that simply just simple justification would then be able to lead any jurisdiction and any law in the right direction to ensure that workers are protected accordingly. Organisations like RTO, employer organisation, recognises that further eroding the rights of employees and encouraging greater insecurity of work underpins the competitiveness of employers who do the right thing. Acting Deputy President, it's not just insecure work, but it's, a pro but it's also the byproduct of wage theft that has implications for competition in Australia. The Senate inquiry into wage theft has received 122 submissions, many of which are from employers. One in particular I will draw the Senate's attention to is that of the cheesecake shop, a franchisor with some 200 franchisees, cake bakeries across Australia, New Zealand and the United Kingdom. In their submission to the inquiry, they make the exact point, and I quote, small businesses that are compliant face a real threat from non-compliant competitors with a lower cost base. Businesses in their industry face a daily high, high, daily high rise of unfair price competition from employers who do not pay award rates and steal from their workers, who don't make enterprise agreements. As the McKell Institute firmly points out in the 2019 report, ending wage theft, eradicating underpayment in the Australian workforce. Wage theft, that pr theft provides an unfair competitive advantage to some companies. Companies that play by the rules, and I quote from the report, may lose customers, tenders and government contracts to businesses that commit wage theft and are able to offer, that are able to offer lower prices. Industries such as hospitality and fruit picking where wages make up a large proportion of costs. Business who pay a legal wage struggle financially against those who commit wage theft. Well, isn't the Liberal Party meant to be the party of business? Don't they recognise that insecure work and wage theft are tools used by unscrupulous employers to undermine the success of their competitors? And wouldn't the Liberal National Party be up in arms demanding to do something about those unfair operators? But of course not. They won't act to improve job security. Suggest, suggestions to me that the only business they care about are the ones that are taking advantage of workers and carry out unfair practices amongst competitors. Now, as we enter the recovery stage of the COVID-19 pandemic, there is no doubt that we need to ensure consumer demand will be critical to our economic recovery. But consumer demand relies on confidence. Workers must have confidence in their paychecks, in their working conditions in meeting the rising cost of living they're going to spend and lift demand. Those businesses who are serious about a COVID-19 recovery must understand the important role that increasing wage growth will play, alongside the need to improve job security. The crisis of job security in Australia is one that can only be met with government action. Too many employers exploit our existing system for an unfair competitive advantage. Without government action, this crisis will only get worse. And of course, that's why an Albanese-led government is committed to a plan to improve job security, one that will guarantee greater worker rights and conditions to those workers on the edges of the labour market, creating a rising tide to lift boats in the labour market and for all employers. A Labor government will make job security an objective of the Fair Work Act extend the powers of the Fair Work Commission to include employee-like forms of work and not abandon gig workers and the casualisation of work, consider proposals for portable entitlement schemes to better support workers in insecure work in consultation with business, create a fair and objective test for whether someone is truly a casual employee or not, not creating a clear pathway for permanent work, ensuring some job, same job, same pay, Ending the practices of labour comp law hire companies paying workers less than workers doing the same who are employed directly. Place a limit on the growing use of fixed term contracts. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy Speaker. And what 
what a time to be alive and what a time to see the last 12 months and the way the Morrison government has managed this COVID crisis. It has been a masterclass in economic management. We have managed in the space of a few months, we've got over COVID, we've got 90 per cent of people back in work. We've already got 90 per cent people back in work. Now, if that's not job security, if that's not job security, I don't know what is. And that's despite the fact that the state Labor premiers have been constantly opening and closing, opening and closing, opening and closing borders. You know, I remember at the start of this year, you know, I was talking to some small businessmen at the start, first week of January, and the first week of January, they were fried up. They were waiting for that first Friday night. We were all going to go down, headbanging in the pub. And what happens nine o'clock that morning? Uh, the Premier of Queensland shuts the pubs, shuts the restaurants, shuts the theatres. It's like all, and, and as, as well as that, and my barber. My barber lost 1,500 bucks that weekend. That's a threat to job security. That creates uncertainty. That creates unemployment. Now, you've got to ask yourself why these state premiers keep flip-flopping on border closes. Because I thought the deal was last year when we shut the country down for three or four weeks and we commit, committed to spending over $100 billion, the biggest economic rescue package ever, the biggest economic rescue package ever to make sure that our health system was up to speed, to make sure we had enough ventilators, all of that. And I can well remember the Queensland uh, Chief Medical Officer saying once we reopened after the election, funny enough that, that we wouldn't have to lock down again. Well, we went for 130 days with no case of COVID, no COVID cases. We get one case, one case in quarantine, and what happens? Bang! Everything's shut again. And of course, you know, we couldn't have the other Labor premiers being outdone, so we got another case in uh, quarantine over in Western Australia. So what do we have to do? That Labor premier had to outdo the Queensland Labor premier and shut down for five days. You know, what's going on here? What's going on with the contact tracing and testing? That is a threat to job security. That is a threat to job security. But you know what is a bigger threat to job security, a bigger example of wage exploitation? Wait for it. Superannuation. Because every week, 9.5 per cent of the workers' wages are taken from them. They never get to see that money. And it's given to someone in one of the big cities, Sydney or Melbourne, one of those white-collared blowhards who get to manage that money until that person retires. And there's no guarantee of a capital return. There's no guarantee of a capital return. And were these people ever asked if they could have 9.5 per cent of their money taken? No. Now, if you look at New Zealand, when there was a referendum there in 1997, they were asked if they wanted compulsory superannuation, and you know what they said? They said N-O, 92 per cent to 8, because at the end of the day, the workers want their own money in their pockets. They want to pay off their house. They want to pay off the hex debt. They might want a speedboat. They might want to actually you know, upgrade their, their semi-trailers or whatever it is. Okay? But that and all that extra compliance by the employer, who now has to go and do a separate payment, you know, that's more compliance for the employer, that he goes, well, OK, well, you know, this just gets harder and harder and harder. You know, is it really worth continuing to employ people here in Australia, or am I going to shift offshore? Am I going to shift offshore? So, you know, if you want to talk about wage exploitation, that's the other big threat. And of course, finally, the last big threat is, of course, unreliable power. Unreliable power. Now, would you employ someone that only turned up to work when the sun was shining and the wind was blowing? No. No. But that is what the people on the left want to do with energy. They just want energy that turns up when the wind is blowing and the sun is shining. How can you run a business when you don't know when you don't know where your energy is coming from next? Is it which part of Australia you're going to have to wait for the wind to start to blow before you get it coming? You know? And I mean, I want to know. I tell you what. I tell you who's feeling exploited. I tell you who are very worried right now. Is that town of Gladstone in my home state of Queensland? They are terrified that alum uh, alumina smelter is going to close down. Because I constantly ask the shadow minister for Queensland resources, because Queensland resources are for Queensland people. You know, we've got the whole labour thing going here. How many windmills is it going to take to power that Gladstone aluminium refinery? And he can't tell me. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Brockman. 
Well, it's always, uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It's always a challenge in this place to rise after Senator Rennick, uh, and it's such, 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 such an enlightening contribution as always. And I think, seeing as we're talking about this matter of public importance, Madam Acting Deputy President, as you well know, uh, those on the other side love repeating something so many times they think it becomes the truth, but in actual fact it remains as much as a falsehood as when they first began. Now, is uh, underpayment of wages an issue? Absolutely. And the Fair Work Ombudsman and this government has taken uh, remarkable steps in addressing this as an issue. And there have been a lump number of very significant companies in Australia who have been found to have been underpaying wages. Large companies with large human resource uh, departments, companies like 7-Eleven, Commonwealth Bank, Qantas, Bunnings, Woolworths. Now, these are large companies with very complex, very uh, 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 complex and uh, uh, very well-built human resource systems. Uh, is it wage theft? Do we need to use a pejorative term like wage theft? Well, let's see who else is on the list of those oh. who have underpaid wages. Who else? The ABC. The ABC, again, a large uh, a, a broadcasting government broadcaster with a significant human resource department behind it, also underpaid uh, millions in wages. Now, who else? Who else, who else Senator Scar? Well, I believe Maurice Blackburn. Uh, Maurice Blackburn. Now, Maurice Blackburn, a, a law firm that that bills itself as the, 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 the friend of the worker. It builds itself as the industrial relations experts, the labour lawyers. Uh, and you can write that in two ways and still mean the same thing. And Maurice Blackburn was found to have underpaid wages for hundreds, hundreds of its em junior employees. Now, I don't cast stones. I don't call it wage theft. I say maybe we've got a systemic problem. Maybe we've got a systemic problem. Maybe we've got a problem where our award system is actually so complex that the largest, most sophisticated human resource systems in Australia cannot get this right. And we expect small businesses. We expect small businesses where the human resource department is one person. It's the husband or the wife. It's the brother or the sister. It's an employee who's, who's, who's handling three different parts of the business. We expect those small business human resource departments, they're not departments, they're individuals. They're individuals trying to struggle to keep up with a system that is extraordinarily complex. Now, are companies that do the wrong thing uh, uh, a, a target for this government? Absolutely. This government is actively working to strengthen protections for employees, to strengthen criminal offences for dishonest and systematic underpayments of one or more employee. We're increasing penalties, uh, four years imprisonment, in fact. Now, that is a pretty significant penalty uh, in anyone's book. $1.11 million worth of fines, again, a very significant penalty in anyone's book. Increasing the maximum civil penalties for underpayment. New prohibitions to stop employers from advertising for jobs with pay rates below national minimum wages. And clarifying that the courts can make adverse publicity orders where appropriate. But Labor's not going to support this. Now why? They might say, oh, it doesn't go far enough. Fine. If they need to mollify their union mates, that's all well and good. But these changes directly impact the, benefit, the well-being of employers across Australia in a system that is undoubtedly overly complex. And again, I ask all senators to think about those mums and dads, those small business owners, those single employees who have to operate in this environment, an environment of extraordinary complexity, an environment where the likes of Maurice Blackburn, the Labor lawyers, cannot get this right. Thank you, Senator Brockman. The time for the discussion has expired. I'll now proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. I'll read them out by item. 
Item 1, Auditor General's Report for 2020-2021. Item 2, Government Documents. Item 3, Migration Act. Sorry, Item 3, Response to Senate Resolution regarding electric vehicles. Senator Rice. Thank Deputy President. Um, I wish to take note of the response to the Senate resolution um, about granted. electric vehicles. Leave is granted. Thank you. Um, a very interesting response that was received from the Premier of Tasmania in response to our Senate resolution which, um, from last December, which called upon Australian governments to support electric vehicles as a technology to reduce our carbon pollution and to take action to make them affordable and accessible to all Australians and to not place unnecessary taxation barriers in the way of their uptake. Um, Premier Gutwein's response was very glowing about the need to be supporting the rollout of electric vehicles. And he let us know that we have set that Tasmania has set an ambitious target to transition the Tasmanian government fleet to 100 per cent electric vehicles by 2030. Take note, government, of what a, a Liberal government in Australia has committed to do. Um, they have committed to trialling zero emission buses within the next two years and um, have other funding and support for infrastructure, including fast chargers and other chargers and a range of other technologies. What they note in the letter, and again this is the Tasmanian Liberal government, that although they welcome the Australian government's support for electric vehicles, that further policy levers remain available to support uptake, including fuel efficiency standards, electric vehicle sales targets, electric vehicle purchase in incentives, subsidising home charging installation and public awareness initiatives. And Premier Gutwin continues by saying, I would encourage the Australian government to continue to support electric vehicle uptake and look forward to working with the Australian government on further actions to increase electric vehicle uptake within Tasmania and nationally. Clearly this letter is saying what governments should and could be doing and what this government is not doing with their pathetic future fuel st strategy that was released last week, last month, which basically has completely dropped the ball and leaving Australia in the very slow lane, in fact broken down by the roadside when it comes to be supporting electric vehicle um, uptake. So our, my, my motion in the Senate motion in particular asked Australian governments to not place unnecessary taxation barriers in the way of their up uptake. And in particular, this was a letter to state premiers, state and territory premiers, to ask them to not proceed down the path that the Victorian and the South Australian governments are proceeding of imposing a tax on electric vehicles that would actually mean it would be a disincentive for electric vehicle uptake. So I'm very pleased to get this positive response from the Tasmanian government, and I'm hoping that this government will listen to it and realise that, in fact, we need to be doing an awful lot more to be in supporting the rollout of electric vehicles, to keep up with the rest of the world, in fact, even just to keep up with Tasmania. And in particular, that there are actions that we can take as a federal parliament to let the state governments that are considering imposing taxes on electric vehicles, that that is a very um, unwise way to be going. I've got a private senator's bill, which has now been referred off to committee, of which there are going to be consideration over the, the coming months, including some hearings where we're going to be exploring the issues of, um, state, of the taxes that the states are imposing on or proposing to impose on electric vehicles and how that's you know, not the best way to go and what we as a, as a federal parliament could be doing to actually be um, discouraging the state governments from imposing those sorts of state taxes which would discourage the uptake of electric vehicles. So I look forward to seeing the involvement of a range of senators from across the parliament to be taking action that they can, to be participating in, in the inquiry in the committee process on my private senator's bill and to be doing what we can, to be joining with the rest of the world and even keeping up with Tasmania to be really rapidly um, supporting the, uh, the uptake and the use of electric vehicles across the country. Senator Patrick. Thank you. I rise uh, to take note as well uh, in relation to item uh, number three uh, on electric vehicles. We uh, now have. Uh, 
We now have two letters tabled uh, in response to the Senate resolution of the 1st of December on electric vehicles, and I look forward to receiving the response from the other states. These responses uh, showcase the total and utter confusion caused by the lack of a national plan on electric vehicles. The Tasmanian Pre uh, Premier and I are both waiting in anticipation for the government's release of the national strategy for electric vehicles. Is the government prepared to share a date on which this will be released? In February two years ago, during his speech uh, on climate solutions, the Prime Minister made it clear his government was working on a national vehicle strategy. Well, it must be a cracker of a strategy because we're still waiting. The Prime Minister said, and I quote, the government is developing a national electric vehicle strategy to ensure the transition to new vehicle technology and infrastructure is carefully planned and managed. My advice is to stop planning and get engaged because the transition is already happening, being led by the states and territories. There's a risk with this piecemeal approach, you know, state by state, each with different uh, policies, uh, settings, different taxes. Uh, different apprehensions with, with consumers and industry, uh, all sorts of um, uncertainty as a big disincentive for electric vehicle uptake. As I said in my motion on the 7th of December last year, the government must provide national leadership on electric vehicles by delivering the national strategy it promised. Now, in the interim, whilst the nation waits for a national strategy, the government could demonstrate a modicum of leadership by dealing with the issue of what EV plug to use. Today we have at least four different plug types creating confusion for car owners and industry alike. Why not make things uh, simple and mandate a single plug to give Australians certainty? This is one tangible element that the Prime Minister uh, proposed, proposed back in uh, 2019, when he said that the government would investigate mandating a sing single, and I quote, electric vehicle plug to improve the consistency and interoperability of public charging. This would be at least one small step to resolving some ambiguity. Now, senators, who would have thought, who would have thought that the world would break out into a pandemic? There'd be uh, all sorts of terrible uh, issues occur occurring right across the world. There'll be here in Australia lockdowns, border closures, all that sort of stuff. And now we get to the point, gladly, where we're seeing a vaccine rolled out. And we've seen all of that happen whilst the government has been unable to decide what sort of plug to use. I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Are there any other speakers? Um, is leave granted to Senator Patrick? Leave is granted. Um, I'll put the motion. The, the um, we'll move to. I understand there are no ministerial statements. Is that correct? Yes. Um, any committee memberships? He don't, you do ministerial statement. We'll go. Item 14. Uh, Thank you, I Senator do. I, table, I table documents relating to orders for the production of documents concerning Royal Commission's confidentiality provisions and the cashless debit card. Thank you. Is leave granted? Is... Uh, Senator Steele-John. Thank you. Uh, in taking note uh, of this response, uh, I think it is uh, worthwhile to remind those uh, following along at home uh, of exactly where we are in this moment. We are a week uh, from uh, the passage of this Senate uh, of a bill, of a Greens bill, uh, to establish uh, the protections needed um, for witnesses to give evidence uh, to the Disability Abuse Royal Commission uh, while being fully protected. That bill passed this chamber with the support of the crossbench. And in response to that bill passing, the government said, oh no, we've got our own coming, it's going to be much better, it's going to address all of these other issues, we're going to do it before the end of the autumn, setting, uh, or end of the autumn sitting. 
We love, well, it was one of those rare, rare occasions where a, a coalition government said, we, we support what the Greens want to do and we want to go further. And yet we saw unprecedented, Senator Wish Wilson, and yet we saw the legislative agenda published for this week and there was not a single bill listed there that dealt with this issue. Even though the government has had 18 months to deal with this issue, 18 months to respond to the community, 18 months to respond to the demands of the Commission itself. And the Attorney General has failed to do so, once again seeming to stall a change which the community desperately needs. There can be no excuse for this type of delay. And I ask the government members to reflect upon it. Why is it? Why is it your government was dragged kicking and screaming to the establishment of the Royal Commission. It was established. People have begun to tell their stories. As part of that process, it has become abundantly clear that this very simple legislative change is needed to expand the confidentiality provisions that currently exist so that they exist in perpetuity, protecting people's confidentiality, protecting people's privacy, assuring that they do not come to harm if they tell their stories to the, to the Disability Abuse Royal Commission. You knew about it in February of 2019. The, the chair of the Royal Commission wrote to you uh, in uh, February of 2020. The interim report, published in October of 2020, identified it as an impediment to the investigation. And yet here we are in February of 2021 and you still have not acted. You still have not acted. And it seems very clear to me that the only thing that ever drew a solid statement out of you folks over this was that the bill ended up passing the Senate in the first place, spooking you to do something. I bloody well hope in some ways that that is the case, but that if not, the reality is that we have an Attorney General's Department that takes 18 months to craft a basic piece of legislation, which is very worrying for this country. But I cannot think that is the case because I do remember, as I'm sure Senator Wish Wilson does, the speed with which the Attorney General's office was able to respond when a few needles were found in strawberries. We had legislation dealing with that within a couple of weeks. If only disabled people were needles in strawberries, maybe we would have had action by now. If only disability abuse seemed to threaten some of their regional allies, maybe we would have had action by now. This is one of the most farcical stalemates I have seen in three years. Surely you cannot want to sit on that side of the chamber in the pocket of big abuse. Surely you want to see people tell their stories. Surely you want to uh, see people give this evidence as to how they would have been and how they have been so poorly treated. This was something that could have passed uh, in the blink of an eye in this place. We could have banged it through in non-contro, very little debate. It could have been done in March of last year. We could have gathered an entire year of evidence. And instead, what we have seen is a structural impediment to this historic investigation continue. It is absolutely unacceptable that we have come to 18 months later and the government is still stalling. There can be no further delay from the Attorney General or from the Prime Minister. As I understand your conception of the autumn sitting, it ends at the end of March. That gives you 
two more weeks after the conclusion of this Senate sitting to get that bill through, to get it through, get it done, get people the protections they need. And while you're at it, if you could be so polite to respond to the Royal Commission's request for an extension of 15 months to its life, owing in no small part to the fact that it's lost 18 months of time buggering about trying to get you to do this, that would be much appreciated. All you need to do is your job and get out of the way. The evidence will flow. Get on. Do it. You have two weeks left. The community is watching you, and we expect action. I thank the Chamber for its time. Thank you, Senator Steele-John. Are there any other speakers? Senator Seward. Um, I, Senator Steele-John may oh, want to seek leave to continue leave. his remarks. Do you wish to seek leave to consider? To Continue your, your, your remarks. And yes, I rise to take note of the tabling of the OPD on the results of the OPD and the final evaluation report by the University of Adelaide on the cashless debit card. Um, last week we finally saw the University of Adelaide evaluation of the cashless debit card in Sojourner, East Kimberley and the Goldfields. Uh, go up on the Department of Social Services website. One wonders whether it would have gone up if this OPD hadn't in fact been uh, moved in this chamber. This evaluation was released over a year and a half late after it was, after it was due and most of the evidence was collected back in 2019. And I tell you what, when you read it, you know very well why they didn't want to table it before we debated that bill. They extended the trial for another two years at the very, in the very dying days of, the, of Parliament last year because this report does not have evidence that the cashless debit card has in fact achieved its, uh, its objectives. The government can't show that the, CD, that the cashless debit card has made many statistical significant success or has made much towards its stated goals. The evaluation is quite clear that it is not possible to attribute changes in the trial sites to the cashless debit card alone. Changes in alcohol consumption can't be contributed to the card alone because there were many other measures put in place at the same time. And besides, if you read the report, 46 per cent of CDC participants report that they don't consume alcohol at all. Nearly 50 per cent don't actually consume alcohol, and yet this card was rolled on for another two years. No discernible change in employment outcomes were reported to the evaluation across all three uh, trial sites. There was little consensus amongst whether and how children's welfare had changed since the card was first introduced. Again, we're always told this is about the children. The bottom line is that the government can't show that the cashless debit card has achieved its its intended goals because the data is so poor. Despite this, the researchers have drawn on the data to infer some possible perceived changes. Now, I remember when there was perceived changes for the Northern Territory intervention, and when that was tested out, it was shown that there weren't any changes. So I bet you that's what's going on the same here. We're working on perceptions that there's been changes, not real changes. They talk about the degree to which the CDC is perceived to have decreased the use of alcohol or illicit drugs, instead of using hard data to demonstrate statistically significant changes. This cannot be overstated. They cannot demonstrate significantly, uh, statistically significant changes. The government spent $2.5 million on this evaluation. And they still can't tell us whether the CDC actually achieved its aims to reduce alcohol consumption or drug or gambling misuse. Perceived changes aside, what the evaluation does tell us is that the majority of the cashless debit card participants would prefer to opt out of the current trial. Once again, we have the process here where the participants want out. They don't want to be on the card, but stakeholders, stakeholders still want the card to continue. This is absolutely outrageous. 
that the government can continue to push this trial, so-called trials, I should say, while they cannot demonstrate outcomes, while they are causing deep— let me quote what it says in the report from the participants. Participants report feelings of discrimination, embarrassment, shame and unfairness across all trial sites by the majority of participants. So stakeholders can say, oh, we think there's a change, but participants, the people on it, are suffering from discrimination, embarrassment, shame. Others, to me, have reported talking about loss of dignity, loss of control over their lives. That is what they, this report can show. It's not perceived. This is what participants are actually saying. Disappointingly, this evaluation did not critically engage with the assumptions underpinning the cashless debit card itself. For example, the researchers accepted, in quotes, the academic literature suggests that there is a strong relationship between excessive drug, alcohol and gambling consumption, social status and domestic violence and crime. This literature is actually contested, and it is poor academic practice to present these claims uncritically. The researchers failed to include any mention of the growing literature of imperial research into the cashless debit card and income management. We have yet again seen stakeholders given a platform in this evaluation, just like they were in the last set. That again didn't show any real outcomes for the cashless debit card. As you can imagine, stakeholders often express positive views and opinions about the cashless debit card, probably because they are not on the card and don't experience the shame, stigma and discrimination firsthand on this card, which is what the participants report. The evaluation never justified why non-cashless debit card participants need to be included in the research in the first place. While the authors say that they used mixed methods research to triangulate the, evaluate the evaluation, more could have been made about the lack of pre tiled data and how this stops any real insight into the changes in adverted commas before and after the CDC. I've said it before and I will continue to say it. Without proper baseline data, the government will never be able to measure the true, the, any um, so-called impact of the cashless debit card. These trials, so-called trials, were not set up in the way they could be measured. I said it in this chamber when we were debating the very first bill, and I'll continue to say it. You don't have the baseline data. This is an ideological-driven program. If the government is going to make any significant intervention in people's lives, they need robust evidence, particularly if they're going to continue it year after year in a program that causes shame, stigma, and discrimination as reported by the participants in their own so-called evaluations. The minister herself acknowledged the lack of data around the cashless debit card when we were debating the bill to extend the card just last year. At the end of last year, Minister Rustin said, but can I just put on the record that there is nobody in this chamber that's more frustrated than me about the lack of quantitative data around these measures? Um, and then she went on to say, what they haven't been able to provide and what I want to get access to is the hard quantitative data. I accept that it is incredibly disappointing that, they're not stand, that we're not standing here with the kind of information that we would have liked. And let me tell you, the evaluation does nothing to fill that gap in quantitative data. We still don't know the actual number of hospital presentations or police call-outs. The Senate should have access to this evaluation data and we should have had it when we were debating the extension of the cashless debit card last year. Would the card have been voted down once and for all if the crossbench had seen this abysmal evaluation? We will never know, unfortunately, which is what the government wanted. They did not want to present this when Senator Griff, for example, was making up his decision that actually meant that this card continued for another two years. These so-called trials were always targeting First Nations peoples, stigmatising people on income support and those with addiction issues, rather than addressing the underlying causes of disadvantage. We need to stop this racist, discriminatory, stigmatising policy once and for all and give people on income management the choice, because that's what the cashless debit card is. It is income management. 
We need to give people a choice. If they want to be on the card voluntarily in a properly constructed program, fair enough. But don't make it compulsory because it does not work. You've tried and tried and tried. Three evaluations. The middle one had a, a, a couple of evaluations tucked in there, and you've never been able to show that it works. This income management has been in place since 2007, going on 14 years. You haven't been able to prove it works. Give it up and start putting the money into addressing the underlying causes of addiction and disadvantage. Thank you, Senator Seward. Are there any other speakers? Oh, Senator Seward, do you seek leave to continue? Continue my remarks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any I move to item 15. Any committee memberships? No. Um, the President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Education Services for Overseas Students Amendment, refunds of charges and other measures, Bill 2020, for concurrence. I call the Minister. Uh, thank you. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. Is the motion agreed to? All of those, all in favour say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Education Services for Overseas Students Act 2000 and for related purposes. Minister. Uh, I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. And I move that the debate be now adjourned. Is that motion agreed to? All of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Treasury Laws Amendment, New Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bargaining Code, Bill 2021, for concurrence. I call the Minister. Uh, I move that this bill may, may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Is the motion agreed to? All of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Competition and Consumer Act 2010 in relation to digi digital platforms and for related purposes. Minister. Uh, thank you. I table an, an addendum to the explanatory memorandum and a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, thank you. I move that the debate be now adjourned. All of the, is that motion agreed to? All of that is opinion say aye. aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Minister. Uh, I move the resumption of the debate be in order of the day for a later hour. Is that motion agreed to? All of that opinion say aye. aye. Again, say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Uh, we'll The President has received a me message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the VET Student Payment Arrangements Miscellaneous Amendments Bill 2020 without amendment. And the President has received messages from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to seven laws, details of which will be incorporated in Hansard. I'll call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day, Transport Security Amendment, Serious Crime Bill 2020, further consideration. Senator Stirl. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, understanding order 115, in brackets to in brackets little a, I move that this bill be referred to the Senate Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Legislation Committee for inquiry and report by the 11th of March 2021. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, one thing that is of no difference in this chamber of this building is that we must do everything we can to keep our shores safe. There is not a senator or a member in any parliament around the state or, around, or in states or in the nation that would disagree with that. That we do everything we can to stop the flow of drugs coming into this nation. Now, one thing I, I can assume with confidence, Madam Acting Deputy President, is that the majority of drugs coming into this nation aren't coming here by hot air balloon. I think I'd be pretty safe to say, Senators, 
that they're not strapped to the legs of pigeons on flock heading down from Southeast Asia or South America. I think I'm on the money there. One thing I think I could absolutely say without any fear of contradiction is that they would have, well, sorry, we see uh, through our TV channels border security and they're catching everyone bringing in all sorts of food in their suitcases. So there's probably a good chance that the majority of these massive drug hauls aren't coming into Australia on our planes. And we hope that everything is screened as it's going through. That's what they're telling us or they show us. So coming back to what I can safely say, Madam Acting Deputy President, is they have to get here by ship. <laughs> Pretty simple. And I can say this without any fear of contradiction, Madam Acting Deputy President and Honourable Senators. Not coming on Australian ships. How do I know they're not coming on Australian ships? Because we haven't got any. The only two Australian ships we've got flagged and crewed are our gas buggies running off the north coast, northwest coast, the big side of Australia. What I can safely say without any fear of contradiction that it would be flags of convenient vessels. Major drug hauls and packages of which we saw in last week's media are off the coast of Hinchinbrook Hinch Island, I think it is. Possibly they thought it was cocaine. I haven't seen ice and sugar wrapped up like that. But anyway, someone will, or it might have been heroin. Someone will correct me if I'm wrong if it's sugar or flour or some damn thing. So to get back to this, well, we've seen the attempt of the government to, to make it as hard as possible, e even harder, for our maritime workers, our wharfies or our seafarers, and our aviation workers, if they're doing something wrong, clamp down. But, Madam Acting Deputy President, as I said earlier today, I cannot for the life of me accept no way that by not applying the same standards to exploited seafarers, foreign seafarers, on flags of convenient vessels, the same condition bewilders me. But we also know, Madam Acting Deputy President, the murky, murky system that comes with the flag of convenience vessels, where we don't most of the time know who even owns the ship. And yet this government tries to look us in the eye and tell us we have to get harder on Australian seafarers, what we've got left of them, applying our coastal trade. We have to get harder on wharfies and we have to get harder on aviation workers. But don't look over here because everything's Mickey Mouse, it's all tickety-boo, because 24 hours off our shore, 48 to 24 hours, I think it's about 500 nautical miles, the shipping company, not the shipmaster, the shipping company sends an email to our authorities saying these passports will match the people that are on the boat. Look at the photos, not a problem, absolutely. As I'd said in here earlier when I talked about Captain Salas and the shameful, shameful events that happened on the Sage Sagittarius. And our authorities, our authorities, God bless them, and I'll stand up and I'll support those men and women in uniform, couldn't even find him. It took Owen Jarks, the journalist, on the Sunshine Coast to inform our, our um, authorities when the trial was on that and they didn't know where Captain Salas was, the alleged, not alleged, the convicted gun runner and money launderer, and three of his sailors had died on board, two of them had gone overboard that he was actually plying coastal trade, our coastal trade, and he was in Gladstone and he was leaving the next day. What I've clearly said, Madam Acting Deputy President, the disgrace, the disrespect that is shown, and I, I, I lay the blame at the feet of the government and the relevant ministers, to Senate inquiries, to Senate procedures, to the Senate and all in senators involved, involved in the inquiries, to not give the answers. When, Madam Deputy President, you know they cannot use the excuse of national security, we offer them the opportunity to go into camera. It's now time to call them back. The minister needs to lead the charge and tell his subordinates start answering questions. Australians need to know. Thank you, Senator Sterl. Senator Sheldon. In support of uh, Senator Stirl's um, proposition, that you know, we have like we had a last-minute amendment to this legislation that's been on the books for years. An amendment that takes away the rights of so many workers within this industry. And at the same time, as Senator Still quite lightly, rightly uh, outlined, we've got ships being carted 
by people that do not get proper security checks? How within 24 hours or 48 hours can you possibly turn around and do a proper check on an overseas seafarer who's carting ammonium nitrate around the shores of this country? How can you possibly do it so quickly? Because we know they can't do it for Australian seafarers. We know they can't do it for aviation workers. We know they can't do it for workers working on our ports. So they're not doing it, and they're not doing it properly. Now, this particular bill to turn around and extend a right to the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission to dramatically expand its powers, an organisation at this point is substantially under-resourced, that hasn't been cross-examined about this proposal in any real detail, that would seek workers lose their clearance entirely on the basis of untested intelligence. They, they'd be doing it on the basis of suspected future uh, breach. It's a bit like turning around and saying, oh, you know, look, you're likely to get a speeding ticket somewhere in the future. I'll just fine you now. But the fine in this case is losing your job. The fine in this case is saying to people they don't have evidence against that you're going to take the most worst of all circumstances, be a pariah amongst your community, to lose your job, embarrassed with your family and robbed of your income. If we had this sort of approach to corporations on wage theft, my goodness. Imagine turning around and saying, I think this company is in that group that might steal some wage theft. Because they're, that, you know, if you look at the cross-examine the the sort of statistics that happen on wage theft, which parts of the market, and who's most likely to offend. Let's just hold them to account straight away. Well, that would be ridiculous. But that's exactly what they're doing with seafarers and aviation workers. Based on intelligence, it's not transparent, it's not appropriately accountable. Now, quite clearly, this is all trumped up. This is, you know, if you were trumping this up into some sort of national security concern, then you would turn around and actually have a strategy for the seafarers that have been brought in from overseas to do the coastal shipping. But guess what? They don't. And it's not hard to work out why they don't. It's because that's where the big money is. That's where the big money is for those corporations that put us in danger. And that's what good government's supposed to be about, making sure it's not about the dollar but about the community. It's about our national interests, not just about the next trip we can get at a lower rate, but our national interest, as I said before, even when it goes to ammonium nitrate, let alone gun running, drug using and murder, as Senator Stirl has pointed out, it's critically important that we look at you know, the appropriate merits of any, any proposition, and that has, opportunity has not been fully exercised. Yes, it had a momentary uh, in, uh, look at, at the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee but it did not have a proper investigation into the aspects that the government's put forward. Now, has there not been an opportunity for appropriate, uh, committee, uh, looking, appropriate committee surveillance of these issues and people will be able to give evidence in an appropriate way? There has not been the answers given. You know, I've, I've sat in, not, not in camera, I've sat in various hearings of RAT where I've seen, you know, when we're cross-examining about what are the strengths and pitfalls and weaknesses, there's been no suggestion that these sorts of arrangements were going to specifically be put into this bill when we're actually having these discussions. You know, they actually avoided it because they're hiding from the fact and trying to put it through at the last minute because it doesn't stand the test. This affects real people. It affects their capacity to have this done transparently. It affects the fact that this is being sped through, and it's only appropriate that this could be given further consideration for all the parties and also the crossbenchers to give proper consideration to. So I urge people to support the proposition from Senator Stirl, and you know, let's make sure we get this on track. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. The Greens will be supporting this motion from Senator Stirl. We think it's very appropriate that this legislation gets sent off to um, the Rural Regional Affairs and Transport Committee for further consideration because there are so many unanswered questions about it. And as it stands at the moment, from what is known and 
without um, further consideration and further discussion to amend it and, and to make it a, a workable bit of legislation, there is just this huge disparity between extra security controls being place, placed upon Australian workers and, in contrast, the security controls on foreign seafarers just aren't fair. Um, I think this, the whole time that I've been in the Senate, six and a half years we've been having this debate, and nothing has changed. Whereas there is a lot of control, appropriately, yes, we need to make sure that um, Australian workers aren't a security risk. It's appropriate to have those controls. But this legislation is increasing the controls, making it more difficult for Australian workers to actually be able to walk, work in our ports and airports. And at the same time, nothing is being done about the security risk of foreign seafarers. And their security risk, as I said in my second reading speech, is a big question mark, particularly because of the very poor conditions that seafarers are actually working under on a lot of these ships. So in terms of the pressures on them and the potential risk of them actually thinking, well, you know, maybe getting a bit of money on the side, maybe doing something nefarious um, because you know, they're getting paid next to nothing, they've got families at home that are, that are struggling, they haven't been home for you know, months, if not years, that they are prime risks um, for actually sort of being susceptible to actually be, be taking action that's not in Australia's interests and potentially being a security risk. And yet this huge gaping hole in our security just is not being given the proper consideration that it needs to by this government, along with the whole issues of the demise of the Australian shipping industry and the increasing reliance on, on foreign-owned ships um, which have, with um, flags of convenience shipping and where you've got workers that are being really dreadfully exploited. You've got environmental standards going out the window at all, um, and yet the government has sat on its hands and we have had nothing the whole six years I've been here that has actually progressed this issue any further. Thank you, Senator Rice. I'll put the question. The, the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Stirl be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. A division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Sturr that the bill be referred to the Rural and Regional Affairs Committee be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator McCarthy, tell it the ayes. Senator Brockman, tell it the noes. The result of the division is ayes 34, noes 31. The question is resolved in the affirmative and therefore the bill has been referred to the committee understanding order 1152A. I call the clerk. Government business, Treasury laws amendment, news media and digital platforms mandatory bargaining code bill 2021. Resumption of second reading debate. Thank you. Um, Senator Pratt, you have the call. Thank you. I just need to get my papers in the right order. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The bill before us in the chamber today, as we know, amends the News, Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bargaining Code is a bill to establish a mandatory code of conduct to help the sustainability of Australian news media. And it does this by seeking to address the bargaining power imbalances between digital platforms and Australian news businesses. Now, most Australians will know something of this because it's certainly been in the news. Uh, of late, and if you didn't see it in the news, then many Australians would have seen uh, their Facebook uh, content and platforms disrupted. We know that this code's been more than three years in the making, spearheaded by the ACCC through the Digital Platforms Inquiry. It is Australia's attempt to address the decline in public interest jour journalism by capturing news media revenue from dominant digital platforms as other jurisdictions have attempted to do, with varying degrees of success. From the outset, Labor has indicated in principle support for a workable code to address the bargaining imbalance between dominant digital platforms and Australia's news media. So, on that note, Labor supports the bill to establish this mandatory code of conduct to address this imbalance. However, we note that the Code of Conduct does not preclude parties from 
their own commercial negotiations or reaching deals outside the code. And I look forward to hearing more from the government about that later. Uh, as we note, that seems to have been happening. Uh, the bill, as we know, has a framework to empower the minister to designate certain digital platform services with a significant bargaining power, empower ACMA to register certain news media businesses that meet certain thresholds so that those parties may be brought together uh, to arbitrate, negotiate and bargain in good fa faith to reach binding agreements or access an independent arbiter to determine remuneration under final offer arbitration, should they be unable to reach agreement. We also see that the bill uh, will enable digital platforms to publish standard offers which provide smaller news media businesses with a pathway to accessing those agreements, as well as setting minimum standards for digital platforms, including having 14 days advance notice of algorithm changes that might impact news media businesses. And we also note that the code will be reviewed within one year of the commencement of the bill. So the Labor Party's extended constructive in principle support, and we see that the government has signalled uh, the consideration of amendments. Uh, however, I think the minister tabled some amendments to the explanatory memorandum. I'm unaware if they have uh, tabled or signals any amendments in this chamber to the bill itself. Uh, we saw that the government circulated amendments uh, for debate in the House on the 17th of February and described those amendments as a number of clarifications and technical amendments. Uh, so, progressing from there, we supported the bill as amended by the government in the House. But we stand here today still with a number of questions for the government on how it intends to implement this law in practice, particularly in relation to what digital platforms and services will be designated under this new code and when. And those questions from the Labor Party remain outstanding. We're still, uh, as late as today, we had been waiting to find out uh, if you would amend the bill further. We've seen uh, Treasurer Frydenberg say that he is continu continuing discussions with Facebook Chief Executive uh, Mark Zuckerberg about the out outstanding issues within the code and indicated that some amendments might be made. But we see that the government has not elected to amend the bill. Labor is of the view that for the government to ensure that a bill of such consequence in a negotiation context be readied for debate in this parliament, that it's not good enough that these issues have remained unclear until now. I'm assuming that there are no amendments to be made. For many months now, Google and Facebook expressed concerns that the code wasn't workable and explained that they may withdraw products and services uh, from Australia if their concerns were not addressed. And indeed, we see news that Google's been working to land deals with Australian news media publishers, which is a welcome thing. But it appears that an understanding negotiated between Google and the government when it comes to the future designation of Google services under the code that there is also some kind of understanding that's been negotiated. However, we see that Facebook continues to express serious reservations about the bill, and we've seen somewhat of an explosion of that that has impacted on uh, many Australians' access to information. We saw the Facebook, that Facebook took the unprecedented world first step of restricting publishers and people in Australia from sharing or viewing Australian and international news content. But we see also that there was a large-scale overblocking of material not subject to the code, including the pages of health, emergency and community services. And we'll need to discuss these issues further in the committee stages. Millions of Australians are understandably aggrieved that Facebook blocked them from accessing content, uh, including important community services in the midst of a pandemic. 
And so issues like this need to be fixed as a matter of urgency. Blocking new services subject to the code could persist, impacting large mainstream media companies as well as smaller publishers as well. So we need to call on the government today to do its job, to craft a workable news media code that supports the media without undermining our digital economy or disrupting millions of Australian citizens and small businesses, as we have seen, because a great many communities benefit from sharing uh, information on these platforms. In the additional comments to the report of the Senate inquiry into this bill, Labor senators cautioned very strongly that the withdrawal of Google search and Facebook news sharing from Australia would disrupt many millions of Australians who use these services every month. And indeed, more than a million small businesses who are relying on uh, these platforms as part of their rebuilding uh, after COVID. And we know that the delay and uncertainty with these processes has dragged on, and we've seen the disruption to millions of Australians uh, and the, the services they access online. So Labor very much affirms that Australian sovereignty should be respected and that Australian law should be well-crafted, proportionate and fair. We don't say that the government should respond to threats from digital platforms, but we do call on the government to do its job, the job that it said it would do, and find a way to support the media without disrupting millions of Australians and small businesses. Labor has been very much outcomes focused during this debate. We want a code that's about ensuring the sustainability of, the public, interest journal of public interest journalism and the importance of the fourth estate in light of the ongoing disruption to the news media that we've experienced over some decades now and its traditional business models. And indeed, that's further been disrupted by the power of the digital platforms we're discussing uh, in this legislation today. It is ultimately about having a healthy, functioning democracy, uh, which means we need access to news and information. The potential impact of this legislation on news media businesses, digital platforms, small businesses, citizens and consumers I have to say the government should have had its ducks in a row a lot earlier, rather than seeing the chaos of last week. They, we know that there's a great deal of uncertainty still about the future of designation of the platforms and services which will remain under this legislation a matter of ministerial discretion. And so we don't know uh, what further disruption we might see as part of future negotiations if the government gets this wrong. Not all Australian news media businesses have struck deals, as we know, with the digital platforms, and the passage of this bill may impact their relative negotiation position with those platforms. And we remain concerned uh, about, about this and we want to see balance. It's not clear to us how the government will achieve the intention of levelling the bargaining position between the news media and digital platforms if certain services are not designated and the negotiate arbitrate provision of the codes do not apply. Uh, and this remains to be seen. So for this reason, Labor recommends the government use precise language in its public statements regarding what designations it intends to make under this code. We want to save any misunderstanding or unnecessary uncertainty for the media, digital platforms, small businesses, citizens and consumers who may be impacted and it looks are very likely to be impacted. It goes without saying that the government needs to be judicious when it comes to making designation determinations under this code once it's passed. There's a great deal of stakeholder concern with the bill. Uh, we note that the co co corollary of addressing the dominance of digital platforms could involve potential impacts beyond the news media, and the outcomes of this might be unknown. 
Many small businesses, small and media, medium news media, publishers, citizens and consumers are worried about these impacts. The government's indication by a media release on 8 December that the code will apply to Google search, combined with the minister's subsequent enthusiastic promotion of alternative search en engines such as Microsoft's Bing and DuckDuckGo, caused many Australians and small businesses uncertainty and worry about the potential impacts of this legislation, noting Google's threat to withdraw their search engine from Australia. So we see uh, a great deal of concern from stakeholders expressed should Google withdraw search and Facebook also withdraw uh, news from Australia in response to the passage of this bill. The disruptions would be very real, and that's despite the alternative uh, search engines and social media platforms that are available. We're very used to the dominance of Facebook and Google in this regard. I'd like to thank all of the constituents for reaching out to us in the Labor Party about those concerns. Reporting has recently referred to the withdrawal of Google search from Australia as a death sentence for small to medium enterprises. And I don't have time to go into uh, the detail of many of the concerns, such as how much revenue, if any, will be invested in additional uh, journalists, uh, with the exception of the ABC, which is committed to invest in regional services should it be able to access revenue from these from arbitration, uh, and indeed what loss to the community there would be uh, in economic loss should Google or Facebook withdraw services. Uh, we can see that some uh, mainstream businesses will benefit from increased traffic and advertising on their news products, but also that there are risks to small and independent businesses who may lose referrals and media diversity could be undermined rather than strengthened. We in Australia have one of the most concentrated media markets in the world, and search engines are, and social media are absolutely instrumental in accessing uh, news and information and ensuring that we have access to a diversity of sources, both domestic and international. Other reforms that this government has put forward have not been achieved, and there's a lot more to do. Uh, we're pleased at evidence that work on the code to date has improved the responsiveness of digital platforms to the news media, but this is not an end to itself. Uh, finally, in closing, we support this bill. The government needs to act on the balance of the recommendations of the report uh, that has prompted this legislation. And I, in closing, move my second reading amendment that uh, should by now have been circulated in my name. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator um, Hanson Young. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise uh, this evening to, spilk, uh, to speak in relation to this bill, a bill that uh, enacts uh, recommendations from the ACCC after some three years of work by the regulatory body in relation to these issues. I think it's really important to say at the outset that this bill is designed to deal with one particular part of the issues facing public interest journalism in this country, news media and, of course, uh, the long-awaited regulation of the big tech giants. It doesn't solve everything. Uh, and it, it certainly uh, cannot stand alone as the only action needing to be taken to ensure that a we deal with the monopoly that exists uh, online, the digital tech giants, but also the monopoly that exists within Australia's media landscape, and namely, of course, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, that is the monopoly of the Murdoch Press. We know that public interest journalism in this country has been struggling for quite some time and that trying to get uh, to uh, the negotiating table with these big tech giants to negotiate how uh, they uh, access the services of uh, digital uh, advertising and revenue 
uh, spend has been very, very difficult. And the ACCC's report after three years made it very clear that there was a power imbalance in relation to the ability for media organisations and publishers to actually have a fair and genuine negotiation with those big tech giants. They simply, Facebook and Google, didn't need to turn up to the table, uh, didn't need to put genuine offers on the table and refused in many cases to do so. Madam Acting Deputy President, monopolies are bad. Uh, they often lead uh, to a uh, lesser quality product and often to higher prices for the consumer. In this uh, scenario, what we have seen is that uh, the monopoly that both Google and Facebook have had is one that um, has really made it difficult uh, for those who create news journalism in this country uh, to be able to um, pay for the content that they create, access that uh, advertising revenue in a fair and transparent way, and to be able to continue on their very important work. But public interest in journalism is essential for ensuring that we have a robust and accountable democracy, to ensure that there are journalists being paid for the work they do, to investigate uh, very important news and stories in the public interest, to ensure that there is a fourth estate that is willing and able and funded and resourced to hold the government of the day to account, to hold the parliament uh, to account. It is essential that we have journalists working to uh, inform the rest of us as a community about what is going on in our own backyards, in our communities, across the country and indeed where Australia fits in the rest of the world. As I said at the outset, this particular piece of legislation doesn't solve all of the problems that we face in 2021 when it comes to uh, the um, uh, current uh, platforms online or indeed uh, the monopolies uh, within uh, the media landscape here. Um, it does one particular part. It deals with the advertising revenue, the bargaining process for that, and that is it. The government has a lot of work to do, and this parliament has a lot of work to do, to make sure this is not set and forget, that actually we roll up our sleeves and we get serious about making sure there is a proper investment and the settings are there for investment into media diversity in this country, to make sure we can tackle the other big monopoly that exists in Australia, and that, of course, is the monopoly of News Corp. We can't have a con continuing attack on our public broadcaster from this government, cut after cut after cut, making our public broadcaster less and less effective when it comes to uh, covering the stories that really matter to Australians and making those stories and that information accessible. We need to make sure that small publishers, independent publishers, start-up news organisations can get a foothold in the market and are able to flourish so that we are in, uh, employing not just new journalists in this country and the next generation of journalists, but to ensure that as consumers as the audience, as regular members of the community, that we have free and open access uh, and, and transparency in being able to, to um, consume the information and the news that those new platforms and those news agencies, new agencies are able uh, to create for us. There's a number of things that need uh, amending in relation uh, to this piece of legislation. Overall, the principle of tackling this power imbalance uh, is absolutely right. It does need to happen. But there are a number of amendments that we need to make sure uh, the Australian people, the community, our news organisations, our smaller publishers uh, and regular users of the internet are protected. We need to make sure that uh, the ABC's funding is secured, and I foreshadow now that I'll be moving a, an amendment in relation to uh, protecting uh, the ABC funding uh, going forward as part of tonight's debate. We'll also move an amendment in relation to 
ensuring that small publishers and independent publishers get a fair say when it comes to the review of this legislation in 12 months' time. We called for a review uh, into this legislation, and it is now, uh, it's been promised by the government. We want to make sure that small independent uh, publishers are front and centre when the impacts are being considered. And we also want an amendment that ensures that the revenue that is gained through this piece of legislation actually goes to where it is intended. That is, Madam Acting Deputy President, to the journalists themselves. We want to see this funding and this money flow to the newsrooms, not the boardrooms. This shouldn't be simply another slush fund for big media corporations that already monopolise the market here in Australia. This needs to go into ensuring that journalists get paid for their work, that photographers get paid for their work, and that the, those groundbreaking public interest stories that are waiting to be uncovered right across the country can and should be, and then are accessible to everyday Australians. So we need to make sure this money goes actually to journalism and not just into the pockets of shareholders or executives. There is also the big looming issue of how we deal with the, the emerging issue, putting this piece of legislation aside, to the power of big data. Now, that's not just an issue that Australia has to grapple with. This is something that is facing countries right, and governments right around the world. Because the power of big data, of big corporations like Facebook and Google, to run surveillance on their customers, on everyday users, to bundle up that data and to sell it off for their profit, huge profit, at the expense of people's privacy and the integrity of their own use online is just extraordinary, and it needs to be reined in. The, in the uh, European Union, there has been a long-held debate uh, over there in relation to reining in the power of the big tech giants and ensuring that the individual user has control over where their data is collected, who it's collected by and where it goes next. It worries me as a mother that my 14-year-old daughter, everything she does online is tracked and traced by big corporations right around the world, that they know not just where she's been, not just what she likes, not just where she shops, not just who she's friends with, but it, then these big corporations dictate what she's going to show interest in next. As a 14-year-old, her data footprint is being collated, collected and then sold to the highest bidder. It is simply not okay. And we have to make sure we implement proper protections for users' data and privacy right here in Australia. And we don't need to be on our own on this. The EU is, is there. Many other countries are going there. Australia needs to be front and centre of making sure we protect the user, the individual person online, not just the interests of the big corporations. We also, of course, Madam Acting Deputy President, need to tackle big money in this space. And when you've got big corporations like Facebook and Google and the Murdoch Press paying not little to no tax in this country, you know you've got a problem. And tonight we'll be moving an amendment that goes directly to this point. Because we shouldn't be in a situation where two big billionaires, Mark Zuckerberg and Rupert Murdoch, get to dictate what news Australians consume, when they can consume it and what they can consume it by. And all the while not paying tax in this country. We need to start turning up the heat on these big corporations and these billionaires to pay their fair share of tax, to pay their fair share of public interest, to ensure that these services and these products 
exist in the public interest, not just for the corporate profit. We've got to stop these corporations from being able to run their tax affairs so they can minimise their tax in offshore havens. We need to make sure that the Australian people get bang for their buck when pieces of legislation like this pass. Monopolies are bad, Madam, Monopolies are bad, Madam Acting Deputy President. We do need to take them on, and we need to have the guts and the courage to do it. This amendment tonight is only one small part, and it's not going to fix the problem at large. We need to get some amendments into this legislation. I look forward to debating this in the committee stage. But I also look forward to having a genuine discussion with both sides of government or both sides of parliament in relation to how we're going to rein in these big billionaires for good. Because far too long they have called the shots. They've absolutely called the shots. We've got to rein in the big tech giants. We've got to protect people's data and their privacy. And we have to make sure that Australians have access to a diversity of public interest news and that it's not just dominated by the wills and the whims and the political agenda of a billionaire in, from his apartment in Manhattan. I look forward to debating the rest of this uh, bill into the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Ferravanti Wells. Thank you, Madam call. Acting Deputy President. I too rise to make a contribution on this bill. Well, last week we saw the worst of behaviour of big tech. Um, it was on show for all to see, and the petulant behaviour of Facebook and what they did last week uh, reinforces for me why this legislation is not only necessary, but that the tough stance that the government has taken in this issue, on this issue uh, is justified. So my constituents in New South Wales were met on Friday uh, in the Daily Telegraph, which is a, a widely read newspaper in, in uh, New South Wales, uh, and which, uh, with headlines such as Face Block, uh, Social Media Giant's News Ban Lays Bear Its Callous Disregard for Australians. It goes on to say, Unfriendly Fire Hits Oz, um, and it looks at the sites that were blocked, which include um, sites of emergency services, support services, um, such as uh, um, you know, helplines, um, charities, um, government agencies were blocked, university research uh, sites, commercial sites, sports sites, retail sites, arts. Uh, and other sites, and there they are um, listed. And indeed, uh, one uh, very interesting um, little headline by James Morrow was, "It's time I zucked off and became anti-social." I wonder whether, uh, after my speech this evening, I too will be um, zucked off by Facebook and my Facebook page deleted. But of course, there is um, the you know concern. Uh, for example, uh, the newspaper also talks about how um, the block uh, by Facebook was shutting the door to child abuse cops uh, and how Facebook would risk hindering probes into underage sex uh, complaints. The editorial on that day uh, was very uh, interesting. It's, it's headed, True Colours Shown and They're All Bad. And it was interesting. Uh, the, uh, it states that um, it summed up the situation very, very well, and it drew an interesting parallel between um, the need for Australians, particularly post-pandemic, um, to look at and examine decoupling from China uh, and the dependence that we have on China, and compared that with, just like China, Australia uh, must now find other ways to connect and be informed online. In other words, um, saying and drawing this parallel, uh, China hit Australia with trade barriers and tariffs. Now Facebook has hit us with indiscriminate page purges, 
purges. So it is a very uh, good uh, analogy, and of course I have been advocating for us to decouple from China, just as I think that the time has come uh, for us to be um, to uh, other players uh, to be involved uh, in this space. Uh, I now look at some detail in relation to this bill. It will establish a world first mandatory code to address the bargaining power imbalances between digital platforms and Australian uh, news businesses. Um, now, we know that consumers are obtaining their news more and more online, and news media businesses are now having to deal with the challenges of finding a viable and sustainable business model um, so that public interest journalism um, can be provided. But at the same time, we do see that digital platforms are thriving with their advertising revenues just growing in leaps and bounds. And under these circumstances, it is totally unacceptable, unacceptable that digital platforms continue to earn revenue from news content, which is created by Australian news media uh, outlets, news businesses, uh, without them being properly remunerated. Now, the ACCC found that this situation has arisen because of the imbalance of this bargaining uh, power uh, between these platforms and between uh, local businesses. And so that's why this code seeks uh, to find a fair and flexible way to deal with this imbalance. Um, it will encourage uh, the parties to um, commercially negotiate uh, outside the code, um, and if uh, there are processes that will be put in place if these negotiations uh, uh, are not uh, successful. And so, it's important to look at uh, bargaining. Uh, it does say good faith uh, bargaining, uh, and um, also uh, there is a process of arbitration in the event that a deal cannot be reached. Uh, the code also provides, importantly, for standard um, codes and, and publishing of standard offers, um, which are ways for those small businesses to avoid cost and time of going to arbitration. Um, now, of course, the code will apply to Facebook and Google uh, at first, but uh, will be expanded uh, in future for uh, other platforms. Um, so there are also substantial pen penalties for breaching uh, the code's provisions. I do turn, uh, as chair of the uh, Senate uh, Standing Committee on uh, uh, delegated, Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I do want to raise a number of scrutiny points uh, which were raised um, by the Scrutiny of Bills uh, Committee. Um, and, uh, again reiterate another, another bill which has got substantial and significant matters that are going to be set out in delegated legislation. This is, of course, of great concern uh, to the committee that I chair because we do continue to see, um, again, another legislative scheme um, which should be included in primary legislation rather than delegated legislation. And this was a concern that was raised by the Senate Standing Committee for the scrutiny uh, of bills. And indeed, um, uh, it um, also raised uh, the question uh, of the power of the minister to make determinations that um, specifies services as designated digital platform services and specifies corporations as designated digital platform corporations. And of course, um, again, this is the sort of thing that should be in the primary legislation rather than being put into delegated uh, legislation. Uh, because, of course, here we have circumstances where rights will be affected and, of course, these are concerns that have been repeatedly raised and, unfortunately, here we have another bill which is likely to fall foul of scrutiny um, uh, and delegated legislation principles. In a recent uh, 
uh, opinion piece uh, by uh, Rachel Raquel Fork, uh, who is the chief executive um, of the Cyber Security Cooperative Research Centre. She makes some very, very valid uh, points. And um, she refers to, and her piece is entitled, Big Tech Has No Claim to Moral High Ground. And she refers to the incident that happened in St Bernardino County Department. Um, and following that, um, a problem emerged in relation to the phones and accessing of encrypted data. And despite the death and the carnage and the desperate search for answers that happened, Apple um, dug, his heels, dug its heels in and wouldn't uh, provide and wouldn't provide the necessary assistance um, to the authorities. Now, of course, recently we've seen um, the banning um, uh, of uh, former President Trump by Twitter and Facebook. Um, now. Ms Falk makes this comment, it is at best, and I want to quote her, it is at best misguided altruism, but is more likely feigned in the name of wokeness. It serves to build a false sense of trust and camaraderie with users when ultimately all these platforms want is their data and their dollars. It is also virtual signalling of the highest order and of the worst kind, the type that has much more to do with the bottom line than the betterment of society, the kind that is worth billions to big tech. Importantly for all people, this must be a wake-up call, because any threat to free speech is a threat to democracy. And by muzzling Trump, these platforms have demonstrated the potential power they wield in designing uh, discourse. She states, and I think it's worth noting this, a very important point, this power is far more immense than that of a government or media mogul. It represents a move away from social media to social engineering, algorithms over informed decision making. There is no moral high ground. And of course, we've seen what happened with Parler. Uh, and, uh, and of course, Parler um, the social uh, network, um, which was very popular uh, amongst conservatives, um, conservative users, it was plunged into internet limbo uh, last uh, uh, recently, um, facing technical complex and a very costly path to getting back uh, online. And Amazon booted the company from its cloud computing services, uh, knocking it offline again. Um, taking the decision of you know what is what we deem uh, you should be uh, reading and you should have access uh, to, uh, and I think that um, this is uh, basically um, I think Silicon Valley is silencing dissent uh, while depriving users of free speech alternative uh, platforms, and there was an article that was. Um, uh, written by uh, spiked uh, online editor Andrew Doyle, and not a fan uh, of uh, former President Trump, but nevertheless he does make some very um, important and very very valid points, and and I'd just like to pick up on some of them that he wrote in this article called "We Ignore Big Tech Censorship at Our Peril." Um, the glee of seeing Trump banned has blind, uh, blinded left-wingers to the threat posed by Silicon Valley. Um, and I quote, the greatest trick of authoritarians is to convince their subjects to rejoice in their own subjugation. Over the past week, we have seen self-proclaimed leftists cheering on multi-billion dollar corporations as they ratchet up their policies on censorship and their determination to control the parameters of acceptable thought and speech. The article also states, big tech censorship is set to be one of the most important issues of our time, and those of us who still care about our liberties are right to be vigilant. Let us consider the misconceptions one by one. The tech giants of Silicon Valley operate a collective uh, oligopoly over the equivalent of the modern day public square. The article goes on to, stay, to say, these kinds of corporate uh, oligopolies are precisely the reason why antitrust legislation exists in an open market economy. 
the way in which the tech giants have coordinated to prevent users from accessing Parler, a rival platform which was established in 2018, demonstrates that they are willing to go to any lengths to ensure that their dominance of the market is absolute. And then, of course, I, I, I would like to conclude my, my comments with what Twitter did in terms of um, banning uh, former President uh, Donald Trump. Um, I thought that was absolutely appalling. I mean, I was actually pleased to see that um, Chancellor Merkel um, was very uh, critical of that as well. And, of course, the hypocrisy of Twitter. They're prepared to leave totalitarian rulers continue to promote their bile and their vile comments, and yet they were prepared to take action in relation to President Trump, but still leave the head of Iran and letting him continue with his um, activities. I mean, particularly calling, as Iran does, for the wholesale eradication of Israel. Now, that's just hypocrisy in the extreme. Now, in relation to, uh, I conclude my remarks um, with some comments that were made by uh, on Spiked Online editor Brendan O'Neill. He, he talks about the unaccountable billionaires in Silicon Valley who switched President Donald Trump off, um, which is cl a clear and grotesque interference in democracy. Um, he refers to um, this as Silicon Valley influences switching off politicians and preventing them from engaging online. People should not underestimate just how serious this is. Thank you, Senator. Senator Griff. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thirty-two years ago, on a cold June day, scientists in Melbourne succeeded in realising a project that had been in the making since the mid-1970s. It started out as idle speculation, but interest grew over the years as the possibilities became clear and obstacles were overcome. By the late 1980s, the project secured enough support and funding for it to become a reality. So on that June morning in 1989, a computer at the University of Melbourne established a connection to a NASA satellite, which in turn connected to a computer at the University of Hawaii. Australia had joined the internet. In the months that followed, the connection was upgraded and more universities were brought in. The Australian Research Council and the CSIRO both contributed funding. And before the year was out, our first internet service providers were established, allowing businesses and individuals to connect to the internet in their own right. Since then, the internet has transformed our society, our economy, and the way that we live. But one effect is already clear. The internet can enable much greater competition in some markets, but greater concentration in others. Market concentration is already one of the most difficult and enduring economic policy issues in this country. A small, a small number of large corporations dominate many of our markets. The big four banks, the supermarkets, the airlines, electricity, gas and fuel. Concentration allows each to exercise market power, power they would not possess in a truly competitive market. Power they can use to exploit their stakeholders. Suppliers are often squeezed to the point of bankruptcy, as our dairy farmers can attest. Employees are required to work harder without the wage rises they deserve, as many workers will tell you. Customers pay do top dollar for often mediocre service and mediocre products, as anyone with an electricity bill will know. And governments are squeezed to provide a favourable regulatory and tax setting. The winners from market power are corporate executives and shareholders. We are now approaching the 30th anniversary of the national competition policy, but we have not made enough progress towards a truly competitive Australian economy. We still have an economy that suffers from too little competition, 
too little innovation and too little market reform. For all the benefits the internet has brought and will continue to bring to Australia, it can also cause harm through increased concentration. We must act now to intervene, to regulate, to prevent increasing concentration of market power before it is too late. The default structure for tech is a natural monopoly, a winner-takes-all market that Google, for example, enjoys with search and Facebook enjoys with its social network. <coughs> Unlike past monopolies, these businesses don't squeeze consumers into paying top dollars for their services. They use their market power in a different way. They compel users to give up their privacy. That's the price the public pays for Google and Facebook services, giving up your privacy. Business pays in other ways, and news media has paid most dearly. Their content has been stolen and reused by digital platforms who earn advertising revenue from the content but pay little, if any, compensation to the news publishers. Publishers have been unable to challenge this practice out of fear that they would be cut off from Google or Facebook, risking their entire business. This was happening while the rivers of gold were drying up with publishers, and many of them were struggling to survive. The last decade has been one of consolidation as news publishers merged and closed and embarked on waves of redundancies. To give publishers the best chance for survival, the Turnbull government introduced media reforms in 2017. In retrospect, that bill should also have dealt with the unethical practices of some digital platforms. But at the time, there was a belief publishers could reach a fair deal with the platforms. Sadly, that wasn't the case. The negotiations on that bill were very intense with my colleague Nick Xenophon primarily seeking support for civic journalism, particularly to help smaller media entities transition to the digital environment, and I focused on securing what became the ACCC's digital platforms inquiry. We were successful in putting the case to government, and I'm glad that that inquiry has led to this bill, the News Media Bargaining Code. Despite all the hyperbole and the grandstanding, this bill is really a very routine piece of legislation. It simply provides that a platform and a publisher can enter into arbitration if they can't reach a deal. It's not rocket science. That's all it is. Neither party is forced to participate. If a publisher or platform don't want to do a deal with each other, they are not obligated to do so. The code only applies when both sides want a deal, but they cannot come to an agreement. Both sides want a deal, but they cannot come to an agreement. The arbitration process will remedy the problem of platforms delaying negotiations and squeezing suppliers of news content. It does so by creating a pathway for a rapid fair outcome, one which considers the benefits that each side receives from the deal and the costs that they incur. The legislation is routine, even, I dare say, mundane. But you would never know this if you focused on the extraordinary reactions from the platforms. Google's threat to quit Australia and Facebook's decision to deny service to thousands of Australian news providers and government pages were a massive and very pathetic overreach. These stunts demonstrated that tech companies believe they can intimidate democratic governments and secure favourable outcomes. But they have spectacularly backfired. Google's threat to leave Australia lost them any parliamentary goodwill they may have enjoyed. And Facebook's decision to block pages like the Bureau of Meteorology, state health agencies and local community groups lost them any public sympathy. Going rogue has demonstrated to Australians that there is an urgent need to regulate digital platforms. This is why I am also moving an amendment that forces designated platforms to disclose their user data practices. They will have to publish what types of data they collect, what data that they make available to other businesses or foreign governments, and how users can opt out of having their private data harvested. 
Transparency alone will not change their behaviour, but it will mean users are better informed about the practices of digital platforms and it will foster a debate about what practices are appropriate. It is a vital step in developing a regulatory framework that controls digital platforms and forces them to comply with community standards and, importantly, expectations. This bill and my amendment are temporary measures. As the internet and digital technologies evolve, the policy challenges and opportunities will also evolve. The important thing today is to lay the foundations for future regulation. There will be occasions when tech companies engage in behaviour that is unfair, unethical or dishonest. When they do, it is entirely appropriate for government to intervene. There is nothing special about tech that allows them to do as they please. But the longer we wait to create a framework for regulating platforms, the harder it will be to hold them to account. So we must start work today, work to build a framework that protects Australians and their privacy and ensures tech companies act fairly, ethically and honestly. Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to address the Senate on the question of the media uh, bargaining code bill. Um, I mean, I must start this contribution by reflecting upon where this legislation fits into the liberal tradition in Australia. And uh, we have always been a party that has supported markets, that has believed that markets ultimately deliver better lives. But we have been prepared in the past to intervene where there has been market failure or in the public interest. And this is something that I reflected upon in my first speech in this place some 18 months ago. And I quoted then at the time Theodore Roosevelt, who spoke about his own philosophy of intervening in the coal strike of 1902, not on the interests or not for the basis of labour or for capital, but in the public interest. And Roosevelt said at the time, now I believe in rich people who act squarely and in labour unions who are managed with wisdom and justice. But when either employee or employer, labouring man or capitalist goes wrong, I have to clinch him. And that's all there is to it. And that is exactly the philosophy that we take as liberals in Australian liberalism. And that is a feature of this bill. Because we have come to the view that big tech companies uh, are a threat to our liberal democracy, that they have an inordinate amount of power over our society and over our economy. They are the railroads and indeed the, um, the, they are the monopolists of the 21st century. Big tech is lightly regulated when you compare that to the sort of regulatory burden that would face a telecommunications company or an energy provider, or indeed a bank. And so we have made a judgment based on evidence that there has been market failure which has led to the drying up of money for public interest journalism. Uh, and the simple example here is, and I make this point as someone who used to work at SPC on the tomato line, that you wouldn't go into a shop and steal a can of tomatoes and give it away for free, which is effectively the deal you see when tech platforms appropriate in some form journalist products and then give them away for free and thereby collecting advertising revenue on that basis. Now, the ACCC undertook a landmark report into digital platforms in this country where they found that of each $100 of uh, online advertising in Australia, $50 of which went to Google, 28 to Facebook. So these laws are often known as the Google and Facebook laws. And the way that these laws will operate, as I'll step through in a moment, will, will be, they will see the designation of Facebook and Google 
as the initial two cabs off the rank. But this is not about trying to retrofit uh, changing market dynamics. It's not trying to engineer the economy. It's simply saying that where there is journalism produced and it is appropriated and given away for nothing, that should not happen. There should be a financial transaction between the media company that is creating the journalism and the tech platform which is using it to derive revenue. It's not about going back into time and regenerating or rebirthing Video Easy. Uh, this is about crossing the Rubicon and providing a limited set of regulation around big tech companies in Australia. Now, this is the this is the um, this is the beginning. This may be the end, but it's uh, hopefully closer to the beginning of my parliamentary career. Now, I imagine that over the course of that career, you will only see more regulation in the big tech landscape, because these organisations are effectively utilities. They are essential services that people in our country rely upon. And as we've seen in this very week, people rely upon these institutions, these, these market-based institutions, to access information. And so, just as we regulate telecommunications companies and banks and energy companies, we should always look at utilities through a prism of competitive neutrality. Now, of course, we are not the only liberal democracy which is grappling with the challenges that public journalism face today as a result of big tech appropriation of their property. Now, in France, which I think has been the, the first mover alongside Australia here, just two weeks ago Google announced that they would be uh, paying French publishers almost $100 million for content. Now, in the European Union and in France, they are using copyright law. And we have chosen to go down the path of using competition law in Australia. And as people are aware, the world is watching how we progress with these reforms. And this bill is based on bringing the parties to the table. That's what it does. It brings the parties to the table. It designates a power to the treasurer, which he can apply, he or she can apply, to organisations which are designated to be uh, these big tech organisations. So Google and Facebook are the first two. Now, over the past few weeks, there have been many threats. All sorts of things have been said. Only a month ago, it was said that these laws will break the internet. But in the past few weeks, we've started to see deals being done in Australia by Google with news outfits. And I have to give credit where credit's due. Google is doing the right thing. I can't say the same for Facebook, which in the last week has gone rogue and has decided that it would use its immense market power uh, in a petulant way to switch off not just news information but community-based information, health information, charitable information. For what purpose? Just to demonstrate its immense market power. Facebook going rogue and removing genuine news content from its platform has left it as the home of fake news and cat photos. And that is, and that is not surprising to me because Facebook's performance at the Senate Economics Legislation Committee was nothing short of petulant. Um, and I was disappointed that they couldn't put forward their Australian-based head. Now, there may have been a reason for that, I don't know, but it reminded me very much of uh, Rio Tinto's ham-fisted management of the destruction of the Duke on Gorge, where they eff effectively said that there are people in London trying to manage relations on the ground with the PKP people. Um, I mean, you've got to be serious. I mean, this is a. I mean, for the head of and the founder of Facebook, Mr. Zuckerberg, to be engaged with the Treasurer now on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, seven calls on the weekend or whatever it was, but then they couldn't put forward their Australian based head to come and address the Australian Senate when it was considering this detailed legislation. I think it was a, a very disappointing showing from Facebook, and I'm not surprised that they have carried out these ridiculous 
uh, threats, in effect, over the last week, which of course they've had to wind back. Um, and I understand that in most cases the charities, community-based information has now been restored. But of course the news has not been, and that's okay. That is okay. If Facebook doesn't want to have news on its platform, fine. People will go to apps, people will go directly to websites. I mean, the Australian government spends a billion dollars each year providing news to Australians in the form of the ABC. Now, I'm a supporter of the ABC. There are mixed views about the ABC in this chamber. I'm a big supporter of it. I think it can always do better. I think the ABC um, has had issues in the past with bias, uh, but I very much have to pay credit to Mr David Anderson, the Managing Director of the ABC, who in the past week has said that the employees of the ABC, i.e. the working journalists, should not bring the ABC into disrepute by making political statements. And that is, that is a very good point, and that is something that he has taken from the BBC's Director General, who has taken BBC journalists off Twitter when they have made partisan statements, because it, it would be a ridiculous position for the taxpayers to be funding partisan material. Uh, but, we, but the reality is we do spend $1 billion each year on the ABC. There is good news available there. There is good news available at News and Sky and The Guardian. And so if there's no news on Facebook, big deal. That's fine. The uh, caravan will roll on and the dogs will bark. Now, we are better placed now than we were a month ago when these hearings were being conducted. Uh, Google was saying that the, the, the changes would break the internet and they were advertising directly to their millions and millions of people who use the website every single day. But now they're, now they're doing the deal. So it really worries me, and this is coming from someone that believes strongly in the, in the value of markets and the utility of corporations, when these organisations are going around and saying the internet's going to be broken but now we're going to do a deal. And then now you've got Facebook saying, you know, the world's going to end. So it really worries me. And I don't think we should resolve in any way from being prepared to put more regulation onto these organisations uh, because they are lightly regulated for what they do. And they don't, they don't face capital requirements, minimum service standards, they're not licensed, but yet they have so much information. They wield so much power. And, you know, and I have to uh, reflect uh, again that some of the best work that's done in this parliament is done through the, the committee system and there was a strong sense on all sides when this legislation was being reviewed that this was a bill that was doing an important thing for our country and we may not agree with every last component part of it but we all agree with the thrust of the changes and that they are inevitable. Now, there are some technical amendments that have been circulated by the minister as part of this bill, uh, changes that have been requested, I think, in large part by the tech companies, which we are, as a government, happy to accommodate. And these go to changes in relation to algorithms and the way that arbitration will work. But at the end of the day, Madam Act Acting Deputy President, I, I come back to this point about the tin of fruit. I mean, you don't go into a shop and steal a tin of fruit and give it away for free. And this is the principle that is at stake here. Yes, it's complicated. Yes, it can be difficult. Yes, there's lots of uh, lies and there's lots of uh, threats. But that is the principle at stake. Giving away public interest journalism and putting that at risk is a price that we can't afford to pay in a liberal democracy which relies upon having that institution maintained. Now, Facebook again, in their overreach, I think have reminded us all of the immense market power this organisation has. Now, um, this is just a start. My view is that the big tech companies need to do a lot better at self-regulating themselves. And if they don't, then we will be prepared to regulate more. Now, they are engaging in censorship. They have become publishers. I have always thought that they are, they are, they are publishers because they decide who gets to use their platforms. They decide who gets to be published on their platforms. They have decided to take people, public figures off their platforms in recent months. 
They have decided to edit the news. They have decided to turn off pages for community events and for charities. They, they are the masters of their own domain. They are publishers, and they are sitting on a cesspool of defamatory material and material which drives incitement. In my own state of New South Wales, we have state laws which prohibit incitement. But you can look onto Facebook and you will find any number of posts which would offend those laws. So I think it is wrong, very wrong, that these big tech companies are allowed to get away with breaking our laws. Uh, I'm positive that this particular issue that we're trying to solve here, which is to ensure that there is a level playing field so that media companies who commission public interest journalism can be paid, is, a, is going to pass this parliament. That will be an important step. But it is a start. We need to come back and look at the conduct of these organisations in terms of the way that they maintain content which is defamatory or driving uh, incitement material. That is very important. It's, a, it's an argument for the ages, but I again start or remind the chamber that this is a bill that is consistent with the, the foundational strand of Australian liberalism that we will always act in the public interest and we are prepared to come after you no matter who you are. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The Treasury Laws Amendment, New Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bargaining Code, Bill 2020, is a masterclass in self-interest. A masterclass in self-interest from both the tight old parties. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, my view is that this bill should more rightly be called the getting the news media on side before the next election bill. It's apparently co-sponsored by every party in this place that seeks to replace data-based policy, fact-based policy, with cynical political expediency and public gutlessness. The government has no place getting involved in a fight between the billionaires in legacy media and the billionaires in new media. Yet it looks like that is exactly what our parliament is doing. One Nation spoke with Google, and we spoke with them again this morning. And it seems now that this matter has been resolved in private meetings with the government, where assurances were exchanged. So Australia is now governed behind closed doors, and the People's House, the House of Review, the Senate, is simply here to rubber stamp what is put in front of us. One Nation does not own a rubber stamp. Our many reservations about this bill remain, even if Google has found a way to work with them. It's true that there are no clean hands in this debate. When Facebook banned conservatives last year, the left, or the controlled side of politics, applauded the move as the legitimate actions of a private company. Left or right, they're, usually, they're really useless terms. Really, it's control versus freedom. But the left likes to control. Yet when Facebook banned Australia's left-wing news media last week, there was outrage. They're a public utility. They can't do this to us, shrieked the left-wing commentariat. Perhaps Facebook got the idea of deplatforming from Channel 7 and Channel 9, who deplatformed Senator Hanson last year. Conservatives must now deal with the political left and with a left-wing media that is so convinced of their own moral superiority that the suppression of dissenting opinions is now celebrated. The left, the control side, have clearly not considered the norms they have created to destroy their opponents and that those same norms could one day be used against themselves. Now, Google is right on board with this agenda demoting conservative websites in Google search results simply for advocating values that everyday Australians still share and value. YouTube has cancelled thousands of conservative channels and demonetised many more to suppress our voice. Google has decided that conservatives and patriots are the enemy of their brave new world and must be silenced. Google propaganda is clearly on display in image search where they operate to portray our world not as it is, but as they wish it to be. 
and as they judge that it should be. That is not their job. It's no surprise then that many Australians, especially on the conservative side, have left Facebook and Google had it coming. Let me be clear. One Nation is a trenchant critic of the Orwellian nightmare social media has become. Our left-wing legacy news media, though, are no better. Some sections of the left-wing legacy media print very little material that could be described as journalism and a great deal of material that could be described as propaganda. The ABC spent two years conspiring with a foreign power to prepare a story that misled viewers as to the intent of One Nation's visit to the United States. We demanded the raw footage from the ABC to prove the story was manipulated, and the ABC refused. Truth and honesty are strangers to left-wing control media in this country. One Nation is concerned about the small businesses this bill will hurt. Just one example of the small businesses, businesses like the Glasshouse Country News and the Kundruk Barham Bridge newspaper. Small businesses that are resisting the takeover of country news by the media oligarchs and by printing truth without fear or favour. These papers are not protected by this bill, which is only concerned about protecting large media organisations who will receive extra money to continue their buy-up of country news. The National Party seems to be happy with this, once again turning their backs on their rural constituents to woo, woo over the urban bubble, marching to the Liberal wets. Australian Associated Press, AAP, as most people would know it, is not protected by this bill, since their model is copyright-based and this bill only concerns itself with financial outcomes. AAP, though, employs 80 staff and their news feed supports 250 rural news organisations. The increased revenue from Google will remain with the legacy media services and not feed back to AAP. Now, this might have something to do with the Murdoch News Media's new wire service, NCA News, which is just waiting for AAP to fall over so they can have a monopoly on Newswire too. This will lead to a further consolidation of news ownership in Australia and more power yet more power to News Corp. Labor are supporting a process that leads to more power for Rupert Murdoch. Kevin Rudd will be upset, won't he? When the Batita advocate sounds more like a real news site than an actual real news site, Australian media must accept they are the agents of their own demise. Television. Television is also on the nose. The highest rating program on television since the Sydney Olympics was the Australian Open final back in way back in, 20, in 2005, attracting 4.3 million viewers. The MasterChef final in 2010 rated 4.1 million. In 2020, the MasterChef final rated just 1.6 million, 60 per cent less. Tent pole programming is attracting half the audience it used to, despite Australia's growing population. Now, when Malcolm Turnbull destroyed community TV 10 years ago, it was to force their million-strong audience back to commercial TV. And that strategy has been a complete failure and must be unwound. Print newspaper circulations are also falling. So over the last 10 years, look at these figures. The Herald Sun is down from 550 to 303,000. 45 per cent fall. One Nation's great friends at the Brisbane Courier Mail who bash us are down from 211,000 to 135,000, a 36 per cent fall. And wait for it, the Sydney Morning Herald is down from 210,000 to just 78,000. That's a 63 per cent collapse. With a lower audience, our conglomerate media companies are in search of more revenue and now want to take Google's. Is this the business of the Senate? This bill demonstrates a complete failure to understand how the internet works. So let me give you an example. A startup media company trying to establish a user base would submit their news stories to Google. And in return, Google will pay so much per click for every person that clicks through. Sorry, in return, that company, that startup, will pay Google so much per click for every person that clicks through to the startup news site. 
New stories cost between 20 cents and 50 cents a click in the Google advertising network. Now, over the last 20 years, Google has sent 7 billion visitors to Australian news sites, who in turn have used this traffic to monetize by showing advertising and encouraging subscriptions. If the Australian news media were paying for their traffic from Google, this bill would run into billions. Billions. This relationship, though, benefits both parties equally. So the basic assumption of the bill, that there is a power imbalance, is simply wrong. It is false. Legacy media could have opted out at any time simply by adding a meta tag to their header advising Google and other search engine crawlers to not index a page, section or an entire site. News sites are not using that meta tag. They're not using that meta tag, even though they could because they want Google to index their stories in order to send them more traffic. Rather than paying Google for that traffic, legacy media now wants Google to pay them. We're only having this fight now because internet search has reached the top of the exponential growth curve. The market has reached maturity, as has digital advertising and online subscriptions. The $18 billion advertising industry is now equally split between digital and real world, with little opportunity for significant growth in a post-COVID economy. To read this bill, one would think that real world advertising and digital advertising are interchangeable. That's nonsense. They're not. Online advertising is suited to short messages. Legacy media is, sh is still king of longer format advertising. For over 200 minutes of advertising consumed online, 300 minutes is consumed in the real world. Both have their role in the economy. Now, as with any maturing market, Australian media has narrowed ownership so much it has effectively become a cartel. This bill represents nothing more than the billionaires in the media cartel thinking they have power, more power than the billionaires in the social media cartel. And with an election looming, the government has decided to pick a side. Because Mr Murdoch picks sides and decides who wins. That is the history of elections in federal parliament in Australia. The Liberal Nationals want that, and Labor can't afford, them, can't afford to let them have it. So that is a terrible basis upon which to formulate public policy and legislation. The Treasury Laws Amendment, News Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bargaining Code Bill 2020 is a solution in search of a problem and should never have come before the Senate. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And uh, can I just uh, thank you, um, Senator Roberts, for your courtesy in allowing us to, to, to alter the order here this evening. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak on this very important bill today. I've received much correspondence on it, and it's one that is going to have dramatic implications if it is passed. I speak, of course, of the Treasury Laws Amendment, News, Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bargaining Code Bill of 2021. And I want to say at the outset that I support adequate regulation of big tech platforms. That's needed for accurate information to flow through our democracy. The swift rise to global dominance of the internet and social media industry now can be compared to the introduction of the printing press in the 15th century. Australians growing up today have never had so much information at their fingertips, but with less confidence about where it comes from. As traditional news has withered, particularly local and regional news, fake news and clickbait has metastasised with often terrible consequences. We saw the horrifying effects of Trump's big lie about the 2020 election with the Capitol riot, the domestic terrorism sponsored by the proliferation of the deranged QAnon theory and online message boards, an incitement of religious and ethnic violence in Myanmar and Sri Lanka prompted by incendiary and false social media posts. As we saw in the course of the pandemic, even basic facts about the virus and simple measures such as wearing masks became political and debated facts. Debunked cures such as hydroxychloroquine 
and ivermectin were pro promoted in the face of scientific evidence and the wearing of simple cloth masks was called child abuse. Almost all my colleagues in this place would recognise this is an untenable situation. We cannot continue to let lies spread across the search and social media platforms. We cannot continue to watch public interest, local and regional journalism decline. Yet this bill is so threatening to Facebook that Facebook has threatened to take its toys and go home at the slightest threat of regulation. Although the Liberal government has completely botched their consultation process for this bill, I'm deeply troubled at the sight of a tech giant actively censoring its platform in a display of raw power. If the government folds on this bill, it would be a signal to other digital platforms that they can run roughshod over the Australian people with impunity and that they're above government regulation. And I urge the government to fix this matter as a matter of urgency, which brings us to the bill that the Chamber has before us today. This particular bill aims to introduce a mandatory code that would provide a framework and penalty system to address the bargaining imbalances between digital platforms and Australian news media. While this bill actively encourages agreements to be made outside of the code, it does establish minimum standard obligations for all minimum business registered under the code, requirements for good faith bargaining and the application of final offer arbitration if initial bargaining between the parties doesn't succeed. I note that Seven West Media has now signed a deal with Google worth more than $30 million a year, and that was before the bill has even passed. Now, I do welcome this announcement and I hope that Google and Facebook accept regulation and their obligations to host countries to negotiate in good faith. This structure has proved successful for the Dairy Code and it should indeed be implemented across other sectors particularly the car dealer industry and the franchising sector. We need to ensure that all Australian businesses and business owners have the opportunity to negotiate on a level playing field with vast multinational corporations. This bill is three years in the making, and I thank all the hardworking staff at the ACCC for their exhaustive work in drafting the code. I also support the planned review after a year. A piece of legislation, this major and one of the first in its field internationally, needs to be reviewed constantly to ensure that the intended purpose is being achieved and that unintended consequences can be dealt with swiftly. This code is not the final answer, nor is it the final saviour of public interest journalism. This government has overseen the rapid consolidation of most journalism in this country into the hands of two men, Rupert Murdoch and Kerry Stokes. And they did that by the abolition of the long-standing protection for public interest journalism that was embedded in the two-thirds rule and the reach rule. Australia has now, as a consequence of this government's action, one of the most concentrated media markets in the entire world and that this already restricts choice for Australian consumers is simply a fact. Regional news media continues to decline and was almost wiped out by the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic downturn that has ensued. Historic papers such as the Barrier Daily Truth out at Broken Hill were brought to the brink and over 100 print newspapers actually closed their doors in 2020. The Australian Communications and Media Authority, ACMA, has confirmed that media diversity in regional and remote areas is already at or below the minimum number of voices in 68 per cent of licence areas. The ACCC also noted that between 2008 and 2018, 106 local and regional newspaper titles closed, a 15 per cent decrease across all areas, and that was even before COVID hit. This leaves 21 local government areas without any kind of newspaper. 21 broad communities across this country without a local newspaper. 
This regional media decline has serious implications for democracy on a local level. It erodes the accountability of regional councillors to their electors. It erases the proud identities of many local towns and regions, and it further cuts off many First Nation committees from, uh, communities from local voices. The bill will ensure that media organisations have more money and more revenue from ad services, but it does not guarantee that that money will be spent on public interest journalism and on regional newspapers. I note that the Nick Xenophon team negotiated in this place a 60.4 million package for regional media in 2017, and they did that as a deal for their support in watering down our media laws. And as a consequence of that, since that deal by Nick Xenophon, over 200 regional newspapers have gone under. And I can remember being in this very place that night and predicting exactly that outcome. It was poo pooed by the government, and uh, Senator Xenophon, as I recall, had to explain the deal that he'd done because the government had done it so swiftly they didn't even know what they'd agreed to. But the consequences are real. And I shudder to think what the media landscape will look like when Scott Morrison pulls JobKeeper on March 31st. This bill is but one of a suite of measures that the ACCC recommended in its August 2019 report entitled Final Report of the Digital Platforms Inquiry to ensure the sustainability and future of public interest journalism. It recommends media reform, stable funding for broadcasters, tax incentives and philanthropy measures, among other important initiatives that could help to stop our hemorrhaging media landscape. This bill sets out six main elements to establish a mandatory code of conduct. Bargaining, which requires the responsible digital platform corporations and registered news business corporations that have indicated an intention to bargain to do so in good faith. Secondly, compulsory arbitration, where parties cannot come to a negotiated agreement about remuneration relating to the, the making available of covered news content on designated digital platform services, an arbitral panel will select between two final offers made by the bargaining parties. That is an important way to resolve power differentials in the community interest. General requirements which, among other things, require responsible digital platform corporations to provide registered news business corporations with advanced notification of planned changes to an algorithm or internal practice that will have a significant effect on covered news content. Non-differentiation requirements. Responsible digital platform corporations must not differentiate between the news practices, business, sorry, the news businesses participating in the code, or between participants and non-participants because of matters that arise in relation to their participation or their non-participation in the code. Contracting out, the bill recognises that a digital platform corporation may reach a commercial bargain with a news business outside the code about remuneration or other matters. It provides that parties who, would, who notify the ACCC of such agreements would not need to comply with the general requirements, bargaining and compulsory arbitration rules as set out in the agreement. And standard offers. Digital platform corporations may make standard offers to news businesses which are intended to reduce the time and cost associated with negotiations, particularly for smaller news businesses. If the parties notify the ACCC of an agreed standard offer, those parties do not need to comply. However, despite all that, I am very troubled by certain aspects of this bill. I am concerned that during the Senate Economics Committee inquiry into this bill, concerns were raised about the use of delegated legislation to confer upon the Treasurer a range of powers, including the right to designate designated digital platform services and designated digital platform corporations, without relevant parliamentary scrutiny. And this move for delegated legislation, giving all the power to one person, in this case the Treasurer, and taking away the scrutiny of this place, the Australian people's place, where they send us here to stand up for them, is just a signature move by this government. It's a concentration of power. And I know that within the ranks of both our, my great party, the Labor Party, and also the Liberal National Party, there are great concerns about the erosion of the democratic traditions that underpin good governance in this country. 
Prime Minister doesn't seem worried about it, and it seems the Treasurer loves getting this delegated legislation. So maybe they're the two culprits who need to be accountable. The Committee for Scrutiny of Bills labelled the clauses that I'm talking about akin to Henry VIII clauses, which authorised delegated legislation to make substantive amendments to primary legislation. Despite writing to the Treasurer with these concerns, they were ignored by Treasurer Frydenberg. Labor supports the bill because it attempts to arrest the free fall that public interest journalism has found itself in since the rapid expansion of the internet. However, I note the appalling rollout of the legislation that resulted in Facebook erasing news media from their platform in a stunning slap in the face to the Australian people. For this reason, Labor recommends that the government use precise language in public statements regarding what designations it intends to make under the code. This is in order to save any misunderstanding or unnecessary uncertainty for the media, digital platforms, small businesses and citizens and consumers who may be impacted. You don't have to look too far back in this place to what happened when Senator Xenophon did a deal behind closed doors without adequate scrutiny to see this government setting in train the demise of regional newspapers, the loss of the capacity to tell the stories of local communities, the terrible impact of the loss of jobs in those communities, the dislocation of families. Maybe mum was working on the local newspaper and dad might have been the local doctor. All of that eroded by a government that doesn't like the clear light of day wants to do deals in the dark, wants to do it behind closed doors, wants to get legislation through here, but give itself power to just pull a little bit out and do a deal on the side. That's not good government. And the cost to Australia in the digital media, in the, in the media sector, has been the loss of a voice in local communities. And once these things go, Acting Deputy President, you can't get them back. It's hard to build something. But this government is really, really good at breaking things. And we are seeing the consequences of that in regional communities right across this country. Labor supports the bill because it does give local media organisations the appropriate carrots and sticks to do some bargaining with these large digital platforms. The legislation is a world first, and I hope it provides momentum to other movers to effectively regulate tech giants. We must ride over the waves of their petulance and pass legislation that's in the public interest. And I urge all members to support this bill. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. In a 1999 BBC interview, David Bowie told the sceptical Pax, uh, Jeremy Paxman, I don't even think we've seen the tip of the iceberg. I think the potential of what the internet is going to do to society, both good and bad, is unimaginable. When Paxman retorts that the internet is merely a tool, Bowie expresses his belief that it is going to crush our ideas of what mediums are all about. The structure of the public sphere has been so much changed by the internet that it can only be accurately compared to the invention of the printing press and the print revolution that followed. The print revolution completely changed the structure of public life increasing the volume of content and making it much more accessible. This same phenomenon is happening again with the internet, but at a much faster pace, and we are struggling to keep up with all of the consequences. One of these consequences is the effect on news media. As the internet has exploded in the last 20 years, it has completely changed how and where people get their news. Most people now read their news online rather than in print, with print advertising having fallen by 75 per cent since 2005. At the same time, online advertising has increased eightfold, and so news media has adapted and moved online through websites and apps. However, the way people will come to this news is through big tech platforms like Facebook and Google. And because of the nature of the internet and how it has evolved, these digital platforms dominate the online advertising market. They do this by using a model where users are individually targeted 
based on large amounts of data that correspond to their likes, search it, searches, purchasing, <coughs> browsing and so on. With this in mind, most advertising dollars are getting snapped up by big tech rather than the news companies, with Facebook and Google collecting a whopping 81 per cent of online advertising. This means that news media outlets have lost a major revenue stream, and it makes it hard for them to stay afloat in the digital age. This isn't just bad for these news businesses. It's bad for consumers. Having a healthy and robust landscape of public interest journalism is vital for a democracy to work. We need journalism that will hold government accountable and keep the public informed in an unbiased manner. Therefore, it's important that we pass laws that will protect journalism from unfair, cartel-like business practices, which is what we are seeing with Facebook and Google, having built for themselves a dominant position in the advertising market. It is unfair because digital platforms are profiting off the content that Australian news outlets create. When someone clicks a news link in Google, most of that ad revenue ends up with Google and not the news site. Yes, platforms help drive traffic to these news sites, but news is what draws and keeps a lot of people on the platforms. This is a symbiotic relationship in which both participants benefit, but it is also one where the platforms hold all the power and are getting all the profit. This is what this bill aims to rectify. This bill will make social media giants pay news companies for their content. These businesses put all the work into producing articles and news content, and they should be appropriately compensated for it. Digital platforms have become the trading partners of news media, whether they like it or not, due to the way advertising works on the internet. And trading partners will usually strike deals as to the terms of their trade. <clears throat> What's happening now is that there is a power imbalance in the negotiation because the platforms hold all the advertising dollars. What this bill does is establish a mandatory bargaining code which corrects the bargaining power imbalance. Now when a news company is in negotiation with big tech and are offered a deal that they are unhappy with, they can trigger the code to come into effect. If the two sides cannot come to an agreement by themselves, then the code will require both sides to come to the table and negotiate in good faith. The code also establishes minimum standards that must be met for the, the negotiations and, important, importantly, a final arbitration process. If the two sides can't come to an agreement after three months, then both sides will each submit their own deal to a panel of ind independent arbiters who will choose the one they believe to be fairer. This way, the government doesn't get in involved with or set the terms of the deal, but they incentivise businesses to strike a deal themselves or force them to come to the table. The code of conduct simply ensures that the deal actually happens and in a fair and timely manner. The coalition government is doing its job of regulating business when it needs to and breaking up the monopoly power that the tech giants have gained because of their control of advertising revenue. While the platforms will have to pay the news companies for their content, the bill has made concessions to big tech by acknowledging the value they bring to the relationship. This value comes from giving news content greater reach and circulation, which arbiters must take into consideration in their final decision. This is considered along with the arguably greater value of the creation of original news content and the work that goes into its journalistic process. It's a symbolic relationship that digital platforms and news media have, and this bill will ensure that it's a mutually beneficial one rather than parasitic. As well as the unfair market power that Google and Facebook have gained, 
They have also become the gatekeepers of how we access most of our news, and this has given them a power over the public arena that is concerning. Over a third of Australians get their news from Facebook, and many others find the latest headlines through Google, either by searching or by having articles recommended to them. Their algorithms govern what news gets promoted and what gets suppressed. During the drafting of this bill, we saw them threaten Australians by threatening to take news off their sites altogether. We won't be bullied. There is far too much power resting in the hands of a few giant companies, and their effect on news and its circulation is just one aspect of it. We saw them abuse this power just recently as every major platform banned the then sitting President of the United States before, during and after the recent US presidential elections, a move that amounted to nothing more than censorship. In a dictatorship, it's the dictator who does the censoring, and the actions of the media, giant, media giants reflect this. Digital platforms should not have control over who can and cannot speak especially when it comes to democratically elected public officials. Though they are private companies, their platforms have become the new public square where politics and business are done and where news is published. Global corporations just continue to get larger and more powerful, and they use that power to shape society. This is a very dangerous trend. Because in the Western world, many of the checks and balances the governments are subject to do not apply to corporations. Just as when any new resource or technology becomes big, it's the government's job to step in and regulate the space, and it's high time we started holding these companies to account. These companies must come under the same scrutiny and regulation that traditional media has over the years as our world evolves in a new direction. This bill will be, important, will be an important regulating factor in keeping these tech giants in check by forcing them to pay their fair share for their content and also by requiring them to inform the news companies of any algorithm changes that are likely to have a significant effect on their website traffic. With how quickly the internet has evolved, we're still, still figuring out when to regulate it, how to properly regulate it and how it fits into greater society. Where the internet was once the Wild West, big tech companies have become powerful oil barons controlling the land and it's time for the government to step in and break up the monopolies. Having a mandatory bargaining code will set an important precedent for other nations to start regulating these digital platforms when it comes to news media breaking up the market power they have over news dis distribution. Another area that we should seriously consider as well is whether or not people who actually set up accounts on these social media sites actually use their real name rather than anonymous av uh, avatars where they proceed to then go on and often bully. Uh, other commentators if they don't agree with their point of view. This type of behaviour wouldn't happen in real life. Some of the comments that were made on social media were said face to face in a pub. It's highly likely you'd walk out um, in a, a, a vertical position. Yet on social media, people seem to get away with the most heinous insults uh, with very little respect uh, to those posting other comments. Uh, you know, we get plenty of this in the political space, but the real concern for me uh, is for our children uh, going forward and the psychological effect it must have on them uh, when they're being bullied uh, relentlessly on social media. And I know we've had some tragic cases here in Australia of what's going on there, but I would like to see further controls on social media giants in this space because there's a decorum uh, on social media that, quite frankly, uh, is a cesspit. It's a gutter and it needs to stop. And if Facebook and these other uh, media giants aren't going to uh, uh, demand that people use their true identities, uh, then it's about to, or you know, if it's a corporation or if it's an organisation, they have to be you know fully transparent. I mean, democracy is based on transparency and accountability. Yet it is very difficult to hold people accountable 
for often uh, abusive or defamatory comments uh, when they hide behind avatars. And sure, I mean you can go and uh, take out a legal case, I guess, but a lot of people don't have the money or the time or inclination to try and track down who the anonymous people are behind the bullying on these social media giants. Another area where we need to crack down on these social media giants is their ability to transfer profits offshore uh, or even keep the profits offshore. If you look at the uh, Google special purpose accounts uh, issued in 2019, they paid three and a half billion dollars in service fees to offshore, well, to related parties. Uh, now, where that money went, uh, I have no idea, but I do know where the problem lies, and it's in Accounting Standard AASB 24, which relates to related party transactions. And effectively, uh, there's a distinction in Australia between the type of accounting reports that you have to release. If you're an Australian entity and you're a big organisation. You have to do general purpose reporting and you have to disclose a lot more information. But if you're a big tech or a big foreign company uh, and you can wrangle your way out of having a public interest test here, you only have to do special purpose reporting. And that special uh, purpose reporting requires a lot less disclosure and hence it becomes a lot easier, not just for digital multinationals but all multinationals to hide their related party transactions. <coughs> and yes, uh, the tax office can go after these guys, but it is very difficult for the tax office to go after every multinational that's been set up in Australia. But I think if every multinational was required to give much greater disclosure of related party transactions, uh, I think you'd find that you know, there'd be uh, vigilant anti-protectionists and patriots themselves who'd happily pay 70 bucks to ASIC to get a hold of their accounts and to troll through the uh, related party disclosures. Anyway, business always performs better when there is competition, and this government is doing its job to regulate the market when there is a problem. This will be an important step in redistributing the overall power these platforms have, and it will preserve the integrity of our public interest journalism and, in turn, our democracy. This bill won't fix all the problems with big tech but it is an important first step in standing up to them. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Rank. I'm just contemplating or digesting the thought of walking out of a pub vertically, but I think I get what you mean. <laughs> Senator the Sheldon. Good, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Treasury Law Amendment, News Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bargaining Code Bill 2020. Well, whatever your view of this bill, if passed, there is no doubt this law will constitute an important global milestone in the regulation of digital platforms. Its advocates see the bill as pushing back on the unaccountable and invasive behemoths of surveillance capitalism, these global giants who have power and profits unprecedented in world history. In my first speech in this place, I called for these companies to be held to account and pay their fair share of tax. The Morrison government likes to describe the fight with Facebook and Google as an issue of national sovereignty. If they really believe that, they would be taking unilateral action to tax these companies properly, rather than simpering on the sidelines waiting for the OECD to get the United States to agree to a global system to tax multinational corporations. I also called for regulation to ensure that their staff, their contractors and the smaller businesses that rely on them are paid and treated fairly. I remain strongly of the opinion that taxing these companies fairly and squarely is what we should be doing. And I include all the other foreign companies, media and otherwise, who avoid tax and seek to benefit from the Australian government contracts, Australian customers skills, workers and Australian infrastructure. I believe this media bargaining code was developed by the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission was developed with good intentions. It tries to address the power imbalance between the digital platforms, Facebook and Google, and the news media companies that produce the journalism content that is viewed and shared on these platforms. But it is important to see the bigger picture here. The bigger picture is the functioning of democracy and the scrutiny and accountability that journalism brings to this parliament and all our institutions. 
The problem with this code, as the government has constructed it, is that it fails to genuinely protect the media diversity that underpins our democracy. My test for this bill is twofold. Firstly, whether it encourages and supports a thriving media ecosystem that includes the start-ups and future titles that the internet encourages, and at the same time arrests the decline of public interest journalism in Australia, including the hemorrhaging of small and regional newspapers and broadcasters and the threats to independent news wholesalers like AAP. Secondly, whether it supports jobs in the industry. That is because the success of Australian democracy depends on a free press and the diversity of voices within it. And that ultimately depends on media jobs. Because with people employed in the media industry, without reporters, without producers, researchers, skills, stills and video photographers, and without expert analysis, there is no media industry and there is no democracy worth its name. Democracy needs a busy, noisy, competitive and competent ecosystem of voices. This includes a diverse media, as well as labour unions, charities, academics, think tanks, churches and other civil society actors and not-for-profits. All of these voices are threatened when a diverse media industry is threatened. But the truth is that the money that this media bargaining code delivers to local publishers has no conditions attached. There is no requirement that money be spent on public interest journalism. There is nothing to stop Rupert Murdoch using it to pay it out of the News Limited executive bonuses, just as we saw happen with the JobKeeper wage subsidy, which also had no accountability built into it. There is nothing to stop former Liberal Treasurer, the chair of Channel 9 Media, Peter Costello, decided to redecorate his office, if he is so minded. There is also nothing stopping these companies using the money to gobble up their small competitors and close them down. Mr Acting Deputy President, we could very well get to the end of our first year of the media code and find that we have less jobs in public interest journalism and less competition in the market. Google and Facebook and the other digital platforms have no doubt had a profound impact on our media environment and have challenged business models. But the strength and diversity of public interest journalism has been on the decline for years prior to the arrival of Google and Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. I want everyone in this chamber to reflect now on the closures of regional and small publishers around this country in the past year or so. We have to make sure that this never happens again. Closures before 2018 in Queensland, The Comet News, The Advocate, Hills and Avon Valley Gazette, Midland and Kalamunda Reporter, and The North Coast Times, The Western Herald, Hills News, Rouse Hill Courier, Penrith City Gazette, St Mary's Mount Druitt Star, Blacktown Sun, and Parramatta Holroyd Sun. The Kuma Monero Express, Wagon Argus, the Meriden Wheatbelt Mercury, and the Central Midlands Advocate. Roxby Down Sun, Casey Weekly, Frankston Weekly, Casey Weekly Cranbourne, Knox Weekly, Monash Weekly, Marunda and Yarra Rangers Weekly, Peninsula Weekly, the Sydney Magazine, the Melbourne Magazine. Seven suburban newspapers in Melbourne's southeast, including the Frankston Weekly, Monash Weekly and Peninsula Weekly, since 2018, News Port Corp has closed a further 122 papers. A total of 76 papers will become digital only, bringing to 92 the number of online titles published by the company after News Corp launched 16 new online titles in recent years. But 36 small papers will disappear entirely, including Queensland's Butterham Chronicle, Caloundra Weekly, Capricorn Coast Mirror, Coolum News, Nambour Weekly, 
Ipswich Advertiser, Kawana Marucci Weekly, Gold Coast Sun, Hervey Bay, Harvey Bay, Independent, Maryborough Herald, Boulogne Beacon, Surrey Basin News, Herbert River Express, Innisfail Advocate, Central Telegraph. In New South Wales, a title's fold, a coastal views, to fold, a tote coastal views, Northern Rich Rivers Echo, Richmond River Express Examiner, and in Tasmania, they're a Tasmanian country. Now, the following regional titles will become digital only. In Queensland, Mackay Daily Mercury, Rockhampton's Morning Bulletin, Gladstone's Observer, Bundaberg's News Mail, Fraser Coast Chronicle, Gympie Times, The Sunshine Coast Daily, Queensland Times, Warwick Daily News, Central and North Burnett Times, Central Queensland News, Chinchilla News, Dolby Herald, Gatton Star, The Noosa News, South Burnett Times, The Stanthorpe Border Post, Western Star, Western Times, with Sunday Times, with Sunday Coast Guardian and Bowen Independent. News from towns covered by the Atherton Tableland, Northern Minor, Post Douglas and Mossman Gazette, Burdekin Advocate. This will contribute to appear as it does now under the regional sections of the Cairns Post and the Townsville Bulletin. New South Wales Tweed Daily News, Ballina Advocate, Byron Shire News, Coffs Coast Advocate, Grafton Daily Examiner and Lisbon Northern Star. Northern Territory, the Centralian Advocate, and the following community titles in Melbourne will become digital only. Stonington, Mornington Peninsula, Knox, Whitehorse, Monash, Northern, Whittlesea, Maroondah, Mirabhan, Mordialic, Chelsea, Moriland, Lilydale and Yarra Valley, Frankston, Bayside, Caulfield Port Phillip, Cranbourne, Greater Dandenong, Mooney Valley, Maribyong, Wyndham. Also moving online are the new local titles in New South Wales and the ACT, Fairfield Advance, Penrith Press, MacArthur Chronicle, Blacktown Advocate, Canterbury Bankstown Express, Central Coast Express. Hillshire Times, Hornsby Advocate, Liverpool Leader, Manly Daily, Northern District Times, Parramatta Advertiser, Inner West Courier and Southern Courier, Illawarra Star and Wagga Wagga News, St George Shire Standard, Canberra Star, Newcastle News, Blue Mountain News, Central Sydney, South Coast News, Queensland Tiles to Seat Printing, uh, Albert and Logan News, Caboolture Herald, West, West Side News, Pine Rivers Press, Redcliffe and Bayside Herald, South West News, Wynnum Herald, North Lakes Times, Redlands Community News, Springfield News. Because South Australian papers to cease printing and move to digital are Messenger South Plus, Messenger East Plus, Messenger North, Messenger West, Messenger City, Adelaide Hills and Upper Spencer Gulf. These are just some of the number of closures that have already taken place. And the real test for this government and for this bill is that no other companies fall into disrepair and our democracy is not further undermined under this government's watch. Thank you. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I asked people online what they'd like me to do with this bill. Well, you wouldn't believe it, but it seems like they're a lot smarter than what we are, because out of 2,000 people responded, 70 per cent said they're opposed to this. How is it that they understand what's at stake better than the people in this building? Why does that not surprise me? If you're charging a business every time their customer enters their store, you're going to break that business. That's what this code does. Every time a person shares a news story on Facebook to their friends and family, Facebook has to pay. Facebook is paying for someone else's use of their platform. 
Odia, a platform they're providing to that user for free. Something's not right here. No common sense. Some people in this place have argued that we should support this legislation only if the ABC and SBS are included in the code. What a terrible, terrible idea this is. It will not lead to a cent of new money for the ABC or the SBS. The only people who are able to decide how much money our public broadcasters have are those in the government. Every extra dollar from Facebook or Google only stays an extra dollar if the government lets it stay that way. If the government decides that the ABC or SBS don't need the extra money, they just cut the budget. Just like that. There's no difference between how much the ABC or SB SBS would have before or after the media bargaining code comes into effect. You know what is different? Facebook and Google don't offer three-year funding certainty to ABC or SBS, unlike the government. So all we're left with is a public broadcaster with less funding certainty, with no extra funding and who is now reliant on two multinational corporations to cover their costs. We have hit a whole new low in this country. And this is the big win secured by the Labor Party and the Greens. Well done to you, great negotiators you are. In fact, Labor would have you believe that if it weren't for them, this bill wouldn't proceed and journalism in Australia would be over. Well, I reckon you've done that yourselves. Labor would have you believe that they've delivered a bipartisan solution to ensure that journalism survives in, this, in Australia. You know what you've actually done? Please just have a good think about it. They've made, I'll tell you what you've done. You've made the Australian media landscape more dependent on the success of Google and Facebook, not less, not less. Great job, well done. Media diversity saved, what a load of rubbish. The Greens think they've secured a deal that ensures that every dollar that comes from this bargaining code gets spent on journalism. Oh, surely not. I cannot believe the Greens have fell for this. This, this is the biggest joke I've seen all day. Even the Greens have fallen for this. this. Let's say every day, every day I spend $10 on lunch. You give me $10 now and say that the condition is that I agree I can only spend it on lunch. I say to you, yeah, no worries, that's fine, mate, because that's what I was already going to spend. But what do I do with the $10 I normally spend? I put it in my pocket and walk off with it. You think you've got what you're after and I've got 10 bucks to spend on whatever I want. This is exactly the same situation the Greens Amendment has put News Corp and Nine in. This is the extent of the protection the Greens have managed to achieve. This is it. Well done, nice work. Australian journalism, I'm sure that you're sleeping easy this evening. And the people who are going to pay for your big tax on digital part players are the people with no choice but to pay it. The ones who want to advertise on Google or Facebook. This is what is at stake, because the media companies don't pay to put their stuff on Google or Facebook. Do they? The ones who pay for the services provided by Google and Facebook are advertisers. And the average small business advertising on Google spends $30 a day on advertising. You know how much advertising space $30 a day will get you in the news in the papers of New Cause or News Corp or Nine? Well, let me put it this way, you better get out your magnifying glass because you're gonna need it. It's that simple. They know as well as any of us in this place do that they are not competing for those same advertisers because not every business has a lazy few million dollars to drop on wall-to-wall full-page advertisements in every edition of the local paper. For every JB Hi-Fi or, of course, Harvey Norman, which is flogging it out there and keeping them alive at the moment, there's 10,000 small businesses doing their best to try and earn an honest crust because that is all they can afford. They are not going to the newspapers to get in front of customers because it's not cost effective to do so and will take them out. They can get in front of their customers for pennies on the dollar if they go through the digital players. They're the ones whose prices are set to go up from this code. The big news players don't care about that. They don't give a stuff about small business. Why would they? They, they have never done before and they're sure as hell not going to start today. For them, nothing changes. Google and Facebook created a new market for advertising that was targeted, cost-effective and local. 
The news companies have invested precisely nothing in developing this market, but they still want a piece of the benefit of it. They say, yeah, well, it's our stuff on Facebook and Google that people are clicking on, and if it wasn't there, Facebook and Google would have fewer people visit it. Okay. Does my auntie Mabel get money from this code too, does she? Every time she shares her cat video or every time my cousin shares her famous recipes, should Facebook have to pay her for the, that privilege? I'm sure she'd love it. She'd love to be paid for her pies, I can assure you. Because I can tell you, those, these new companies have their own websites where you can find all their news contents whenever you want. If I want updates from, updates from Auntie Mabel, I've got to go to social media companies to get it. Australia has a need for decent quality journalism and we are losing it at a rapid pace. But you can't slap together a popular problem on popular company and say the solution to one is to shake down the other. The solution isn't to break the way the companies operate. For all the bluster, this is just a really bad idea done very badly. If you want Google and Facebook to fund public interest journalism, then simple. It's really easy. It's called tax. One simple procedure, tax. This code amounts to a white flag on tackling tax avoidance. And the real tragedy, every payment Google and Facebook make under this code will be tax deductible. So not only are we not going to make Google and Facebook pay more tax, we're actually going to make them pay less tax. This is just gets, keeps getting better. Also, Rupert Murdoch and Peter Costello can cut themselves a fatter cheque. How about that? Look who's winning here. Wouldn't have anything to do with those political donations at all. Of course not. I've got no doubt that the 200 subscribers to News Corp's latest streaming service, Binge, will be over the moon that their parent company can now afford to buy the rights to more American TV content. Yay! And shareholders of News Corp and Nine will be delighted that their dividend is about to be fattened up on the back of shareholders in Facebook and Google. How's that fair, though? If we want more money for journalism, let's tax companies making heaps of money and put that money into supporting journalism. Put it directly into journalism. If we want Google and Facebook to pay more tax, let's make them pay more tax. And let's say they do. Let's say there's an extra $200 million to spend. Who in Australia really thinks that the best way to spend $200 million is to spend it on more money for media companies? I get that media companies need money. I get that. But you know who needs money? Everybody. Welcome to the real world. This solution to the problem of how to fund public interest journalism is totally unlinked to the extent of the problem itself. It throws a bucket of money at a problem at the expense of spending it on any other worthy cause for time immemorial. If all it takes to fix a problem of how to fund public interest journalism in Australia is 100 million, why do we justify the overspend of the other 100, 100 million of this policy that this policy will provide? Are we really saying? Are we really saying that even once the problem is solved, there's still no better way to spend money? Spend that money? Not ever. It's a basic standard of how to do good policy to say that you don't provide an unlimited supply of money to fix a problem that doesn't require an unlimited amount of money to fix. This code delivers an uncapped value to news companies, completely divorced from the scale of the problem we all acknowledge exists. It does not scale when the scale of the problem changes. It just slugs the end user for now until this foolish and short-sighted policy meets its fully justified end. And between now and then, we all suffer. Some of the problems that are caused by this probably are prob uh, policy will be irreversible. We can't put the genie back in the bottle. We spill this, it's staying spilled, it's that simple. It's finished. It is not cleaned up with a simple repeal. This breaks the media, this breaks the internet, and it does it permanently. Everybody making their speeches has failed to offer a number for what it would take to fix a problem that, that we want to solve because they have no idea. That should scare us. Nobody knows what it will take, so the squeeze on small business will just continue forever. All this because a few, a few media barons decided we should start the squeeze. Maybe food bank charities should just buy themselves a the newspaper so you guys will start falling over yourselves to give them some money. 
This whole exercise has been so embarrassing. You're all so desperate for positive press that you're prepared to make bad policy the law of the hand because you think it will make them like you. Let me tell you what's going to happen next. News Corp is currently trying to make its own newswire service, News Corp Australia Newswire, a profitable product. Currently, it's competing with a non-profit alternative, the AAP. AAP is not included in the code. News Corp is included in the code. News Corp will get money from the code. It will be able to use this money to undercut the price of its product. This will put pressure on its only competitor, a non-for-profit, a non-for-profit who currently provides news to, among many, the ABC and the SBS. If AAP isn't able to keep, compete with the only competitor it has, it will go out of business. It is that simple. If AAP goes out of business, the only competitor available to take up its position in the market is News Corp. How convenient for Mr Murdoch. Thanks to this media code, you're one step closer to News Corp writing news copy of the, for the public broadcaster. Thanks to this media code, we're one step closer to the public broadcaster being financially dependent on the private sector for their funding. Thanks to this media code, we're now making it more expensive for small business to get into the market and making it cheaper for large businesses to maintain their share of the market. All in the name of encouraging competition, huh? Is that what you call it? This is your competition policy? Really? This is bad policy done badly for bad reasons and for reasons of interest. Anybody who supports a strong public broadcaster should oppose this legislation. The Greens and Labor Party should be embarrassed with yourselves, seriously. Anybody who supports a fair, a free and fair market operating efficiently should oppose this. It is a shakedown. This is a bipartisan shakedown delivered by a sense of stu absolute stupidity in here this evening. Journalism is important enough to deserve better than the poorly researched, poorly understood justifications being thrown around by a political class that's desperate to be noticed by the people it's clamouring, to, uh, clamouring up to to serve. Great work, everyone, here this evening. You all made the same passionate speech as each other, all defending why you're supporting such crappy bad law. And you are about to make a terrible mistake, and you're doing it with both eyes open because you are betraying the same indifference to the interests of the little guy that major news players in Australia have displayed. The crime we're all apparently trying to correct with this bill is the digital platforms are collecting revenue from news stories they didn't pay for. They're collecting revenue via selling advertisements. Revenue from those advertisements doesn't go back to the person who produced the stuff they're selling ads against. Just think about this. This legislation is so badly designed that it would be like making Channel 9, Channel 9 pay for every Coles ad it runs during program breaks, because Channel 9 has created valuable real estate in the form of television program, just like Google has created valuable real estate in the form of search results. And Channel 9 makes money by selling advertising space against a television program, just like Google makes money by selling advertising space against those <coughs> search results. To argue that Google should have to pay news companies for every dollar it makes against the real estate it produced from nothing is like arguing that people who appear in the evening news should be entitled to revenue the TV company collects by selling advertising between breaks in the 5pm bulletin. It's just advanced. Let's just advance that and see how Channel 9 feels about that, shall we? Of course, they'd oppose that. They'd say, hey, that's not fair. What part of that example is wrong, though? What's the difference? What is the difference? The contributions to this debate have been full of people complaining about the practices of digital platforms. And if you want to run a business out of town because you don't like how it's, how it's doing business, then fine. But when you're gone, it won't, be, it won't be journalism that suffers. We all pay the price so you can get a headline. But what's more important and what's even sadder is that we've already lost enough journalists over the last five or six years, and the, really the people that are going to suffer more than anyone are those journalists right down the bottom there. Because you, you can guarantee that this revenue, it ain't going down to them. That's just rubbish, absolute rubbish. So if you thought we had fake news beforehand, watch it come in spins and spats now. It's coming. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And uh, I would love to spend the next 15 minutes talking about explaining what those differences are and, and how my, my good friend across the aisle there is, uh, doesn't quite understand this law, but I, I won't. I'll go to explore exactly why it is. And so I rise to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment, News, Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bag Bargaining Code Bill of 2020. And I think it's clear, Madam Acting Deputy President, 
there has never been a more important time to get this bill passed than today. Mr Zuckerberg and Facebook think they can hold this government to ransom. They can't, and they won't. Cutting off small media publishers, government pages, even the CSIRO, public health advice in the middle of a pandemic in the bid to intimidate this Senate to not pass this legislation is just not on. This is Australia, and we won't be told what to do by a US conglomerate. Let me make one thing clear. This government will not be held to ransom by this tech giant. This tech giant is acting like a child who isn't getting their way. They're acting like a child who just got bowled out in backyard cricket and they're packing up their bat and ball and taking it home. Well, I say to Facebook, don't let the gate hit you on the way out. Madam Acting Deputy President, this government is going to keep batting on. And that is whether Facebook likes it or not. These actions reinforce for me the importance of this legislation and, importantly, the tough stance that the Morrison government has taken on this issue. The Treasury Laws Amendment, News Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bargaining Code Bill 2020 establishes a world first mandatory code to address the bargaining power imbalances that exist between digital platforms and Australian news media businesses. This piece of legislation reflects a change in the media environment that we are currently facing. This legislation has been brought about in no small way by Facebook's own actions. With consumers now turning more and more to news online, news media businesses are grappling with the challenge of finding a viable and sustainable business model for the provision of public interest journalism. Public interest journalism plays an important role in our society. And this role can only be fulfilled by a strong, diverse and sustainable Australian news media sector. This bill ensures that the Australian news media sector remains sustainable and we continue to get quality local news. This bill responds to the key findings of the Digital Platforms Inquiry and, as all senators know, the conclusions of that inquiry was that a significant bargaining power imbalance exists between digital platforms and Australian news media businesses. That's a common sense con conclusion that I think any ordinary person in the street would quite readily recognise to be the case. While these platforms have, almo almost emerged from, have emerged from almost nowhere, 15 years ago or less, companies like Facebook, Google and indeed Amazon were just start-ups in university dorms. I was working in Silicon Valley at the time that these startups were just starting to get going. These platforms were the disruptors of traditional industries and businesses, and they have certainly disrupted. However, today such companies are the behemoths of the business world. Governments should not prop up industries past their use by date, but public interest journalism should not be taken and should not be paid for. Not only the, the size of these platforms, their market capitalisation and corporate power, but also in terms of their dominance in our, our lives, is just too much. Today, these digital companies are now the modern railway, railroads and utilities that we compared from last century, and they are essential to 21st century living. Life as we know it today would not be the same without them. They keep us connected and they keep us informed. Not only do they help us <coughs> communicate, but they are now the platforms for how we conduct commerce, consume entertainment and get our news and journalism. In many senses, they are an indispensable part of everyday lives. While digital technology companies are booming, traditional media has been crippled under competitive pressure. Traditional media has relied upon classified advertising to form the backbone of its revenue and the backbone of its business model. Classified advertising really underwrote newsrooms, journalism, printing costs and almost everything else in a media business. In many instances, certainly for print journalism, 
as much as 90 per cent of their revenue came from classifieds and classified advertising has been disrupted by these online platforms. And it's safe to say it's been disrupted in a number of ways. If you look for a job in Australia these days, you might go to Seek or LinkedIn. If you're buying a, looking to buy a car, you might go to car sales. If you're looking to trade something secondhand, you might go to Gumtree. If you're looking to buy real estate, there's any number of online platforms you'll go to. All of these revenue sources have been taken from traditional print media and are now in the hands of well-established and successful technology companies that have taken a large portion of this business and found a way to make money from. And while that is great, and as a Liberal I will always support free enterprise, it is vital that we also protect our news media. These classified ads, these that are now dominated by tech companies, previously funded our news media in Australia. Without the revenue sources that they used to get, news media in Australia will no longer exist. And this legislation is protecting exactly that. It is unacceptable that big tech giants are earning significant revenue from the effort of Australian media outlets. This bill responds to the key findings of the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission's Digital Platforms Inquiry. The ACCC, as it is known, conducted a detailed, world-leading inquiry over almost 18 months and set out a series of recommendations in response to the substantial market power that has arisen through the growth of, a dig of digital platforms, their impact on competition in media and advertising markets, and their implications for news media businesses, advertisers and consumers. The ACCC found that digital platforms have become unavoidable trading partners of news media businesses, providing them with a substantial bargaining power imbalance. Since commissioning the ACCC review in December 2017, the Morrison government has undertaken an extensive policy development process that has been going for almost three years and which has included public consultation on a position paper and exposure draft legislation. Madam Acting Deputy President, as the Prime Minister has said, the laws of, digital, of the digital world should reflect as far as possible the laws of the physical world. We are not seeking to protect, protect traditional media companies from the rigour of competition or indeed from techno technological disruption, which we know benefits consumers. Rather, we are seeking to create a level playing field where market power is not misused and there is appropriate compensation for the production of original news content. To that end, this bill will establish a new world-leading code of, for the conduct of, for new, of conduct for news, business, new, news media businesses and digital platforms. The code ensures that digital platforms share the benefit they obtain from using Australian sourced news media content with the news businesses who create that content. The Treasurer will be able to determine that a digital platform is subject to the code, having regard to ACCC and Treasury advice as to whether a substantial bargaining power disparity exists. ACMA, the Australian Communications and Media Authority, would assess the eligibility of Australian news media businesses to participate in the code against criteria set out in that code. The framework contained in the bill recognises that agreements can be entered into outside of the code. Indeed, they are, they are encouraged to be entered into outside the code, and we acknowledge that Google are currently in the process of entering into, these, into similar sort of agreements with Australian media companies. This is a far better example of corporate responsibility than the heavy-handed tactics of its Silicon Valley counterpart, Facebook. Where a news media business reaches an agreement with a digital platform, it can agree to not, to not bargain or pursue compulsory arbitration under the code. If news media business cannot reach an acceptable agreement with a digital platform outside of the code, it will have the, trigger, it will have the option to trigger aspects of the code to address that uh, the difference between bargaining powers. 
This includes minimum standard obligations that digital platforms must meet for all news media businesses registered under the code, requirements for good faith bargaining over remuneration and, application, and the application of final offer arbitration if bargaining between the powers parties does not succeed. <coughs> the, news, the news media and digital platforms mandatory bargaining code is a world, lead, world leading initiative. And the senators in this place should make no mistake the world is watching. This code is designed to level the playing field and to ensure a sustainable and viable Australian media landscape. It's a key part of this government's strategy to ensure that the Australian economy is able to take full advantage of the benefits of digital technology, supported by appropriate regulation to protect key elements of Australian society. One such key element is a strong and sustainable news media landscape. Madam Acting Deputy President, Free TV, the industry body, in its submission to the Senate Standing Committee on Economics Legislation, argued that a well-functioning democracy it argued that in a well-functioning democracy, and I quote, there is a responsibility that falls on the businesses that become gateways between the community and information. This responsibility has been borne by commercial TV broadcasters for some time. For decades, as an influential media platform and represented by Free TV, these businesses have operated under a regulatory compact that requires them to pay broadcast licence fees, pay broadcast spectrum fees and meet stringent content obligations. This responsibility should now be shared by companies with the size and influence of Google and Facebook. In a submission to the ACCC's concept paper, which was drafted collectively by 88 regional, state and national news publishers, argued that the establishment of a mandatory bargaining code, and I quote again, is likely to be one of the most important media policy decisions affecting Australian democracy for decades. So as you can see, Madam Acting Deputy President, many key organisations support this legislation. While for big tech giants, Facebook, Google, Twitter, seemingly opposed to it, although some are coming around. Some have even said that this legislation doesn't even go far enough. Reset Australia, which describes itself as, a, and again I quote, an independent, non-partisan policy and advocacy organisation committed to fighting the digital threats to democracy, supports the bill, but believes it should go further. It is clear that there are many views on this legislation, some for some against and some wanting to go further. That said, the Morrison government has tried to juggle the many views and strike the right balance. As such, the bill, which is before the Senate today, does just that. It strikes just the right balance. I want to end by thanking the fantastic work of the Communications Minister, Minister Fletcher, and the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, for getting, pulling this legislation together. In the face of bullying and intimidation from Facebook, these ministers and the departments around them have stood up for Australian local news media. This bill tonight should be supported by all senators, and I thank the Senate. Senator Polly. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The Treasury Law Amendment News Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bargaining Code Bill 2021. I've spoken many times in this place about the importance of supporting regional media organisations and ensuring there is a balance within our media market. Although we may not have balance in this country, I will do everything in my power to support the ability for regional media to tell the stories of our beloved communities. One, because they deserve a voice and telling the story of our country in this place is paramount to our democracy. And secondly, the free flowing of information has become such a normal part of our lives and it helps solidify us as, as a people. Facebook and Google are amongst the most powerful entities in the world. They wield so much power over our lives, firstly, in their ability to provide us with information, and secondly, in their ability to control in many aspects of what we see and how frequently we see it. 
It's an unparalleled power, more powerful than government and traditional media. People have strong views about social media platforms. For the most part, I believe they are a wonderful resource for a curious mind, but in recent times have become a matrix which we almost religiously tap into and follow every day, sometimes getting lost. Screen time for many of us would now average between three and four hours per day, without us even being consciously aware of how often we are using the platform and the devices in which we access this information. Over many years, Facebook has evolved from a platform which connected individuals and created networks to the most comprehensive pieces of infrastructure to provide us with information about anyone and anything. It is an advertiser's dream with access to every company and brand the world over. And it has also become such an important source of news and stimulation for over 19 million Australians. Traditional media like newspapers, radio and television have since been bypassed for too many Australians. Facebook is where they get their news from. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights states, and I quote, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression this right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of the frontiers. Facebook provides us with the ability to access news media when they allow news organisations to utilise their platform to reach millions of Australians and now they have unceremoniously taken that from us. Facebook has a particular business model and they expect all others to pay them for their service, for the service that they provide, to pay for their infrastructure and technology which connects 2.8 billion people globally. Facebook does not want to pay news services for their content. Seems a bit unfair, I would think. Many have argued that this act displays an arrogance from an extremely powerful entity that has too much power over the way we live our lives. Others are concerned we now have less informed opinion because people will not be able to access the news and read it as they have become accustomed. For many, this means if they want to consume news, they will have to seek out more traditional forms of media or download the specific app of a news service and potentially pay a subscription to access the information that they want. Now, I believe there is a broad, in principle, support for a code and regulation of digital platforms, and the Morrison government has been late to the party on this issue, like so many others. These social media giants have been in our lives for nearly two decades now, and they have been largely unregulated. Mr Morrison has mismanaged this reform like he has mismanaged every reform in this space. And in fact, um, he has mismanaged so many reforms as we have spoken about so many times in this place. Many stakeholders have serious and specific concerns with the bills as drafted and Labor concurs with them. Google and Facebook explained they would withdraw products and services from Australia if their key concerns were not addressed, and it is a failure of the Morrison government for not managing this process better. Australia is trying to recover from a global pandemic. We are a country prone to bushfires and floods and to have a global giant which controls the dissemination of information without a social conscious is a dangerous position for this country to be in. This government is not a government which negotiates or enjoys being critiqued, and now Facebook's decision has disrupted 19 million Australians and 1.3 million small businesses. Labor recognises that the timing of debate and amendment forms part of the government's negotiation strategy with Google and Facebook, but the government really has failed to cooperate with Labor regarding these reforms. 
We recognise the power imbalance identified by the AACCC between news media companies and digital platforms, and the importance of supporting a diverse public interest news sector in Australia. Australia needs a workable code, and the Morrison government must address stakeholders' concerns with this bill to ensure that happens. Labor recommends that the government use precise language in public statements regarding what designations it intends to make under the code. It's important there is no unnecessary uncertainty for the media, digital platforms, small businesses and citizens and consumers who may be impacted. I want to address the concerns of local media in my home state of Tasmania, because last week, when Facebook decided to cancel journalism on their feed, many journalists feared for their future and their job security. And we know that there already has been a huge impact by so many print media closing their doors and less opportunities for journalism in this country. Facebook blocking news content hurts everyone. After all, when we are less informed, we are less likely to make rational decisions. Facebook makes millions of dollars out of journalism in Australia. Google has acted constructively with the government and publishers while airing its concerns, and I hope that Facebook does the same. We need to be grateful that, as Australians, we do have a free press. Although certain news organisations have increasingly agendas and philosophies of thought, we still have a free press. They make editorial decisions and they pick sides, which isn't always dignified, but they make that choice. That is so very important to the health of our democracy. Choice is fundamental in the media market, and now it means Australia will be forced to seek out media instead of seeing it so easily on their Facebook feeds. I think the journalists and media organisations will rise to the challenge they now face. Their work can be accessed via their websites or apps or Google News or Showcase. Facebook is a huge part of Australia's culture. Most Australians use the platform and they deserve to have their access to news media readily. A well-informed public serves our democracy better than a public which does not question their government or the actions of politicians. Not being able to access information will damage our communities. People need to access information, including emergency warning, which affects people's lives in a crisis. I hope that Facebook does the right thing by all Australians. And Facebook profits from the 19 million Australians who use their platform to stay in contact with their loved ones and organisations, and it could save a person's life. Facebook is a matrix which promotes the most powerful companies in the world. It's also the largest piece of propaganda infrastructure the world has ever seen. Good, bad or downright ugly, we are all use this platform. It can be better, and it should be better. After all, Facebook at the moment couldn't have picked a worse time to um, take news feed off their platform. We are facing the worst pandemic in more than a century in this country. At a time when we're needing to roll out the vaccine to help protect Australians from COVID-19. And that platform would have been a vital part of disseminating information. There is a challenge for this government to be able to disseminate information in relation to the vaccine and to reassure the Australian people that they should have this vaccine. The, the uh, rollout, uh, the, the opportunities, the categories of people in order that they will be vaccinated, these are all very important things that are facing the Australian people at this time. We have managed the pandemic very well compared to overseas countries. There is still a lot more work to be done. We still cannot be complacent, and that's why we need to ensure that people do take the opportunity to have this vaccine. It is not mandatory, but we, both on this side of the chamber 
and the government, and in fact everyone in this chamber, I would think, would be encouraging all Australians to take that opportunity. It does concern me that with the news feed now being removed from this platform will engender some more difficulties in disseminating this information. Now, Facebook can be better, and so I urge them to negotiate in good faith and to hold a social conscience and a compact with the Australian people. Now, people have spoken in this chamber. I've been listening to the debate about the money that is going to be raised and where that needs to go. And I know there's going to be amendments to ensure that uh, there is um, the proper funding of the ABC, the public broadcaster in this country, which serves this country and has served this country for decades after decades. So there will be uh, amendments, and I'm looking forward to the debate and the arguments that are put forward then. But I think too that we must always remember that it's the journalists and the best and most educated and smartest people that work in this field should be encouraged and should be supported. In my home state of Tasmania, we have seen a down uh, a cut to the um, media in terms of whether it's the journalists or whether it's the camera people um, on our television, being able to access news and to get good news stories out into our community is fundamental to having a robust democracy. I urge um, those people um, that are negotiating with, these, uh, with Facebook to negotiate in good faith and I urge people to consider very carefully how we support good journalism in this country, how we can ensure that there is diversity in the media and the presentation. We do want to ensure that we have freedom of speech and freedom of media, and we have to do everything we can to ensure and secure that platform for the future. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment News Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bargaining Code Bill uh, of 2020. Now, the purpose of the News Media Bargaining Code is to level the playing field between news media companies and big tech, Google and Facebook uh, in particular, when negotiating commercial agreements. The code was recommended by the consumer watchdog, the ACCC after their inquiry into digital platforms in Australia. Now, I'm sure all Australians realise that Google and Facebook are the gatekeepers to the internet and that these uh, tech giants profit off the advertising revenue that's used to support independent media. Often when you see or you click a link in an article that you found off Google or Facebook, the money from those ads uh, goes to the tech giant. It doesn't go to the person that's written the article. Now, the Greens are really proud that um, our spokesperson, Senator Hanson Young, secured the inclusion of public broadcasters, the ABC and the SBS, into the code, um, and that we were able to negotiate for public funding to protect uh, that other newswire service, the AAP, in the short term. But let me be crystal clear. We know that this bill cannot solve all of the issues of public interest, journalism or media concentration in Australia, and we acknowledge and are at the forefront of all of the work that still needs to occur. Now, we remain greatly concerned about the role that the Murdoch media monopoly plays in our democracy. That's why we have, um, since time immemorial, opposed all of the moves to further concentrate media ownership, and we have always voted against uh, laws that would seek to uh, facilitate that uh, concentration of media ownership. Um, it's also why we supported the petition of former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, which um, gained the support of half a million Australians, I might add, um, and is exactly why uh, there was a need for the media diversity inquiry to be established, which we participated uh, in setting up um, and indeed led and chaired uh, with some great uh, content just last week. But, um, Deputy President, no billionaire, no individual, whether it's Rupert Murdoch or Mark Zuckerberg, should have control over the news and the information that Australians are allowed to access. We need a free press. We need a diversity of news ownership, diversity of news and views, 
and we need strong public interest journalism. That is what helps keep a democracy robust. It is what helps keep uh, and hold power to account. Um, the other task, of course, are to make sure that uh, new and big tech companies pay their fair share of tax to raise the revenue to fund public broadcaster and public interest journalism. I'm going to speak a little bit more about that this evening and indeed uh, move an amendment that addresses that very point. We also desperately need to secure the ABC's funding in legislation so it cannot be cut by future governments. This particular government has got a terrible track record of slashing and slashing and slashing the ABC. They have lost so many staff. With every year, there's a new round of excellent quality journalists who are then put on the scrap heap. Um, thanks to this government continually cutting the ABC's funding. We could fix that by securing that funding in legislation, and the Greens intend to continue to lead the charge for that to occur. Um, and of course, we also need to protect the AAP Newswire with long-term public funding. It too is a crucial news service, and it also helps bolster some of those regional and rural uh, outlets that provide excellent local news, but that also rely on AAP copy, again undertaken by uh, very well qualified and um, very efficient journalists. So they are the broader issues that we at the Greens are conscious still need to be rectified. We don't propose that this media bill um, is a solution to those things. It is one step, but we will continue to campaign for all of those reforms to ensure that we have um, a diverse, a properly funded uh, public broadcasters and uh, uh, public interest journalism, which in fact benefits all Australians and makes our democracy function uh, more strongly. So we'll be moving um, several amendments to this bill. My colleague, Senator Hanson Young, has already uh, talked about the fact that she will move a second reading amendment to ensure that the government doesn't cut ABC funding um, in a manner that might offset the money gained under the code. And we very much uh, look forward to uh, support for that amendment. It's a crucial one. Um, I have another colleague who will also move an amendment relating to protecting uh, data rights and ensuring that users have control over how their data is collected, much like the gold standard of the EU uh, have recently implemented. Um, and I'll come back to the amendment that I will foreshadow and, um, and speak about, but we'll also have some amendments when we come to the committee stage to make sure that uh, the money that news organisations gain through the code is spent in the newsrooms, not in the boardrooms, and to make sure that that money is invested in public interest journalism, not just into the pockets of shareholders or overseas parent companies, as profit. Uh, we'll also move substantive amendments to make sure that the impact that the code has on small and independent and start-up news organisations um, is examined with a 12-month review of the code. Um, but I note that many of those uh, smaller outlets, including The Guardian um, and Junkie, to name a few, are in strong support um, of this code. Nevertheless, we think it's prudent to review the uh, effects and the operation of the code after 12 months, and we'll be moving an amendment to that effect as well. But if I can come to the amendment that I will uh, move, and in fact I foreshadow that I will be uh, moving that amendment, it is to note that uh, billionaire Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation controls much of the Australian media, that billionaire Mark Zuckerberg's Facebook controls much of Australia's online activity, and that both big corporations pay little to no tax in Australia. Um, it would also note that the senators of the opinion that implementing a media code is not the best way of addressing the growing power of the billionaires and the big corporations, and that, in fact, we call on the government to deal with the growing concentration of media and online ownership by implementing new tax measures, by funding public interest journalism and by increasing media diversity. Um, so, With that said, I foreshadow that I will so move that second reading amendment on sheet 1213, and I conclude my remarks. Thank you. Senator Henry.